coming! He's coming! <laughs> Impossible! Get him out of here! He's coming! He's coming for us! <laughs> Poison apple, and my tale began. A princess in a tower is just a bird in a cage. before your queen. It won't take long, I promise. In the world of NACT, every single player has one dream, to raise the ultimate trophy. It builds alliances. It defines rivalries. And it creates superstars. The only question is, who will be next? Greetings, fellow operatives. Agent Beth here, undercover as your favorite eSport host to bring you the latest NACT recap. Just as you thought, the NACT 2024 Spring regular season has come to a, what's the word, stale end. The last day broadcast brought you more twists and turns than you could have expected. Bloodhounds still grappling with defeat, 
took a match win straight from Divas Activity's pocket. Meanwhile, Night Horde snatched the eyeballs of tens of thousands of viewers as they dethroned our kings and sent BTK back to square one. With playoffs right around the corner, let's discuss the path to victory for some of your favorite teams. In game one, despite some great sets coming in from Uda Buda, Bloodhounds found themselves drowning in a 10,000 gold deficit, unable to claw their way to victory against the game. But hold on to your hats because game two was where the Bloodhounds showed us their true potential into a fierce playoff run. Both Carrasco boldly locking in that Eudora not only left her casters speechless at the draft, but surprised the entire NACD community with an insane comeback victory. We got some inside scoopity doop boop into the excitement of the boys after the win, so let's take a listen. Keep going, keep going. I mean, I I'm up on five. I'm up on five. Yeah, you'll be up. You'll be up in time. I'm gonna. I'm going for the tower. Right? Yeah, you, 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 you might have to. You might have to go tower. Me. All right, tower, tower, tower. Both of yeah, you guys go. We should just be able to tower lock. I'm top. I'm top. Okay. Danny dice. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Monster, monster, monster. Right here? No, we, have another, we have another way too. We have another way too. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going! And then, and then, and then, and then, and then. Nice. Oh, oh my god, god. okay, okay, okay. Gosh. That's, That's crazy. crazy. One more. Although Bloodhounds eventually fell short in the series, their heroic performance illuminated the path ahead for just what they're capable of in the playoffs. Last week's headline stealer though, if you haven't caught off yet, was the insane upset of Night Horde against the Bloodthirsty Kings. A decisive game one wrapped up in under 14 minutes left Jaws dropped. Then, a stroke of genius with the Ixia pick outranged and outdamaged BTK in Game 3. Night Horde has proven once again that they are the real Dark Horse in the spring season, just like their logo. Rumor has it though, that Oh My Foe started channeling his inner zoo after that epic win against BTK, so let's tap into the wildness. GG! Yo, I'm, I'm not gonna do it in the video. What are you doing? Wait, what are you doing? What the Yo, yo, you do interview, bro. <laughs> interview, <laughs> you know. Overall, guys, we wrapped up the regular season with a rather unsurprising GG number one and a BTK number two. What I have my eyes on, and honestly, so should you are the dark horses and rising stars like the Night Horde, Area 77, Fiends, and Devious Activity. But who are you rooting for in the playoffs? Comment down below. Now our inside agents informed us that Legacy is keeping its ace up its sleeves until the playoffs. I guess we'll find out their secret weapon very soon. Looking at the playoffs bracket, it seems like a GG is the only team with a fairly straight shot into the semifinals. It's XYBTK, however, might face a tougher road ahead. Luckily, BTK has stuck with its tried and true regular season roster this time, so let's hope the Kings can swiftly regain momentum and give us a powerhouse performance in the playoffs. That's it for us today, codename NACT regular season, mission success. Will host Liz return to the playoffs or is she codename gone? I guess you'll have to find out this weekend. Agent Beth, signing off.
ICT spring season has been nothing but big plays and hype moments. 77 is going to have to back off. Bahari doesn't care, though. Look at the damage coming on the oh Jules Cutie, able to shred him down. Every team has fought hard and competed at the highest level. White Chicken able to get the I'm offended. Tarzan Cutie goes down. Maybe they should have just gone for the Lord, but they decide not to. They want to try to force this right here. But Jay is bursted. Shark back on the field. Area 77 are falling. Did they push it too far? Gaming Gladiators don't come to our base just yet. Now let's take a look back at their finest moments. The Lord is down to half health already. BTK, do they want to try to end this here? Oh, the final slash does lock on to Pro Destroy. Milo back in, Whoa. knock up, taken out. Basic able to pick up the kill. Kahari. Magic taking so much damage, but Kahari is up and ready to go. Speedy Light Wheel. No. Not able to connect just yet. Nicolette able to find another. It's nothing but Kohari and Turo against the world. And the minions are closing in. Will this be a 2-0? Fiends still trying Milo. to put it all on the line here. BTK feeling confident, dropping the toss toss. Just lock onto the base and finish it. Kohari going to be the next to fall. Milo looking for it, but no, Kohari gets the shutdown. And now the minions are back up. It's Turo and Kohari still against the world, but BTK is not playing anymore. We're entering the 20-minute sleeps in trouble. Ooh. Ooh, a lot of damage on a sleepy, but they got to get back to base quick. The Lord is already oh. almost there. Uh oh, Minoan Fury does come out for Barrage Flicker, but that is a lot wasted there. Can they clear it out? No, they're locking onto the base, and that is it. Well, so it's just like a great combination by them. Ooh. Oh, another divine judgment. And Melon able to get the kill. Lord still coming. Bloodhounds down one member. A lot of damage on Ugabuga. Melon able to get the kill. No T finds him asleep. Gets away with just a sliver. Yato flickers in. Lord is on the base, and it's five members chipping it down. DA take game three. Yeah, it's the vengeance just pretty much doing the damage itself in Jay here. Oh, they tried for the Divine Judgment, but did get caught. Kohari finds the kill there. A blazing duet from Iso, not able to find too many marks there. You can see the vengeance from Uneven with those electrifying beats, able to put some damage on Kohari on the back line, trying to shred down. Your rescue might be the next one. Oh and that is it. You see Kohari. There are no more members for him to take down. Melon on to T, cushion to the backside, look for Boca. Taking a little bit too much damage. Ugabuga able to force him away. T also taking a lot easy peasy, finds the decimation. Immortality oh. down, T down, but the Lord has fallen as well. Base. They want to lock onto the base. Can they finish this? Ooga Booga does it. Iso finds the tower into the Whoa. back. Nicolette with that time journey to try to protect her team. Bursted down, taken down by Mark Cutie. This could be the end. Iso still pushing into the tower. Oh. It's just Kono left. We have minions up at the top. Basic with the blazing duet, trying to clear out the minions. Gets taken out by Iso. Here Yo. comes Mielo with the damage he gets taken out by mark Yudi. it's just cold world left but they have no minions still gonna try to force it at this mid tower we have zane. the timers up your reshi coming in zane is back out is he gonna have the heavy spin ready the, the, the car goes down this is gonna be a sweep for area 77 both sides are gonna kill their first kills of the game you are gonna see kuya nash get the kill for the side of legacy but the Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back to day two of the 2024 North American Challengers Tournament Spring Season Playoffs. Yesterday, we had some great games, but today I think we might find some better ones. Coming on today, we've got a Caster's Desk duo that we've seen once before in the regular season. We've got UA and Trex. Boys, how are we feeling? I'm feeling great, Zeke. We're jumping in. Second day of playoffs. Playoffs, I mean, overall, just finally here. Everything's been building up for this. There's finally some stakes on the line. Teams are beginning to go home over the next few weeks, and two teams are going to end up in Vegas. Yeah, no, and we've kind of all been waiting for this moment uh, to come through. We saw we, we, we had a great round robin series coming through, and now this time around, when things are on the line for these teams, like they can't lose like multiple games they have to get wins in order for them to progress through i think that's one of the most exciting things about the playoffs so far 
Yeah, it's definitely a lot of tension in the air. It's only the second day. We've only seen a couple matchups so far, but it's it's such a different environment. And we've seen that directly impacting some of the different way that these teams are playing, I feel like. With that being said, do we have a, uh, a, uh, a bracket format that we can go into? Definitely a bracket to be jumping into. An exciting one at that yesterday. Day one of playoffs. We saw Game in Gladiators 3-0 Legacy. And then Area 77 also catch the 3-0 over Fiends. I feel like a lot of people thought Fiends might do a little bit better. But there were some roster changes. We see Kohari move to Rome. Even played Jungle one of the games. I mean, it was definitely a big switch up. And I think they're still kind of catching their bounds. I mean, overall, they're going to drop down to the lower bracket where it's going to be best of threes and that's where your life is on the line there yeah and i mean honestly there's there's a so <laughs> there's been so many roster changes zeke that it's been quite quite crazy um and you know a lot of these teams a lot of the players some, some we've seen quite a bit before but there's also a lot of new players that we have not been able to see to showcase their skills this time around yeah, it's been tough, man. It's been tough. And with all the roster changes, I know personally for myself, I've I've left uh, some of these matches a little heartbroken on uh, on guesses. But we're not going to get into that. Instead, let's get into the prize pool. This season has been showing off a whopping grand prize or prize pool of over $25,000 US with a top prize of $10,000 with over 100,000 diamonds and prizes scaling thereafter. That's a whole lot of money left up in the air. And for me, I've... I'd be happy with $20 personally. <laughs> Some of these teams have been really been putting in the work and I'm really keen to see who's going to be the one sealing the deal with that prize pool. Trex? I mean, I'm excited for the prize pool. I think one of the biggest things I've liked about this season and last season, some of the incentives that are put in, you win a game, you get a hundred, I mean, you win a series, you get an extra hundred dollars added on. So it just gives this incentive to consistently do your all, even for teams that get knocked down the lower bracket, even for teams that think, you know, maybe we're not going to be able to make it move forward. Maybe we may not make it to Vegas, but there's always a reason to kind of, you know, give it your best. Yeah, and I mean, a lot of the players, you know, they could use that money. And of course, they've been putting in a lot of time and effort in order to get to this place. So definitely a lot of rewards for a lot of these teams. So I hope we definitely get some good matches coming through and competitive games for our uh, two series of today. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree. And you know, with that being said, if any of the teams, if you're winning games and you're like, you know, I really don't need the hundred bucks, keep Big Zeke in mind, you know, I could <laughs> <laughs> With that being said, let's uh, let's not waste any time. Let's get into today's schedule, UA. Yeah, so for today's schedule, we are going to have the Bloodthirsty Kings versus Bloodhounds for our very first series. And this is very interesting because Bloodhounds has uh, subbed in, I believe, two new players that we haven't seen before in this NACT. So that's definitely going to be an exciting series. And then for our last one for tonight, is it going to be Night Horde versus devious activities both these teams have uh, done so well in the regular seasons a lot of upsets a lot of tough matches um so definitely going to be a very exciting day coming through today so btk versus bh is a strong start to the day trex what are your expectations Oof, um <laughs> it's gonna you know bloodhounds i will say started to do much better towards end of season um, Bloodhounds definitely started to step up. And the reason why I'm talking about Bloodhounds a bit more is because I think they have a bit more to show here. I think BTK is definitely the more comfortably sitting team right now. Um, finished off second, you know, took on, was got wins against some of the bigger teams. Bloodhounds, on the other hand, has a lot to show and a lot to prove. I think if they can get back to the basics, draft, you know, cleanly, not get too estranged from what's important, you know, they, they, they can do okay. Yeah, and I think the the new roster coming in might, you know, change up the draft dynamics, might change up a lot of the hero pools that they're mm. looking to pull out. Maybe, you know, release some of the pressure that Boca has been having, because quite honestly, in this matchup, it's all about Boca versus Moba Zane, right? The band's going to be a lot towards Zane, a lot towards Boca. But now with the new roster change, maybe it lines up and, you know, relieves some of the pressure that Bloodhound's been having in a lot of the drafts. And, you know, hopefully, we get some uh, good character selecting here. So I do know that, you know, for both of these teams, this is going to be their first matchup in the playoffs. And both of them, I do believe, actually came out of a loss on the last matchup of the regular season. Do you think that that'll make a difference coming into today's matches? 
Um, I, I think for the teams that have been around for a while, even I think Bloodhounds as well, even though they, they ended up on the lower side of the tiers, um, I think most of them know what time it is when playoffs come around, know what time it is when, you know, when these games come in and whatever happened in season is done with. Most of them do a pretty good job. It's not like they're running multiple games in one day. That's when I think momentum can really be a factor. But a day like this, these both these teams are well rested. They're ready to go. They got to watch some games yesterday, study up. I think I think both these teams are going to be, uh, you know, playing at their best today, whether that's not good enough or whether it is. Yeah, and I mean... You know, from the side of Bloodhounds, they've been here. Same thing with BTK. Both of these teams, a lot of the rosters, they've been in a lot of these situations before in our past NACTs. So it's definitely going to be quite exciting to see how they turn up the heat for the playoffs that is coming through today. Now, turning up the heat is uh, is one of the few things that they're going to have to do if they want to stop me from getting these absolute chills. And without being said, Trex, can you take us into the BTK roster? I got the good roster. I got the fun roster, which has not changed at all. Whoa, and whoa. this could be the big <laughs> difference here. Basic going to be in the gold lane. Cole World in the roam. Nicolette in the mid. Mobazane in the jungle. In Mielo in the EXP. Now, like I said, several teams have switched up a player, have taken some players off the bench, put them onto the main roster. But this team and GG have both kept things exactly the same and is that going to be the key to victory or is it going to be something that maybe hurts them so with that being said ua do you want to take us into this other roster bh looking strong tell us about it yeah the fancy roster here too there's roster from coming through it is going to be for uga booga and those arms uh, stoner is going to be coming in as a roamer and this man has definitely proven uh to be one of the strongest roamers in north america glad to see him come through and there is also a new player on the team falam coming through from the side of bloodhounds going into that jungle position sleeps is still going to be the gold laner for bloodhounds we got boca the captain in the mage position and templis fall into the exp and you know you talked about the roster for uh for for btk you said is the good the, the the nice roster but i honestly think bloodhounds this new lineup that they've kind of put together before the playoffs is very very exciting and definitely have a lot to prove in the show so you i gotta know whenever you say you know strength are you talking about his ability as a character or as a real life individual we all saw that picture that boy is looking beefy trex how beefy. do you feel about his his lineup against uh, btk I feel small just being on camera here. Like I, I need the production to do something about this because I don't even know how that works. Um, but no, I, I don't know. I, I will say this. I will say this. Let's let's talk about the elephant in the room. Um, there's been a player on Bloodhounds that has had some interesting builds. Has had some interesting picks. And that player is Uga Booga. You know, you love him, you hate him. Some days you see him pick the Hanabi and win games in previous seasons and it's exciting. Some days you see him pick damage Kufra and you're like, what is going on right now? So I do honestly believe that this could be a very good swap for Bloodhounds. Um, you know, we've all gotten to know Uga Booga very well, but I think sometimes, you know, some of those choices just aren't there when it comes to competitive NACT playoffs type of play. And I think Boca Roscoe, if he's pulling the decisions, it was the right decision today. Yeah, and I think the new lineup brings that element of surprise once again. You know, we really don't know what's going to happen in this series with the new lineup that Bloodhounds have. And a lot of the players like Falam has known uh, Moba Zayn and BTK quite well, maybe even potentially playing for them at some point. And, you know, to see them come back, you know, out of the retirement, coming through in the NACT like that, you know, it, it's going to be a tough match for both teams. You know, one is going to be the all-star roster that Trex mentioned. And for Bloodhounds, it's that kind of like new vibes coming in. Like we don't know what's going to happen. And that's like the element of surprise that I think is going to make this match uh, that much more. So with that being said, who do you guys actually think is going to win this matchup? Let's get into the predictions. Well, I got a feeling it's going to possibly be very one-sided. <laughs> BTK <laughs> Zeke, Zeke. You can't talk to production like that. You're breaking you're breaking the fourth wall right now, sir. Um, but yeah, BTK, definitely very one-sided. I think BTK finished off second in season. Bloodhound seventh in season. I think there doesn't have to be a lot explained on why most of or why all of us are voting for BTK here. 
Yeah, I mean, BTK has a very solid roster. They've proven that they're going to be the ones contending for the championships, especially going up against GG. We have plenty of other teams that have done quite well, but not in the standings of BTK where they had to climb out of kind of like the, the, the early standings, the early losses that they took. But this time around, I really think they've been able to prove themselves that they are that top dog in this series, especially compared to Bloodhounds here, you know, coming through. So the votes are definitely PTK for me. You guys got our, you guys got our, our guesses, our predictions, right? That that's that's hey. messed up, man. That's messed up. That hurts. First off, um, <laughs> what happened? But I do we, think, what happened? We were tied. Uh, man, what happened, bro? Let me tell you, I I had high apple pie hopes, and um, they broke my heart. They broke my heart. That's what happened. Cheers. All right. Uh, but with all of that being said, you know, I don't think that the Bloodhounds are by any means out of this. I do think with some good adjustments, I think if they come in strong, they might be able to take something. But of course, you know, my vote is going to go towards BTK because I vote on consistency. And they've been consistently <laughs> showing me some good things. I don't know why you're smiling like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I totally agree. I think Zeke's, what Zeke's strategy is, all right, who won last week? We put them on this, or who's who's sitting on the top of the leaderboard? We just we go by we go by numbers, you know. We go by numbers. Um, Fiends had good numbers, but you know it's playoffs time now, man. And we were kind of talking about this a bit before. Is that some of these teams like Ari Seventy Seven, Da, you know, some of these players who we've known for years now, even when they have a kind of you know maybe a rougher season, a couple rougher games, when the playoffs come, a lot of these players are going to suit up, and. You know, our teams like Bloodhounds, our teams like Night Horde, you know, our teams like Legacy, are some of these, you know, other teams that are a bit newer to the scene going to be able to match that spirit? Um, and, you know, later on we have DA versus Night Horde, which I think is going to be an amazing series, mm -hmm. at least hopefully. Um, you know, but we're going to start seeing, you know, who suited up for playoffs, UA. Yeah, and I mean, <laughs> who's going to suit up for playoffs? I think everyone is quite ready for the playoffs. This is, you know, one of the biggest tournaments in North America at this moment. And all these teams, they've been prepping their uh, matches all the way up to here. This is where, you know, if you do lose, you do go to the lower bracket. And if you lose once again, you know, you're going to be out. So they're definitely going to be suiting up, putting their best impression up first and making sure that they get that impact in their matches, especially when they have to fight it out for some of these uh, upper brackets positions. So do you guys, I, I hate to be the guy to say, you know, obviously the upper brackets and the lower brackets both hold their own respective roles in sorting out who the best of the best is going to be. Do you think that there is any of these teams going into this upper bracket season who just feel like they might not be able to take it right away? So they might just let away a soft, a soft loss just to get themselves better positioning in the lower brackets? You know, there's there's always like hypotheticals of that. We see that in world tournaments. We see it all over the place where it's like mm, they lost on purpose. You know, um, you know they 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 want to they want to have a run through the bottom bracket. And I don't know, man. I think talking to most players, talking to most teams, you know, whether you troll, whether you do this, most of them don't want to lose. You know, <laughs> I, I think there's a competitive spirit here in everybody that most of the time they are going to. Uh, give it their all they're always going to try their hardest if they take the loss there's definitely still opportunity but i don't know if there's going to be any purposeful losses for like a nice number three position or something like that you know because mm. mm. honestly I mean, everybody I, looks I, good this season <laughs> like lower bracket's not going to be easy either yeah i mean i i i honestly feel like it's just kind of the choices that they do, do decide to make if they do take a loss you know they have to win Right. And that's kind of like the mindset. If, you know, they do end up taking a loss in the upper brackets, they know the pressure is on the line. They're going to try their best to, you know, get into that next spot, the next best available to be able to go through in this tournament. And, you know, yes, nobody is trying to take a loss. Everyone here is trying to win. And just like Trek said, it is a very, very hard lower bracket as well. So, you know, if teams are going to be going off a little bit early, they definitely still have to pair and they have to make sure that they can make it into a very deep end of the position in order for them to you know, get a little bit of that price pool there. I think it all goes into, you know, that that little love triangle that NACT has been in, you know, it's like one team Me, counters this team, counters this team, you know, yeah, yeah, that's the that's the other one. That's the 
keep that keep that quiet no, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like we saw night horde beat btk the number three beat the number two spot then we saw uh btk beat gg that's the number two spot beating the number one spot and it's like it's just you know night gg, GG didn't points. have any issues with with night horde so it's like all of these uh all of these factors really leave us in this whirlpool of of a season which again you know i've been saying it you know the entire regular season leading up to this point we find ourselves finally in a tournament where we don't know who's going to end up where and i do think that that i do think that makes for a, a very treacherous waters of a lower bracket yeah, I think, um, you know, I, I said it towards the end of end of season, I think last day, it's like, I don't feel like anything is going to be free for anybody this season. Yes, first round, we might see some one-sided matches, but as these as we move farther into this bracket, once we get to, like, you know, top six, top four, it could go anyway, man. I think if, if any team meets the wrong team in lower bracket, they could go home. If any team makes a bad mistake, they could go home, especially second round of lower it's still best of threes um that's a that's a tough that's a tough call man best of fives are a little different you could lose momentum in game one you could lose game two and then come back in game three and reverse there's a lot of there's a lot of leeway but in a best of three man you lose match one and it's a tough comeback um so definitely um i think i high chance we see some crazy upsets so with that being said lower brackets man let's find out who's going to end up where in this draft. Ooh, okay, UA, jumping Let's into go. the first draft. We've been waiting on this. We've been killing some time. Bloodhounds up against BTK. Now, Stoner on the roam position. Um, have we seen, I feel like we've seen Stoner play. We saw Stoner play last week, right? Um, on the last day with Bloodhounds. I don't think he played roam, but he played a different spot because didn't Liz interview him? Um, hmm. I want to say that was Stoner, right? We saw. I'm pretty sure we saw him play last week, so he's not like completely new on the team. He's just been more of bench, more of sub, and I'm wondering how he's going to be able to fit this roam, roam position in place of Uga Booga. Well, with some broad shoulders like that in the picture, definitely think he's going to be able to fill that sock there. Um, bands are on the table. We do have a flex band coming out from the side of Bloodhounds quite early on. There's a lot of good heroes that um, typically gets banned out against BTK. There's the Barats. I think the Fredrin is definitely mm. another one. Um, but I do kind of want to see both of these sides kind of changing up the draft style, changing up uh, some of um, the, the game plans that they've set for each other, right? For the side of Bloodhounds, um, I think one of their win condition is trying to get Boca Rosco on a very, very good hero that he can uh, really use to the maximum potential, right? Things like Navaria, Faramus, and, and the same goes with BTK. They have a full all-star lineup, but setting up Zane for something very utility, very aggressive, very front line is definitely going to be one of the win conditions there. And I think Bloodhounds uh, definitely understand that, banning out the Barats already. Okay, so, so are we saying that, you know, a big win condition for Bloodhounds is like, is crack the mid, right? If we can make sure our mid trio, you know, our jungle, Rome and uh, and Mage can kind of get ahead of Nicolette, Coldworld and Zane, can kind of maybe even get on the other side of the river, kind of bully a little bit, give Moba Zane a hard time. That is a huge answer. And I do kind mm -hmm. of agree. Um, I think if they can do that, they can kind of, you know, stop the roaming, stop the aggressiveness, the aggressiveness of Nicolette, Coldworld, kind of stop that duo. The only only thing I wonder is like they also need to if they're gonna kind of push that and kind of try to muscle in the mid sleeps needs to be able to keep up with basic like, he doesn't have to win his lane but he needs to be able to at least stalemate right he needs to just not lose his lane and then same thing to Templus. Templus needs to be able to at least stalemate with Mielo and not lose out on lane um, and I, I think that's gonna be the big thing is everyone needs to be able to keep up well Boca well, Falam and well, Stoner are doing their thing. Mm. And, you know, talking about kind of like the mid lane matchup, right? We have Stoner and Boca versus Nicolette and Cole World. A little bit about Stoner and Cole World. They're both from the West Coast. So we've actually been able to see them uh, quite often with each other. And, um, you know, they, they definitely know each other quite well. So I think they, they do bring an element of kind of like the East versus the West where, you know, in the East Coast, we have Moba Zane, we have Nicolette. Uh, most of the Bloodhounds roster are also from East. Um, so a lot of these players really do know each other. And I think um, now with the first picks already being on the board, we have Matilda getting picked up first by the side of Bloodhounds. 
And for BTK, it is going to be the Arlot Flex for Cold World so far. So BTK going against the number one phrase of NACT right now, ban Matilda. Um, I mean, all right, so this I think this is a... We're not as much going against... So last time we saw the Matilda come through and really mess a team over was when GG let the Matilda through to BTK, and BTK catches the dub in game two and three. Um, do we think this is... Uh, we have a plan for it? Do we think this is... Uh, all right, we're going to see if we can, like, Bloodhound's definitely not a number two, number three team. It's a good time to maybe practice against the Matilda, um, because whether you're a great team or not, Matilda is a monster, and we've seen her just cause mayhem. You pair that up now with the CC, and we're starting to see, I mean, it's a, it's a strong draft for Bloodhound's right now. Yeah, so, well... When we talk about this Matilda pick, right? Generally, it is very, very hard to catch. It's very utility focused, very, very fast in rotations. But it's not kind of like that one, you know, one that cures all. It's not like you pick Matilda and you win. Yes, the side of BTK, they have had a lot of success with Matilda, but it's it's something that does have a lot of counters. For example, right from uh, uh, Manana Esports that we were kind of talking about earlier. Um, Evos, they very, they're they're very utility focused, and even with a very utility focused Rome, they're not often picking up the Matilda as well. So things like Wrath, uh, things like even Florin that's been picked up uh, quite well overseas. Those are some great counters to deal with a lot of the stain coming out uh, from Matilda's shield. But it does not look like they're opting to go for any of that. Nicolette picks up this Fairmus, and Fairmus does so well, especially when we talk about kind of the sustain, the Ube strategy, and mm. it fits so extremely well with BTK's lineup paired with the R lot. It is a very, very hard mid lane to deal with. I mean, this has been one of her, uh, you know, this has been kind of one of her signature picks here, the Fairmus. A lot of teams haven't been prioring it as much, but BTK seems to consistently throw, especially like game one, it's very common for them to just throw Nickel out on this Fairmus. Doesn't matter what else is out there. Um, sometimes they've even been known to pick it, you know, first, second pick when they're on a uh, red side like this. So. I think it's just strong for them. It feels good for them. They like to be able to make these team fights kind of go the long haul and see if they can win a positioning, uh, win the positioning bout, kind of win a long-term micro mechanics bout. And I think it works pretty well for them. And then they're also, they can always switch it up. We saw them, I think they took a loss before. They switched it up to Lu Yi. They, they take a game. So this isn't their only strategy, but it's normally kind of what they go to up front. Mm, and you kind of mentioned the Lu Yi pick. I actually think Bloodhounds right here have a potential to pick up the Lu Yi, right? Give give a little bit more mobility in their draft. Uh, potentially give them that like anti-engage uh, type of backline that Lu Yi can provide. And, and it definitely does well against the Fairmus. And, you know, the Marches gets banned out here. There's no easy peasy on the team. It is Falam. Um, and, but there is still a few utility jungles available. We've seen great matches with the Akai paired with Matilda, especially on BTK side. Maybe Bloodhounds is going to use that against them this time around, you know, disrupting the Ube style that BTK has and maybe getting the pickoffs and set sleeps up for a, a great uh, front to back type of composition that I think Bloodhounds need in order to shine in this match. Yeah, I'm wondering, so, with all the gold lanes banned out, does he go, does basic just like pick up the Roger here? Um, mm. Does he go, That that's kind of been the major pick. It does have some poke against sleeps. Again, it's not a, I mean, with the Harith and the Claude gone, those are definitely good picks for basic, but I feel like the gold lane is so hard to just heavy ban into now. Yes, the carry's very good right now as long as you get rid of the Aerith. Yes, the Claude is decent, but even like the Brody's still super viable. And now you pair that up with the Fermis because he's he's not a you know a super fast jumping around marksman. He wants to hang out right in the middle of the team. And you pair that up with the Fermis, it gives him even more sustainability time, even more time to kind of get those stacks up, get his passive going, and just kind of burst down. So you mentioned it, BTK, with the kind of ube -esque composition here and they're just piling even more into that yeah and you know when you talk about the fairness typically doesn't have too much kill pressure early on has that little yeah. cc to kind of disrupt the placements but paired with the brody it gives a very strong kill pressure onto the gold lane right you could have cool world rotating by himself paired with the brody should be able to get the you know the ultimate off and get that burst same thing with moba zane so anyone 
from BTK's side going down into the far lane. They should be able to pick up a kill or two there for the response coming through Volca with the Vaxana. You know, I know early on in NACT, I wasn't really a firm believer of this hero. But as times, <laughs> you know, pass on, I've definitely changed Want my mind about... Yeah, I've, I've definitely changed my mind about the Vexana. It's a very, very strong hero. Does well in lane, clears extremely fast. The mobility isn't there, but the ultimate is so extremely annoying and definitely has the ability to deal with like short range heroes like the Fair Miss and the Brody here. So what about, so I'm guessing the Dyroth is jungle, right? I'm guessing yep. the Dyroth jungle. We saw it once yesterday, Legacy picked it up, um, Riles played it, did not do that great. We've seen it sprinkled here and there, and we've never really seen it perform. Um, I don't know, man. I'm not crazy about it. I think it's kind of like I get the idea. I think theoretically the idea of being able to shred through these bulky junglers, you know, these bulky roamers, the idea is there. But I think without the flicker, Dyroth loses so much and you put him in the jungle and he has to lose the flicker and if he misses that abyssal strike or whatever it's just it's it's tough man and I'm I'm questioning it any thoughts on the Dyroth right now it's it's you know it's it's a risk just like what you're saying yeah. right traditionally it's utility or even, you know, the Nolan, right? A, a rare assassin coming in or, or a joy coming in uh, for some of the retributions. The Dyroth, it's kind of one of those heroes that once you go in, you don't really try to come out. You just try to win over the team fight. It does have a lot of potential when, it, when you're going up against a lot of the tanky units, right? Like the Minnow, like the Fredrin specifically but it is a extremely big risk just like you're saying it doesn't have the ability to get uh some of those 50 50s off as well it's just more so for the the the, the picks and you know dyroth is an early game hero so it might make the difference early on here Let's see if it does, because this is day number two of the NACT playoffs. Bloodhounds going up against BTK, match number one. Now, I think BTK kind of, this is their typical draft here. This is pretty normal for them. This is their average. Um, Bloodhounds, I do want to say, even though they did spice things up a little bit with the Dyroth, I like their draft right now, man. They didn't get too out of the box. They kept things simple overall, and they got some very solid picks on their team. It is a little bit uh, scary for me, though. We're in such a very dive-heavy meta, right? The R lot, the Minnow can go very deep. Same thing with the Fairness. But we have a Vexana here from the side of Bloodhounds, and that's the only CC that the Bloodhounds really have. So if they do end up falling you know, early on, especially uh, the early skirmishes that Dyroth is supposed to, you know, prevail in, it might be a very tough situation. They don't have the frontline CC. They don't have things to be able to kind of stop uh, the dive that's going to be coming in from the side of Bloodhounds. Well, looks like we are going to get a little bit of a pause here. Going to be coming I'm back in just a minute. Had to sit down real fast. I was hyping up, getting ready to cast. <laughs> um, but yeah, and you know, you mentioned lack of CC on the side of Bloodhounds. And when you have something like the Matilda, that is definitely feasible. Like, it's not like you, you, you just need to be able to play it because it is very micro orientated you need to be able to move around in these fights and use everything to the best of your ability and i think it takes a very uh well played team like a very you know synergized team to pull something with you know that little amount of cc off so i i still don't think it completely hurts their draft but if they can't pull it off, it will definitely be troublesome because they have the escape route, right? If if the Minoan's Fury comes in, they have ways to get out of it. They have ways to kind of, you know, bait out the uh, the Nether Realm, come back and then come back in. You know, they they have everything they need. You know, if any, if GG or BTK had that had that had some of those picks, you'd be like, oh man, they're gonna play this. But can Bloodhounds perform? to that level um, and I think today is going to be a great day to test that we get to see stoner on Rome which is going to be the big surprise here he gets a great pick like our first time seeing him on Rome he gets the Matilda so like this is really he has everything he needs to show us what he's going to do for the team here yeah and you know when we look at the side of bloodhounds they really have to find the correct fights the correct pickoffs they have everything that they need to especially in the early game with Dyroth running roaming around paired up with Matilda I talked about it earlier where Dyroth is one of those heroes you go in you don't come back out but you mentioned you know Matilda is going to be his way out 
right? So yeah. they, they should be able to get those rinse and repeats. They should be able to get some of these early pickoffs, maybe before the side of BTK decides to kind of group up and stack some of their CCs, because that's a formidable force. But, you know, with the Dyroth, they have the ability to, you know, deal deal some AoE damage to shred a lot of the armors, uh, negate uh, some of the armor boots quite early on. It might, you know, it might just work out for the side of Bloodhounds here to be able to uh, really uh, go through and win some of these small engagements, snowball a little bit, leading them up to a, you know, a, a small place where they feel more comfortable with the picks. They're able to have this kill pressure from both the XP and in the gold lane. And if they can get up to that point, BTK is going to struggle. But once again, BTK has an R lot. They have the Fredrum. Even if they lose early, they still have the ability to just stack CC, wait for basic to deal the damage, maybe even the fair miss magic damage cleave uh, coming through. They have a lot more insurance, I would have to say, especially compared to the lineup that Bloodhounds has. Uh, but I will say, you know, Bloodhounds, they have good, they have speed right now in their hands, right? And I think if they mm. have the courage, you know, we, we mentioned early on, like, putting pressure, you know, crack open the mid, but what could also be the answer is use the Matilda, stick it with the Dyroth, like, roam together as a three-man unit and attack those off lanes quickly, you know? Hit and run as much as possible. See if you can get the early game kill. You have the CC as well. Bo Carrasco, though, down in the mid side. There's already a Tough. first loss. BTK taking first blood. Yeah, we can take a look at some of the emblems here. A lot of movement speed coming in from the side of Bloodhounds, something that, you know, we kind of mentioned, they're a very fast team with this lineup, right? The CC goes into the backside, carry has a lot of dashes as well. And, you know, oh. Oh, another pickoff here for the side of BTK <laughs> is going to be 0-2 quite early on 1K gold lead already. Right before the turtle, too. I don't think there's any way Bloodhounds can really contest this. I think at this point, you just kind of abandon turtle. You go for your orange buff, you know, you uh, and you just try to make the play happen. You just try to make the play elsewhere. And we do get a little camera from Nicolette's first time that we've seen quite well. BTK here able to get the very first objective, pushing them up another 500 gold, about a 1.2k lead. And, you know, it seems oh. like Bloodhounds, uh, he's struggling here at mid. Yeah, what did we say? You know, what did I just say? I think Bloodhounds need to stick together. They're getting mm -hmm. caught off. You see BTK, every time they, they make a pickoff, every time they make an attack happen, there's, you know, it's Cold World Nicolette. Milo rotates up from mid. It's Cold World Nicolette sticking together. Look at Stoner right now. He's all by himself. Boca Roscoe just getting back to lane. Um, Bloodhounds need to pair up here. They need to trio up here um, or else they're going to keep on getting picked off. And, you know, I, I really think Bloodhounds have the better early game comp um, especially when we, you know, don't count out the carry, right? Dyroth, Matilda, Vexana. That's a very strong early game comp at top side here. A little bit of attack up on top side. Flam already goes down. Stoner able to just get away. Boca Roscoe drops the Eternal Guardian, gets the knock up, but it doesn't do enough in time. Flam, that's another member down. BTK leading four to zero. Mm, and another pause coming through. It is, a, it, it, it is already a lead coming out from the side of BTK. They have a very good early game strategy and they executed it quite well. You were talking about how kind of like the two-man unit of uh, Nicolette and Cold World kind of making the impact, right? They're not even looking to gank a lot of the side lanes so far. They're able to get the kill onto mid side quite early on. And then when Zane is on the top side uh, and the Dyroth kind of went in uh, without really knowing who's underneath there, who's able to get punished uh by the members of btk and you know the minnow has been there and it's not really an early game hero but it already feels like they have the early game advantage even with this pick it's going to be very very hard to penetrate a lot of the frontline cc that outside of btk has uh in order for bloodhounds to you know get get, get maybe a few more pickoffs before uh the the ube comes in at seven eight minutes yeah, they're, they're, I mean, at this point, it's like they're already hitting that seven minute mark. You know, we got four <laughs> kills. Um, and you mentioned the Minnow not being like the greatest early game, but the way that Cold World's playing it right now, he's just waiting and baiting, right? He's he's always a step ahead. He's always on the opposite side of the river. Like he's waiting in that tri bush for someone to walk into it. He's waiting in the mid bushes in the mid lane, waiting for someone to walk by. And every time Bloodhounds is just walking into the fly trap, right? Uh, and it's becoming a problem. And they now at this 
point, they, they, they lost some of their lead, so they can't even really try to get Vision. And it just cements even more to the fact of why they need to stick together. Um, at this point, they may have to even sacrifice a little bit of Vision, but they they need to stop. They're, they're getting caught lacking right now, UA. They're getting caught lacking. <laughs> I think, you know, for the side of Bloodhounds, they really have to slow down their pace. Just like you're saying, maybe don't get caught. Maybe don't look for a lot of the team fights, right? Go for the objectives. Maybe, you know, we can give up the turtle. Just like saying, sacrifice a little bit. Give up the turtle. Look for off lane push on the side. Get a four man siege on the opposite lane. Get a little bit of advantage, right? And I think, you know, for the side of Bloodhounds, they have the mobility to be able to do so. They have the Matilda to be able to just help people around dash through. Uh, but so far, with the lack of mobility of the Vexano, right, the Fairmist has been able to pick him off over and over and, you know, has given them the lead, the very first turtle now. So I think Bloodhounds, in order for them to kind of cut their losses as minimum as possible, look for a trade on the opposite lane, right? The XP is, is, is definitely gankable. Try to make sure that they can win at least one or even two of their lanes and give up some of the jungle pressure, the utility pressure. And, you know, maybe they could come back into this match. But so far, it's already a 2K gold lead kills on the side of BTK. And they they have, I, quite honestly, the stronger late game comp with the CC that they've been pairing up with. Yeah, I think um, so many teams forget sometimes that you know, it's you don't if, if you don't think you can take it, it's okay to give up the turtle. But yeah, look for that opposite lane four man siege. Look for something to make up somewhere. And uh, you know, you get caught inside of the same exact rotations of the other team, and you're never gonna be like once you fall behind, right? If if you're not able to win those fights, if you if you've kind of lost your power spike, you know, you can't play into them. They're not gonna be able to play into BTK right now. I think you're right. Bide some time, wait for your moment, kind of stay away from Cold World, you know, kind of play the opposite rotations and their side lanes still aren't doing too bad yes templus did take the death uh but they still have their gold lane to count on they still have some opportunity there um they still have the carry who's got an insane late game and i think that could be the favor here you know start favoring that lane a bit more start hovering that lane a bit more even if it means you know losing a turtle or losing a tower somewhere else so maybe for the side of bloodhounds they should switch the carry into the opposite lane of the turtle. So, you know, a lot of the members of BTK aren't going to be there when the objective happens, right? And that, that could be one thing, right? Making sure the carry has a winning lane uh, for them to be able to scale into the late game. But quite honestly, they don't have the CC to be able to sustain that front to back composition that carry desperately kind of needs, right? You have the die rot to be able to do damage on the front, but that's not gonna stop like a Fredrin or like an Arla on the backside that's diving heavily right um they also have you know quite a bit on the mid lane uh the vexana has a lot of cc but once again she's already been picked off once again um and the mobility is just lacking the fair miss second skill dashing through displacing is just a little bit mm. too fast for boca to handle so far impaired with with the minnow it's gonna be quite hard but mi the minnow's fury it's a very long cooldown right tracks it's it's it, it's definitely one of those spells that you have to use at the right moment. And if they could catch Cold World off, you know, with a bad Manon's Fury, reinforce the team fight, try to get the pickoffs onto the backside, they might be able to win. Um, because still the side of BTK, very, very short range focused, right? Fair miss has to get up and close. It's not the traditional siege, far range mage. Um, and there's also the Brody which a very, very strong early game, but doesn't have that particular range or even the mobility that something like maybe a Claude has or even the carry does. <laughs> yeah. So we had some big, <laughs> looks like there's some big technical difficulties. Um, mm. We're gonna be probably tossing to a quick break real fast and we'll give you guys everything you need to in just a minute. We just wanna make sure everyone has a fair gameplay. Go use the restroom, do what you need to do and we'll see you guys in just a minute. Mercy. How about what? <gasps> the rumors from the board. Demon. Demon! He's coming! What happened? They're all dead! Oh no, no! It's him! He's coming! He's coming! <laughs> Impossible! Get him out of here! He's coming! He's coming for a 
began. A princess in a tower is just a bird in a cage. before your queen. It won't take long, I promise. In the world of NACT, every single player has one dream, to raise the ultimate trophy. It builds alliances. It defines rivalries. And it creates superstars. The only question is, who will be next? Greetings, fellow operatives. Agent Beth here, undercover as your favorite eSport host to bring you the latest NACT recap. Just as you thought, the NACT 2024 Spring regular season has come to a, what's the word, stale end. The last day broadcast brought you more twists and turns than you could have expected. Bloodhounds, still grappling with defeat, took a match win straight from Divas Activities pockets. Meanwhile, Night Horde snatched the eyeballs of tens of thousands of viewers as they dethroned our kings and sent BTK back to square one. 
With playoffs right around the corner, let's discuss the path to victory for some of your favorite teams. In Game 1, despite some great sets coming in from Uda Buda, Bloodhounds found themselves drowning in a 10,000 gold deficit, unable to claw their way to victory against the game. But hold on to your hats because Game 2 was where the Bloodhounds showed us their true potential into a fierce playoff run. Both Carrasco boldly locking in that Eudora not only left her casters speechless at the draft, but surprised the entire NACD community with an insane comeback victory. We got some inside scoopity doop boop into the excitement of the boys after the win, so let's take a listen. Keep going, keep going. I mean, I I'm up in five. I'm up in five. Yeah, you'll be up. You'll be up in time. I'm gonna. I'm going for the tower. Right? Yeah, you, you, might, you might have to. You might have to. All right, guys, so it looks like we did have some serious technical difficulties in the lobby that was completely unresolvable, sadly. Both teams have approved. All management has approved. There was a full lobby reset that had to happen. Um, it's it something happens. we don't see very often, but it had to happen today. The drafts will stay exactly the same. Both teams have agreed to this, so it has been completely fair and verified. Luckily, we weren't like 20 minutes in or anything like that. Everything was loaded up quick for you guys, so let's jump back in to BTK up against Bloodhounds. And whether we like it or not, we are going to have the full reset here. Maybe Bloodhounds can start this off a little bit differently. Yeah, this is going to be a little bit of a change of pace this time around. Bloodhounds kind of already, <laughs> you know, quite honestly, has seen the aggressiveness that has been coming out from the side of BTK, especially how how much Cold World and Nicolette kind of grouped together and, you know, wreck have it near the mid. So this time around, you know, it definitely feels like Bloodhounds should be a little bit more prepared, hopefully not an early game loss, because quite honestly, they 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 do thrive in pickoff situations. They thrive in some of these two versus two, three versus three situations, especially with the Matilda and the Vexana damage early on here. Um, so this yeah. time around, you know, it, it's, it's definitely going to be a little bit more uh, interesting this time. Uh, we could take a look at some of the emblems, right? Uh, the support emblem on the Matilda, but before that, Flum here. And Flum already being aggressive, very different. A lot Ooh. of damage on a Cold World there. Cold World forced back. Bloodhounds definitely trying to crack the mid this time. Sleeps up against Basic in the bot lane this time. We have seen the uh, lane swap over. This time EXP will be on the top side. Um, but still overall, nothing too much happens. Mm, and, you know, I feel like this time around, the side of Bloodhounds, they definitely have a, a better understanding of what's happening, but it seems like the same story is being replayed once again. <laughs> Templist gets first blooded just like last time. So yeah, the game is on its route. To taking off exactly where we left off. A lot of damage on Flom, though. Flom fighting for his life in his own jungle right now. Boca Rosco here to help out. Stoner a little bit late to the party. Like I said, Bloodhounds need to take these fights together. You know BTK wants to be aggressive. There's only the way Stoner right now. Final Slash does come out. Misses, doesn't connect. But wait a second, a lot of damage to the Eternal Guardian. On to Nicolette there. Turtle getting lower and lower. Oh, Moba Zane able to get it, though, and BTK back off. Yeah, but this time around, if you take a look at the gold lead, there's not much of a difference between both of these teams. Bloodhounds already having a much better game than what they did have earlier. Even with the one kill loss, look at topside. Look at the damage on to Mielo. But Mielo's still able to handle himself just fine. Able to get that kill early on. Up against Templus is going to give him a nice little bit of a laning advantage, or at least a laning <laughs> stalemate. No, a laning advantage. That's another death on to Templus. And we were worried about the off lanes. We were hoping that they would be able to keep up, but we're already seeing BTK get a little bit of the better. And it, it, it's a tough lane, right? You're playing against the GOAT of the North goat America, himself. especially <laughs> on the top side. And, you know, th there's a reason why we call him the goat. And this is kind of an R lot that's been picked up before the side of uh, Bloodhounds decide to choose the CC. So technically it's a counter matchup, but it's still looking quite in favor for Milo. He has those two kills, but Boca here. Let it, gonna be in trouble. Stoner able to pick up the kill. Bloodhounds finally putting one on the board there. It's going to be important they clear the wave, and I think this is the moment they got to start running the hit and run. Three of them sticking together, look for picks. 
Yeah, and I think that's the advantage of a strategy that the side of Bloodhounds have, right? The Matilda with the fast rotation, the early game damage and penetration coming out from Falam. Paired up with the CC from Boca, it's extremely hard to deal with, especially if everything lands on the same people. But Zane here gets the blue buff. Yeah, loses his purple Falam. That's definitely going to hurt. Mobile Zane already a full level ahead of him right now. Who maybe three quarters, but essentially a full level ahead of him right now. Falam having a trouble keeping up. And, you know, we, we, we got a little sneak peek on the build on the top side, right? Milo built like three or four of the little armor plates, kind of just denying away the damage that CC has. And that lane, it already sees like Milo already has the full control, full advantage, especially with the 2-0 lead. Now, BTK pulling out the objectives here. You know, with the Fredrin, it's definitely very utility focused. And I do think Bloodhounds, they have to try and go engage maybe on the far set, the far end of things, right? Trade some of these uh, early objectives into maybe like a tower push because quite honestly btk with the minotaur with the fair miss and the fredron those are very utility very team fight oriented ultimates and with a pick like die roth and vexana it kind of just spe spells pick off uh for me and i think they really need to use that to their advantage yeah, and it's exactly what they're kind of failing to do a little bit here. They're mm -hmm. playing the more spread out. They're playing the more defensive route. It's like they want to just go into late game, and that seems to have been this habit that Bloodhounds have had for many of seasons, kind of playing for the late game, scared to maybe take the aggression in the laning phase. Like, if we look at the past five minutes, Cold World has consistently been on Bloodhound's side of the map. He's consistently been in their face. And even that last hurdle, we saw Bokorasso kind of move up to the top side, but stop short, not wanting to fully commit with Falam into an EXP lane gank or anything. Milo. Just kind of finding position. But Milo is going to be a little bit of trouble. And there goes the Abyssal Strike. It does a miss, though. And that's what I meant, losing that flicker. Mm. The, the flicker loss is still quite heavy because uh, our lot does pair quite well with the final slash and the flicker. He's able to make a lot of plays if he needs to. So, but he's not gonna have that utility over in the next objective. So if the side of Bloodhounds decide to go for maybe a pick, right? Maybe not contest, but definitely go for a pick. They might be able to single out Milo here, but they still have to go through the Melon's Fury, the Cold Altar, the, the Fredrin in the front side with the knockups and the CC. It's a very, very hard front to, uh, front to back composition that uh, the side of PTK have kind of made it uh, their comp here. A little bit of damage on a Moba Zane there. Boca Rosco still holding onto the trigger, not ready to pull just yet. Has the Eternal Guardian mm -hmm. ready to go. So we're going to keep positioning, but here comes the big play onto the gold lane. A lot of damage on a sleep. Sleep Swicker's blood pack. Catches the torn apart memories and goes down. It's another kill for BTK. Now Turtle's going to be up. Bloodhound's looking for position over it. It's a 3v3, but Boca Rosco's got to hold down in the gold lane. Cold World making his way up. Circling Eagle does come out, but the final slash knocks all three members into the wall. Moba Zane able to find Temple of Stoner taken out next. The last one falls for Lom. It's a four-man for nothing. BTK comes out on top. Yeah, it doesn't feel like there's a lot of damage coming through with the impact that uh, Flom has with his Dyroth, right? Typically, when we see Dyroth, we should be able to see kind of a clean uh, brawl out for him. And he's just, you know, getting you as low as you're getting him. But that fight inside of BTK, they all came out very healthy. And it was a three versus three fight. Yes, you know, they, they, they did have the support of the Minotaur coming through little bit towards the end but it doesn't feel like bloodhounds is able to kind of do anything with the aggression the bully ball that the side of btk has created here <laughs> the bully ball it's exactly what it is right now milo taking a lot mm. of damage able to get the final slash should go down here for i'm able to get the shutdown it's gonna be a nice little chunk of gold into his pocket there but mm -hmm. btk still trying to bully around this jungle moba zane sitting on the orange buff stoner trying to get a position over him but nicolette's there to help out at any moment needed oh. praiseless wrath comes down a lot of damage on to sleep stoner able to get a small knock up sleeps just trying to get away gets taunted and taken out now comes another round more damage unfolding from btk a double kill for moba zane more damage basic take Takes out Boca. Next on the chopping block, Palam's taken out. Another four-man wipe for BTK. The amount of CC that BTK has prepped 
in this draft paired up with the displacement of the fair miss is really really hard for any teams to handle and especially with the comp that the bloodhounds have they don't scale that much into the late game they have the carry but they don't have any lockdown ccs like a minnow or even uh the fredrin right so you know bloodhound struggling here we kind of saw it coming already yes they do have that early game damage they have a very fast rotation but typically you do want to pair the matilda up with something utility focused so you get the 50 50 off and then maybe use the second skill to be able to just jump back in the top side here templus this is tough man templus taking a lot of damage cold world looks for the knockout bloodhounds now trying to collapse onto melo Nice hit. Templus able to pick up the kill. BTK still unable to take the tower just yet, but in comes Mobazane. Look for the tie. Able to get a lot of damage on a Templus there. Flam also taking a chunk to the face of Bloodhounds, defending with everything they can. Boko Rosco now getting involved once again. Nicolette with the Nether Realm. Able to keep Mobazane chunky. Able to keep Mobazane thick. Nicolette under the tower. Looking for more damage. And down goes Stoner. Templus might just be next to the guillotine falls. Templus taken out. This is a two for one trade. BTK taking what they came for. And PTK really set up that fight quite well in their favor, right? There was opportunities to dive early on, but they chose to kind of bait out some of the skills, get into a better position, get Zane to get the bonk off quite early, but mid here, Boca. Oh, so much damage coming from BTK right now. Basic mm. also starting to unload 303. It's becoming a problem. Yeah, it's definitely a problem. 13 to 3 is the overall score. We're looking at almost a 7k gold lead already for the Kings here. And, you know, it, it, Bloodhounder is definitely struggling a little bit in terms of the early game. You see the bonk on the bot side, right? Zane was able to go in, get the pressure on, even with the flickers. Minone gets three members and basic on the backside, just completely free hitting in the whole entire team fight, Trex. Yeah, that's what we call Le Bonk. Le Bonk. <laughs> <laughs> the big bonk coming down. Moba Zane able to take him out. And Nicolette's positioning there. Zane's going right up. They don't Crazy. know Nicolette's there in that bush in that last replay. Just always there in the nick of time. Just when Bloodhounds think they have the advantage, think they have someone caught out, in comes Cold World or Nicolette to turn things around. Yeah, and this is going to be the time where BTK is going to be looking to group up, get a five-man siege, get basic onto a good front-to-back position so they get a good team fight coming through. And... Look at the pressure that Cold World is just having. None of the members of Bloodhounds is trying to take that alternate route to be on the backside of the Minnow. They, they, they really are just running into the back end. With no assassins on Bloodhounds' team, it's going to be very hard for me, uh, for the side of Bloodhounds, to be able to get onto the backside, get onto Basic or Nicolette, and you know be able to pressure some of their damage Ooh. dealers uh, from the side of BTK. A 3,000 gold lead just about for basic over Hurry. sleeps right now. That's a that's a, that's a thick boy that's right there. That damage is starting <laughs> to hurt right now. Um, you take two, three shots from basic, you're out. You, you, you pair that up with the Torn Apart Memories, and he's taking out multiple people at once. BTK mm. kicking down doors right now. Bloodhounds, you know, and you mentioned earlier the lack of CC, the, the, the lack of surprise from them. Um, it's a problem. They have no way to stop mm. Cold World from just coming in their face like this. Oh, Ooh. wait a second. Final Slash tries to pull him out of the tower, but the Eternal Guardian comes down on multiple members. Still not enough. BTK still at their door. Knock, knock. Just wait, and they take down one inhibitor. They're looking for another. Nicolette comes in through the wall with the Shadow Stampede. Unable to find a target just yet, but another wave of minions is coming. Top side, mid side, BTK looking for the strike. The best strike comes out from Falam there, just trying to clear the wave. But BTK take it down. Big oh. Owens Fury able to connect. Three members knocked up. Make it more. Sleep's going to go down. Templus as well. BTK looking for the next one. Falam, a double kill for Basic. And Mobazane gets the unstoppable onto Stoner. It's a full man wipe. Bloodhounds gonna go down. BTK take game number one. Yeah, that was a three, four man Manon's Fury set up by Cole World. And the rest of the members just kind of decide to pile in. And quite honestly, this kind of shows that BTK, they're not really, you know, always fighting. They pick the right moments, they get the right setups, they make sure Cole World is in the front. Same thing with Zane. Take a little bit of damage early on, take a little bit of some of the utilities, and they set up a perfect team fight, right? No one died there. And I, I and I do think I think from the side of BTK, Milo died twice, and that was about it. Maybe one other member died. And BTK 
having a very, very strong showing in the very first game of our series today, Trax. Yeah, and the thing is, it's okay if Mielo dies, right? It's, as long as he gets the final mm. slash off, it makes the attack. And there were so many members on the side of BTK that could make that play. Whether it was with the final slash, whether it was with the Shadow Stampede, whether it mm. was with Cold World getting the knock up. You know, any three of them could go in, you know, risk their life. And it buys just enough time, whether it's the one second stun, the one second knock up, the one second pullback, it buys enough time for BTK to jump on top of Bloodhounds and get the kills in. Yeah, and if you take a look at some of the assist, it is still kind of painting the same story of that trio mid from the side of BTK, right? The highest assists, highest kills are all kind of going towards the mid side. Of course, the kills goes to basic but it definitely sees that BTK, they are a team that the trio mid is quite important. Getting Nicolette set up with Moba Zane paired up with Cole World is giving them the advantage that they need, especially in the early on. They just have basic playing kind of like the, the DPS support role on the side lanes. Whenever they do get the opportunity to gank there, they can find kill pressure. And they've been just giving Milo kind of the space that he needs to be able to create these one versus one situations. And he's been able to come out on top over and over. We saw early on Milo is able to get a solo kill on Templis. And, you know, in this game, it's pretty much the same exact thing. Two solo kills on the top side. And when the side of Bloodhounds did decide to go up and gank with Falam, the flicker was there and he was able to get out of harm's way so definitely feels like bdk's strategy is kind of grouping up in this trio mid where they're the strongest right and this is going to be that mid lane we take a look at some of these stats the carry boca roscoe is what i want to point out because even though boca roscoe did the most amount of damage bloodhound still only puts three kills on the board mm. um and i think a lot of that just has to do with a lot of them you know bloodhounds what we kind of like to see especially in landing phase was them working together as a unit um being spread out and even though boca roscoe is landing some of those eternal guardians nobody else was there to follow up or everyone else was already too low health to kind of commit through mm -hmm. and you know for for the side of uh for for boca specifically i do want to kind of see a little bit more of the long range mages being out in play right maybe the sicilian can deal with uh the Faramis and get them into a position where they have some cc they have some range uh damage because boca has always been known for a lot of the, the far range mages, right? Sometimes he does go off meta like the Valir that he brought up in the last NACT. Uh, but this time around, I do want to see a little bit more of kind of like the Novaria, the Faramis, uh, and you know, the Vexana is quite good. And, and we did see him do a lot of damage there, but it just wasn't enough to like even make an impact in any of the early team fights that they had. Listen here, Uwe. Please, no, Sicilian. Don't listen to this. <laughs> man. We we finally got past that phase with Boca Roscoe, all right? We finally worked past it. You know, took several therapy sessions, but we made it past the Sicilian pick phase for him. Um, do I think some long range mages could be decent? Yes, like I think it is possible, but I think like the Novaria is a little better. You know, something we haven't seen in a very long time, something like the Farza. Um, nah, of no. course, a lot of these picks aren't as meta anymore, like these stationary picks like the Yeve and the Farza. And I think a lot of it's due to the the amount of CC that so many teams have, the amount of dive that so many teams have, that they are just kind of, you know, ripe for the picking. Um, but I think those are a bit more feasible if they kind of want to, you know, change things up a little bit. Um, but mm. I would honestly just say, you know, just keep it. They, they, it's like no matter what, they always have to throw one spicy pick into their draft, man. Like even there was the Dyroth. Like why not? Why not just, you know, go for the Akai. Basha or go for the Akai or, you know, leave Barats open and go for that. Like, like, just go for something a little more simple, like, because their draft looks so clean. And I think if they just would have picked something that wasn't going to get bullied in jungle, um, maybe it could have been a little bit better. We are going to be jumping into the second draft now, so we'll see what Bloodhounds wants to give us. The bands have already started. It's Xborg, Ruby for the side of BTK, and there goes the Matilda for Bloodhounds. Yeah, so second game plan for the second game, right? I do think Bloodhounds, you know, picking up the Fredrin, maybe stacking some of the CC that uh, the strategy that BTK and even like gaming gladiators love to do, right? Stack CC 
Faramis, uh, Fredrin, Arlot, Ruby. Those are the typical picks that can get your marksmen set up for a great front to back mm. because Bloodhounds is not a team that's known for assassin picks. Same thing with BTK. It's a very front to back heavy style where you have to deal with our front lines in order to get onto our backside. And I'm not recommending assassin picks because quite honestly, I think it's a little bit more risky, but being able to, you know, sustain in the front, hold up the front and hold them in place long enough for sleeps to do enough damage where they could progressively slowly move forward onto their backside might get BTK a little bit more tougher time, right? But you know, the non-CC comp, the utility movement speed focus, it just didn't really work out in the game one. Um, and I do think Bloodhounds have to change up their strategy, make sure they have some of the frontline CC or even the anti-CC, right? The Diggy could also be something that's available. Uh, maybe push them with the Owl pick and hopefully be able to sustain against the, the frontline pressure that BTK always, always has. Yeah, they, they, you're open. right. They, they either need to counteract it with, you know, sustainability or counteract it with, you know, as much CC and as much aggression, um, which everyone wants to work for them. So first pick open. You mentioned the Fredrin. Definitely still open. The Fermi is also still open, but they're going to go for the Angela instead. Nikolai going to pick it up. Um, very high chance we see the Fredrin still. Mobazane could also still take the Basha. The Basha Angela can be kind of mm. vicious. Um, it, lots of opportunity still. Maybe Mobazane wants to get even crazier. I think with an Angela, if you want to kind of pick up something aggressive in the jungle, you have a little bit more leeway to do that. Well, this is the interesting part about for the side of Bloodhounds. I thought they would have went for a Fair Miss and a Fredrin, right? Trading some of the best picks in slot for some of the other best picks but they opted to go for a little bit of a different route and i do think the nolan does work against btk right they did not have an assassin to get onto the backside and the nolan this time around should be able to get there same thing with the cc it's almost like a deny pick away uh from the combination that btk could use right the cc angela is very devastating um the joy is also available but i'm not sure if zane is going to be picking up that up for himself the fredrin the fair miss that has worked so well in game one is still roger both available. jungle no nope, never mind mm. fredrin they take the fredrin the roger is there roger this is a very interesting hero uh that has been coming into the meta recently right it's, it's one of those heroes that can deal with anything that any team is throwing into that gold lane. It could be a one versus two situation. He could kind of just dive around, use his long range ability, get those last hits on the creep and still stay alive with the wolf form to, to get that extra armor and magic resist. I mean, I, I think he's, yeah, he's he's kind of just taken over the meta. We have finally found some counters to him. You know, the Harith can work pretty well against him. Certain picks can work pretty well against him. There was a week or two where everyone was like, what do we I'm do here. with this gold lane pick? You know, um, so I think BTK, we definitely, I mean, we should see a Harith ban coming from the side of BTK. Maybe even like after that, possibly a Claude ban or a carry ban, some sort there of shredder ban. There's the Harith ban. Um, we saw Sleeps pick up the carry last time, so that could also be a possibility from BTK. Um, I think on the side of Bloodhounds, what do we want to see from them here? Um, they still need a gold laner. They still need a roam here. Um, you know, with Falam you know on I this think? Nolan, what do you think? The Edith. The Edith on um, Rome. We, we've seen the Edith. We, we've seen the Edith come out quite often. And why it pairs even better here Rome, is Rome, that Rome, right? Yeah, yeah on Rome, because like we could put sleeps in a physical uh, gold laner. We could put mm -hmm. Falam, a very damage focused physical carry. And then we paired it up with the Edith where he can build a lot of the armor to deal with the Roger and the Fredrin paired up with kind of the passive that he has where as much mm. armor as he gets, he gets more magic damage. And paired with the Fairmus, that's a very balanced frontline comp, has that pick, has that uh, pin that they need to be able to catch the Roger. It, it, could, it could be a great pick here. I think, and I think what it, something like that would work Minnow, Minnow pretty similar. Minnow's pretty similar, right? You still get some pressure. Mm. You still get some pick potential. And this is... So they look pretty similar to BTK last time. At least they're mid, except this, except they have the Nolan. And when I saw the Nolan, I'm thinking, are they really ready to go? Because they keep picking <laughs> these aggressive jungles, but it's like you weren't aggressive last time. 
you need to be aggressive if you're going to pick that uh, that type of jungle. You need to be ready to go for plays, not be passive. This time they have everything they need. I feel like you have sustainability. Mm. You have a you have a roamer that can get that can get knockups and stop hold people still for a second. Um, Bloodhounds win con. It's like they they need to attack either off lanes. They need to invade. They have to do something here to make plays happen quickly. I, I think they do. I think they do have it, especially with the Nolan. Nolan has been one of the uh more interesting jungle positions and talk about interesting here we have a hilda being in play and this character is so extremely good at early game pressure and especially since stoner is on kind of the minnow where it doesn't have that much early on it's it's gonna be quite tough and uranus once again he's gonna be cutting lanes in the, in the either the red side or the blue side and he's gonna be invading non-stop so falam is not going to have a great time in this match it's gonna be really really tough sleeps here i do think one of the best options is gonna be an early game hero right the brody so he doesn't have to you know See deal none. with a lot of the pressure but nope they go for another late game here it's, there's going to be an early invade comp from the side of BTK for sure. I mean, all right. So here's the here's the options, right? Bloodhounds, they do they do have a decent mid. Um, they have answers to kind of stop the early invade. You have crazy early game burst damage from Nolan. Cold World could easily just be food, right? As long as mm. they have this, they have the Shadow Stampede. They have the knockup from from Stoner on this Minotaur. Bloodhound should be able to catch Cold World if he if he go, which we already know he's gonna be literally in Falam's face on the first 20 seconds. Like that's that's his only mm -hmm. job here. Um, Bloodhounds has some answers. They have an early game. They have a late game. Their draft is not bad per se. Um, I think mm -hmm. it's very solid. It's just can they pull it off? Um, I kind of like that Uranus pick because Uranus is not gonna be easily gankable. Um, they're not really going to be able to push pressure into the EXP lane, but we'll see exactly what happens because we're jumping in to game number two in a best of five. BTK with the lead right now up against Bloodhounds. And, you know, you talked about the Uranus pick. It's such a, uh, a Milo pick for me. We've mm -hmm. seen it not mm -hmm. very often, especially in this meta, but he has been kind of the, the, the man behind this hero and you know bringing him back it's going to be very hard but there's already a, an early aggression onto the blue buff cold world is still quite healthy here so possibly looking to invade onto the other side sleeps is going to have trouble against basic Tough he needs time. to play this very safe the poke the yeah. damage roger's also kind of bulky um i think bloodhounds have to know uranus is going to be really hard to catch they need to try to Put pressure on a gold lane and down goes sleeps in the gold lane first blood already basic tower dives i saw it on the mini map and picks it up yeah, and this goes back to kind of what you were saying earlier where the side lanes of bt care is just so strong but on the top side they are chasing the members of the the, the other btk members out of their jungle it's you know, it's going to be quite hard to deal with, especially the advantage that BTK has, the ability to be able to win lanes by themselves, right? Create space with Cold World and Nicolette and Moba Zane with their rotations and try to get some of these one versus one advantages. That's what BTK is quite strong at here. Balam's looking for something here, man. Trying to find a target here. I think if Bloodhounds keep it patient, look for the play here. Booker Roscoe <laughs> unable to connect and find nothing there. Uh, Turtle is up. Are they going to try to go for the contest? Do they maybe try to make a play at bottom here? Mobazane is taking a little oh. bit of damage. Going to get pulled back. Maybe able to get away. Gets the taunt. Gets the bonk. And Pogorosko goes down. Mobazane able to get the kill. And that's right before Turtle comes up. But they're going to push it in even more. Basic here to help out. Gets a like and pounce. And down goes Stoner. It's a 3-0 right now. Now Mobazane going to make claim onto this purple buff. Yeah, that's just the early aggression of the Fresion, right? It's it, no wonder it's one of the best picks here. Oh, the damage on the Falam. Cold World able to get that kill. He gets his purple, but at the cost of his own life there. Look at Miello also <laughs> rotating down. BGK, man, just game one and two out rotating, out laning all over the, all over the beginning of the game.
Yeah, I mean, for the side of Bloodhounds, they really have to try to find a situation where they could win maybe even a small skirmish, a possible situation, because these one versus one lanes that BTK set up is just paying so much dividends here. And look at Cold World. He's just one versus four. He just has no care in the world in that red buff and just walks through. <laughs> it's a one man show, and Cold World is just able to create the impact that he needs here. I mean, and honestly, I feel like. Theoretically, Bloodhound should be able to catch Cold World when he's by himself. Wait a second, a little bit of damage on a Stoner there. Gonna get dived oh. on. The bomb comes down. A Stoner goes down. Flom still hiding under the tower, buffless, shirtless, in the cold <laughs> right now, in his own jungle. BTK have taken another solo kill in the box in the bot side. It's six and zero, oh, three thousand gold lead. Game two for BTK. Yeah, it really does show that BTK is much more prepared in this match in this series right the 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 new members of oh. bloodhounds just oh. unable to go through oh why <laughs> flom down zero two keep going yeah, keep going you way i'm sorry it's it's <laughs> It's, it, it's very, very tough, right? For the side of Bloodhounds, especially with the new members coming in, it's it doesn't seem like it is enough. And even look at this, Cold Ultra gets popped solo and Milo's on the backside. Oh, the dive. Okorosko in a little bit of trouble here. Nicolette still unable to get the kill just yet. Okorosko has to go back. Don't go into that bush. Um, <laughs> able to clear the wave. Bloodhounds so far behind right now. Yeah, it's it's really, really hard. And even look at this, the aggression just coming all over the map. Basic able to pick up another one on the boss side here. That's going to be four kills for the gold lane. And honestly, he set up that team fight quite well. He was able to get some pickoffs quite early on. Has the gold lead now almost doubling the gold of sleeps with this late game in a ton. And that's why I kind of wanted to go towards maybe like a Brody, right? Maybe a Brody into the Edith. They could get some pickoff potentials, maybe a frontline set, and maybe deal with some of the pressure and CC that uh, Hilda has so early on. And if, especially if they cannot deal with the early aggression that BTK has set up quite well in game one and now game two, Bloodhounds is going to struggle because they, they've not been known as a team that does well in the late game. And if you look at their draft, it's not always great late game either. You know, no, ooh, Templus able to get a kill. Nicolette finds sleeps though, but still a nice mm -hmm. pick onto the top side. Templus may go down. Mobazane 1v1 under the tower. Templus going to continue to chip away here. Mobazane walks into Flom here. Can they get the kill? Yes, Flom picks it up. You see the reaction from Mobazane too on cam. <laughs> a little upset about that one. Bloodhounds finally, you know, putting some, throwing some punches back, and I like it. Mm, it's a, a little bit more of a mistake on the side of BTK than I would say the outplay coming out from Bloodhounds, right? It's 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 a little bit tough already. BTK is already w with with such a huge lead, about 4K, and you know even with the jungler down, the side of Bloodhounds, they're unable to get any real estate past the river, right? They're just kind of waiting on their own side of the jungle. You could even look at Falam here, going potentially for the mid. They're waiting for the market to correct itself, looking for the real estate. <laughs> But the market's down bad right now for Bloodhounds. <laughs> no real estate available at all. BTK does not want to let it happen. Big Mano and Fury does not connect. And now Basic, maybe looking for the re-engage, has the heart guard, besides go back. Turtle back up. This is the second one. We're six minutes in. Mielo kind of holding claim to it. Taking mm. it slow, waiting for Mobazane to finish up his purple buff. Yeah, and you talked a little about real estate and investing here. I think for the side of Bloodhounds, maybe they got to take one from that type of book, right? They have to hodl now, especially when they're down so okay. much gold. They have to hold on to dear life, try to get into that late game, maybe get a better team fight set up because quite honestly, Sleeps, he needs time to scale. Nolan also needs a lot of physical damage in order to get the burst that he needs. So maybe the hodl strategy, just trying to make sure they can prolong the game, try to keep BTK out of a lot of the kill pressures. And if Bloodhounds do decide to fight, they need to make sure that the fights are gonna be in their favor. You know, in the stock market, they, they call it having diamond hands. You know, you got to hold on. <laughs> even when even when things are down low, you got to hold on and wait for the rise. Can Bloodhounds have those diamond hands right here and hold on for dear life? Because stonks are definitely down. 5,300 gold down right now. Basic going a little bit of trouble. The entropy comes out. Basic on the wrong side of it. It sleeps. Gets the shutdown. Cold World now. Also backing off. Mielo looking for... 
the maybe comeback, looking for the angle. Nicoletta Mobazain there as well. They were looking to take that tier two up top side, but Templis holds on. And you talked about if the side of Bloodhounds is able to kind of hold it down. I do think they have it in their arsenal here. You can saw right there, the Minone's Fury did catch basic quite off. They have the frontline setups to be able to deal with the early aggression that Hilda provides. And Hilda is one of those heroes that doesn't make that big of an impact when it comes down to the late game, right? And if you look at BTK's comp, they don't necessarily have that strong of a late game. Uranus does scale infinite. Um, Angelo also scales quite well. But um, for the side of Bloodhounds, they have so much more CC Ooh. here. Basic. He's looking, he's hunting, man. He's watching. <laughs> he's watching. I like the fact that he doesn't overcommit, though. BTK still mm. know their limits right now. They know they're up a different composition than last time. Um, we also know Book Rosco never used that Nether Realm. So if Basic would have jumped in mm. there, would have probably been bad news for him. Bloodhound's still hanging on. Gold lead's still at 4,400. They haven't lost any more towers since the last time we checked. Yep. Whole world going to get pulled in here. Needs to be careful. Bloodhound's trying to collapse onto him. A little bit of damage comes out. Oh, Dude. nice knockup. The Nolan's Fury comes down, only able to connect on to Nicolette there. But Mobazane in a bad spot. Looking for the bonk here. Doesn't have it to pop off. Lord back up. Bloodhounds don't want to push too long just yet. Harkard able to connect onto Basic here. Gets a dive onto Boca. Boca doesn't have the Nether Realm. Goes down. Basic able to pick up the kill. And this should, just, this should secure the first Lord. It was a decent team fight setup for the side of Bloodhounds, but the members of BTK is just a little bit too fed. They weren't able to handle Mobu Zane. It was like a three versus one situation, and they still can get out on top on that. But what the side of Bloodhounds do have is that they have this Natan, this late game damage paired up with the physical damage of Falam. It might be hard to deal with, especially building up a lot of the, the, the defense there. I mean, we are starting to see some, you know, moments of possibilities Damage. from Bloodhounds. I mm -hmm. think if the gold was even, their composition does have some ability to, you know, maybe, you know, win out on some team fights. They're kind of finding some groove here. Even though mm -hmm. they're behind right now, they have found a couple pickoffs. But a 7,000 gold lead is a lot for BTK. And it's going to be a while until Bloodhounds can even things out to even be able to play in the ballpark. Yeah, now with BTK just killing all the real estate that side of bloodhounds have they're going to be able to have all the jungle that they need to farm and they're even just looking to siege onto the top side the bully ball strategy that btk has even you know with less of a cc that they had in the last game right they have an angela they have a, a hilda those are not very cc oriented even the uranus right so they don't have a cc comp here but there's definitely playing out the early game quite well the hilda one zero and five paying dividends here Ooh. Our guard is forced out. Basic hmm. able to get it. BTK still unable to crack through an inhibitor just yet. Mielo jumps in. Bloodhounds don't seem to have an answer to that Uranus at all right now. It's like they could probably all use their CC just to get him. But then they're all out of utility and BTK just collapsed back. <laughs> yeah, and now for the side of Bloodhounds, they don't really have too much of a choice besides hiding underneath their tower, right? You got Coldworld, you got Milo. These are two heroes that is so extremely hard to deal with, so extremely hard to get them onto the low HP bar. And look, even the bush pressure, Coldworld is just not scared to face five of them. Ooh, he does get pulled back in. Arkar no doesn't offs. commit, but still it's going to be put on to cool, cool down there. Now could be a nice time for Bloodhounds to look for something, but Stoner doesn't have the Noans Fury, Sleeps, no Entropy, Falam, no Fracture. BTK mm. still looking for an angle. They take the orange buff, and I mean, they're, they're playing this so clean. They're just slowly stacking up more and more gold. Now we're at 9,300. Lord up at 30 minutes. They're not, compl they're not freezing lanes exactly, but they're not just like full pushing. Hmm. And when we talk about the Nolan, right, especially when he's down in gold, he's not going to be able to have that much damage to penetrate uh, some of the defense that maybe a utility jungle is able to pick up. So, there, you know, Bloodhounds is caught in a pretty dangerous situation where they, they, they may not have enough damage to answer uh, the defense that's coming out from the Uranus, from the Hilda. And BTK, with the early game advantage in the Snowball, they're able to farm up so much gold and push that advantage close to almost 10k now at 12 minutes 
and they can't even deal with the two front lines that the side of BTK has, right? Cold World just walking around their jungle nonstop. The Uranus also is not scared to face anyone. Just He's just like, hey guys, this is my jungle. No, 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 you cannot come here anymore. <laughs> They're trying to get Mielo. They're trying to find Three. just one member of BTK, but they're unable to. The heart guard comes in as well. Bloodhounds did everything they could there, and down goes the second Lord. BTK get a crash in with this one. Now, can Bloodhounds survive this? Yes. I think that the Minone's Fury paired up with the Natan into that late game, paired up with the physical damage output that comes out from the CC and the Nolan, they have the ability to create a very strong team fight, right? And the sustain is there. They have Boca using the cold ult or the Nether Realm. Like they, it, the possibility of Bloodhounds being able to flip some of these fights is definitely possible. It's just if BTK is going to be able to uh, get caught off here, right? Is the back lines um, in a safe position? And even with basic recalling here, he is half health. So that might stop an early siege on this uh, objective. And, you know, maybe they could get a pick off here. A little bit of damage on Mielo. Lord able to get the crack onto the bottom inhibitor. Down it goes. Hmm. Bloodhound's now still defending basic. Chips down onto the top inhibitor. Bloodhound's still playing it safe, and I think this is the right move. Sleeps, able to take out the Lord. They lose two inhibitors for that, but I don't think they're going to go down just yet. Falam gets a little bit of damage on Mielo. He gets it back pretty quickly. More poke damage coming from basic. BTK looking for the mid inhib. Right now, Mobazane also playing the angle. Watch for Cole World. Any moment <laughs> to strike. Another wave of minions crash down the top side. Bloodhound's defenses come up, though. And they don't overcommit. They don't try to, you know, they don't pop off any crazy Minoan's Fury. They want BTK to come to them. They know they have the bottleneck answer here. BTK's got to come into their territory if they want to finish this. Otherwise, Bloodhounds is just going to bide more time. And I like the way BTK's doing it as well. They're just kind of testing. They're throwing in a little bit from the mm -hmm. left, a little bit from the right. Waiting for Bloodhounds to come in. And there comes the Minoan's Fury. A lot of damage on Miello. Second up by another knockup. More damage on Miello, but he's still up. Bloodhounds now down the Entropy, down the Minoan's Fury. A little bit of damage comes on a Templus there. Mielo backs off, and BTK backs off as well. It's, it's, it's so extremely calculated from the side of BTK to have the discipline to slowly chunk down that mid tower, right? There's no full commit, there's no dive. They know they're very extremely objective focused. And BTK is a team that, you know, is very bully oriented they know you know they 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 have the experience they know they have the past and they, they've shown the results and they've been able to go through some of the top teams in north america and this time around they're not playing it easy here they're taking this best of five series full on serious they want a sweep coming through side of bloodhounds though they are still trying to defend against the pressure that btk has set up and look at this they're just unable <laughs> to get any pick off btk they're almost just farming statistics here we should see a quite a huge sandbag coming out from either the uranus or even the the hilda from the btk side you know, you said something when this game first started. BTK lacks CC, right? They lack crowd control. Yeah. They have none on the XP lane. No Arla, right? They went for this Uranus. Cole World Angela. went for, went for uh, you know, this Hilda. Uh, Hilda, which is more of an early game bully, but you lose CC in late game. And then you're right. Mm -hmm. You also have the Angela. So BTK has no way to really do that bully attack, really push in. And they know that even though they're so far ahead in gold, if they overcommit, and a big three or four man knockup comes in, it's still losable. So they have mm -hmm. to play this safe. They have to wait till this next Lord. Bloodhounds knows that. And I think if Bloodhounds, they, I'm wondering if they're going to contest this next Lord. If they don't and they can survive it, then we're in a point where maybe Bloodhounds can come back here. Mm, well, aside of Bloodhounds with the Natan, it does provide a lot of CC and clearing. Uh, and of course, the Natan the, and, and the uh, Nolan, it's a very mixed damage um, composition. So it's very hard to defend against. But BTK, even with no CC, it feels like they're still playing it quite well. They're not really looking for team fights. They're looking to get maybe one or two ultimates out of Bloodhounds before they look to fully commit in these fights. And Ooh, it doesn't look the like they're damage going. from basic though. Bokorosko goes down. That means no Nether Realm. Another member falls. It's Stoner down. Sleeps Please. able to find Cold War, but the Lord's already connected. Bokorosko back on the map. Nether Realm able to help out and keep his team up. 
It's a two for one right now. Because of the passive from that Faramis, it feels like no loss at all for Bloodhounds, and they survive another Lord push. BTK mm. still unable to crack the defenses. Falam still on the field as Sleeps chips away at the minions. BTK unable to find a way in, and Milo is getting more and more shredded every single moment. Harkar does connect on a basic. He tries to use the Lycan Pounce with Sleeps, backs off with the Entropy. More damage on a Sleeps. Mielo looking for the dive, but unable to get the finish. Another wave on the boss side, but just a canyon, and Bloodhounds defend once again. Yeah, it's a great defense from the side of Bloodhounds, right? Like, they're able to uh, defend against the Siege, and that might be what BTK is kind of lacking. In terms of that late game, Roger is very, very good early, yeah. has a lot of sustain, has a lot of armor, but doesn't have kind of like the, the, the raw damage output that something like a carry or a Claude has, right? They don't have a full-on mage bursting. They have Milo for magic damage and Angela. So the BTK, they still have a lot of weaknesses in this draft. It's a very aggressive early game draft. They got the snowball that they were looking for. The Hilda has been unkillable. Same thing with the Uranus. So things are going in favor of BTK. But the side of Bloodhounds, they have the ability to team fight. They have have AOE CC. Their front to back is extremely hard to deal with. They also have the mixed damage, right? So the later the game goes, the more even these golds become. It might be hard for BTK to get that victory in the team fight to be able to seal the deal and pick off maybe majority of the members because in most of these fights right now, BTK, they're Oof. only be able to get like one or two at most. And, you know, if they do get the Fairness, the Fairness just comes out right back alive here. Yeah, let's be honest, this is starting to feel comebackable. Um, mm -hmm. The only problem is, is I, I almost want to think they should con they should contest this Lord here, man, because this Lord right here is going to be a chunky boy, and it might buy BTK enough time just to be able to free hit onto the base here. Um, BTK can't end this without a Lord, I feel like. there's. I, I don't think they can even really completely come out on top of a fight right now in Bloodhound's mm. base without a Lord. Um, with this Lord, I think this is the one BTK has to end it here. Um, because at that point, Bloodhounds are going to be around that 60k gold mark. Everyone's going to be maxed out on items. Yep. There's not going to be much of an advantage anymore. And at that point, BTK's only real win con is just macro play. Luckily, they have the Angela. They can always play the off lanes. But Bloodhounds is going to start having the opportunity to kind of come out on top in team fights. Well, you know, the Roger doesn't have that huge of a damage output when it comes down to being full items. Has a great burst. Has a great kind of... Uh, kind of like the decimation of uh, the Martis, uh, but it's it, it's it's not something that's like extreme damage over time. He has a few of the spells that he can kind of just burst down one or two members. So BTK is, is it still might be a very tough siege with how much Bloodhound has in order to defend against it. And the timing, always crashing at the same time. Sleeps takes a crap load of damage. Basic still playing the angle, Flom. Also still hanging out. Lord getting melted down. Cold World low. Milo oh. low. Mobazane as well. But Boca Roscoe finally taken out. Should be back up in two seconds. Template still on the map. Base down to 20%. Lord still connecting. And BTK able to finally finish it. It's two and zero. It's still quite calculated from the side of BTK. They knew the Lord was marching down. And you, and, and you said it yourself, right? They, The side of Bloodhounds, maybe they should have tried to uh, get the Lord or try to group up and get a team fight going. Because right there with the Chonky Lord walking down, BTK has all the time in the world to hit the base. And they're able to get a few pop-offs early. A few of the members did die towards the end. But they were able to secure that victory pretty much with no problem there. 14, 6, and 23 is going to be BTK's overall KDA. I mean, I think, yeah, there was a there was definitely a clock ticking there for Bloodhounds, and I think they had a mm -hmm. moment there. Um, if they still had an inhibitor up, if they still had something, if they had some sort of reverse pressure, maybe they could have survived that lore, but that was, what, Lord number four? Mm -hmm. Pretty sure it was number four, and at that point... You know, they don't even need to be able to CC you. They just got to get that Lord to connect, and they synced up all those waves perfectly. You know, they collapsed on the Bloodhounds, and there wasn't really an answer at that point. Um, I think Bloodhounds just thought... I, I think they truly believe they could survive another push. Mm, and I think a lot of these teams, 
especially when they're going up against a lot of the contenders of uh, NACT. Maybe they should try to go for something a little bit better in the early game, right? Try and try, try not to be able to lose lanes that quickly. Or in, in, in the first game, we saw kind of Templis falling off a little bit against Milo. And in this game, we saw Basic completely pop off against Sleeps early on. Able to get a solo kill, I think level two, got another kill after that. And he was just, you know, dominating in that lane. So trying to find comps that you know deal good in a one versus one situation right our lot with a lot of sustain i know the uranus got popped up cc definitely still very very strong in the xp uh, he he played a lot better this time around especially uh, compared to the our lot game that milo had and you know Oh, now now we can take a look at the sandbag here 30 uh, 300, <laughs> 300 damage taken by milo that is huge considering he, that <laughs> did he die uh i think I, he, he maybe died once or maybe not he's just un, unkillable bonkers that's insanity right now one he died one time one time this man died in 313 thousand damage for a second i thought it was 31 thousand two but no that's 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 six digits right there you win Mm -hmm. And the head-to-head -head is going to be Nicolette versus Boca. You look at the KDA, Nicolette played extremely clean. It was on the Angela, not a traditional mage pick, but definitely worked out quite in favor for the side of BTK. Now, we are going to be moving on closely into that match three. I I, I, I really think Bloodhounds, they have to find the early game damage. The, 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 the Natan, it, it, it's a pretty good pick. Um, but quite honestly, dying two times early on against the Roger, that's not something uh, we want to see. I thought the Minotaur worked out quite well, and Boca definitely had a much better game. The mid trio had a much better game this time around compared to the last time. But BTK just overwhelmed the side of Bloodhounds when it comes down to uh, just the laning in the early phase, some of the rotations, and especially the objective. Right, BTK was able to pick up pretty much everything with absolutely no contestion from the Hounds. Most definitely, and I mean, with that, BTK puts themselves at match point. Bloodhounds have gotten progressively better. Game one was really rough. Game two, they were able to take it the long haul. You know, can they finally tie everything up together with a bow on top and maybe take a game here? You know, maybe stop mm. the sweep from BTK UA. Yeah, I mean, they definitely need to try and stop the sweep right now because this is the opportunity that they have to be able to stay in the upper brackets, right? BTK, a very strong team. We know they're probably, possibly, possibly one of the best teams in NACT so far, and it's going to be extremely hard to deal with it. Once again, I think the game two was a lot closer than game one. I felt like they had the opportunity, and we even saw moments of greatness uh, from the Minotaur to be able to get multiple stuns off. It was just unfortunate that the early game, the snowball that uh, BTK had, especially with the Hilda, just paid completely off. There was no situations where the Hilda felt like he was in danger. Milo didn't really feel like he was in danger at all, even tanking up to 300k uh, damage. So uh, maybe they have to fix the early game. Maybe they have to pick the Fredrin, because not don't don't let Moba Zane take the best hero that he loves to play. Like <laughs> deny that pick away, pick that second pick, and maybe come out with a draft that the side lanes can go a little bit more even, pushing them and prolonging the game. Because Bloodhounds, they still have a great team fight. They all their players know exactly what they need to do in what situations. They have the ability to get onto the backside. They have the ability to face. Uh, head head to head against one of the best teams here. It's just I think they're missing a few points, a few a, a few winning lanes in order to get to where they really need to get uh, to prolong the series. Well, speaking of heroes, before we jump into game number three, we got a quick little giveaway for all the fans, <laughs> all the viewers. You wait, get your phone out, snatch that QR code real quick. Maybe snatch two, one for me as well. It's a tournament chess, tons of skins for you to win. 40 out there, only 40 out there. First come, first serve. So redeem the code. So redeem the code for a chance to win one of these permanent skins. We're not talking about three-day trials. We're not talking about seven-day trials. These babies are permanent, UA. Yeah, and 
you know, definitely guys go out, use that QR code, try to get and pick these up because if you don't, I know Zeke is in the background with multiple he is. phones looking I can see him for right those now. skins. You know, he, he always sees like, dude, you saw that Moscow skin, that's so beautiful. You saw this skin. I know he's on the backside getting all the accounts. So guys, please go over there, hit the QR code, snatch and redeem those coupons because it is not going to last long. All right, so back to the series now. Match point for BTK. Mm. Um, you know, you mentioned that maybe maybe Bloodhounds need to go for something early as well. And once again, mm -hmm. once again, you know, I hate to keep pointing it out, but we see, you know, they, they sprinkle just a, a little bit of spice into their draft. With the For me, it was the Natan <laughs> this time. Yes, it's like we see it get picked here and there, but it's a it's an oddity, you know? You don't see it all the time. Um, and especially when there's something like the carry open or something like this open or, you know, plenty of other options open that are very viable. Um, and I, I think maybe they're big braining it too much. Maybe it's like, okay, we picked this really nice early game jungler on Falam. Now we need some really good late game insurance. Um, and I think maybe just, maybe it's overthinking. Maybe it's just, you know, trying too hard to cover all your bases. But we're going to be jumping into the draft. So we'll see if Bloodhounds can kind of steer the boat here steer the car to a slightly better position because this is one match away from lower brackets one match away from being knocked out of a decent position in the nact playoffs and this is the new lineup coming out from the side of bloodhounds right falam coming in stoner on the rome templates back into his xp uh position so and the last match that we had did go almost 20 minutes. So Bloodhounds, mm. they've been stepping up and up every single game. I think this time they're definitely going to be able to have the opportunity to prevail and push through that blockade that BTK has set up. Right now, the side of Bloodhounds, it's, it's extremely hard for them to get the very first objective go for some winning lanes, even have an advantage in the early on, if they can negate some of that weakness and maybe go 50-50, maybe just go even. You give up the objectives, get the siege onto the opposite side like we're talking about. Maybe that type of strategy, pressuring basic early on, could get them a lead in this series because so far we have not seen bloodhounds been able to get a significant noticeable lead in any of these games they have to trade something it could be trading their late game for early game aggressiveness for the snowball kind of the same thing that btk had they traded their late game for early game and it ended up being a prolonged 20 minute game where they literally had to toss all the bodies onto the inhibitor to be able to get that down Right? So BTK took the risk and they were able to reap the rewards. Now, I want to see the side of Bloodhounds be able to take some risk. They've lost early game. They've lost early lanes early on both games. And this this is this third match. This is it. This is where mm. Bloodhounds really need to step it up, really need to get their strategies together, get those winning matchups. And if they can get a lead early on, I think it sets up them way much more for the success in the late game. I mean, I, I, if they get an early lead early on, if they start off the game with a 2,000 gold lead, I think it catches BTK so off guard that they, they <laughs> it's, a, it's a guaranteed win at that point, you know? Um, but because here's the thing, the, we last game, something I, I noticed too, so in game one, Templus really got the mm -hmm. better of. In game two, it felt like every lane was getting the better of. We saw Sleeps get solo killed. Boca Roscoe was getting bullied away from minions by Nicolette on the mid side. Um, they BTK is making it even hard for them to want to trade because it feels like even if they go for the trade, they're going to lose two two towers instead of just taking one. Um, but I do think that showing some favoritism to the off lanes could be helpful for Bloodhounds because that's where it seems like they're losing the most at. Whether it's EXP or gold, someone's getting diffed on one of the sides. Someone's getting taken out on one of the sides. And I think Bloodhounds need to see those weaknesses. They need to see the problem and approach it. Because at this point, we're not going to see Sleeps just get tremendously better in gold lane in one day. We're not going to see Templus just get tremendously better in EXP lane in a, in a single game. So Bloodhounds need to know, okay, you're having trouble in lane. Let's go help that out. Now, first pick is going to be the Ruby. First time we've seen it slide through draft here is it going to be the difference i i'm not sure about the ruby because the side of btk they're going to pick up the frederick 
right? The, potentially, the Roger worked so well last game, they could pick that up themselves this time around. And it does leave things like Minotaur available. The Valentina is going to be the one that locks in. I think the IMU is going to be e enough to take uh, the I'm Offended away from the Ruby to be able to get the displacement. And now they've already set up a very front to back heavy composition that, you know, BTK loves to run. They could take the Fredrin. The Akai is going to be available there. They take the Akai, you know, Mobazane gets his Fredrin. So there's still so many good heroes available for the side of Bloodhounds here. I feel like something like a Novaria with a far range, with the lane clear, fits very well with Boca's style. And, you know, he's loved this Novaria pick so much in the regular season. It's very surprising to me that even with no Navaria bans, Boca is still not confident enough to pick it in their composition. It prolongs the game. It, it forces the side of BTK to go heavy dive, which a traditional front to back comp does not have in order to get to that. And oh man, you Goes talked the about instead. the <laughs> out, out of the box picks here. We got two on the on, on the draft standings here, Trax. You know, and I and you just mentioned the Navaria is open. And I think that could have been a very solid pick here, um, especially because you got a very short range Valentina. You have a very short range carry. Um, so Boca Rosco is just essentially always in a very safe position. He said he goes for this Gord. Yes, there's some damage. Yes, there's some possibilities. You pair it up. I can see the potential of, you know, maybe pairing it up with the full barrage, pairing it up with the I'm Offended, with the ability to lock people still for a, for a few moments with this Ruby. I can see the hypotheticals here, but it's definitely high risk. On the other side, mm. BTK, Mobile Zane. Hey, man, we're match point, baby. We're match point. <laughs> Let's pull out the Alpha. And, you know, alpha we're in online, such a... baby. We're, 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 we're in such a dive heavy meta currently with things like the Roger, the Herit, the Fredrin, the Akai. Like it's very dive heavy. And to put two stationaries alongside of each other so early on in the draft, right? The Gord is not going to get banned out. No one cares about the Exia. Now you've opened up the possibility of BTK going extremely heavy on a dive, right? Things like Yuzong can easily get onto the Gord. Uh, things like the Alpha, short cooldowns, has the Alpha charge, can get from one place to another. And it does so extremely heavy on like the early game damage, has the true damage. It's just, it's just going to be very hard for Gord and Exia to get away from the Wrath that uh, the Alpha can provide with the composition that BTK has. Yeah, let's, so let's let's be real here though. One of the advantages <laughs> from Bloodhounds, Alpha has a 0% win rate right now. You know, last mm. time we saw Mobazane pick this up, day one, NACT, takes a loss on it. Then continues mm. to take a loss for the rest of the series. So, you know, maybe <laughs> Bloodhounds can try to can can try to copy that. If they can beat Mobazane's Alpha, it could spell victory for the rest of their games. It's like, you know, it's it's oh. the mojo, you know? Um, but they also pick up the Florin, add on a little bit more sustain, kind of pair up with this Alpha, add on some of that. You you want to have some of those close range guys to capitalize off that bloom. So, I, I mean, BTK, it's definitely a different draft, but the hypotheticals are also there. Yeah, technically, BTK has been drafting significantly different in all of their games today, right? The first yeah. game, it was stacking CC. Now, the Fredrin frontline, they had the R lot. Second game, you know, it was more about kind of the the split, the early on aggression, the snowball, the risk that they took, and it paid off well. And this time around, they pretty much have a dedicated support lineup. There's no front line oh. sets for the carry here, but the out of the world pick from the side of Bloodhounds, Falam picks up this, this, <laughs> Uh, an, another fish in the water where there's there's not much mobility and i don't know if that's going to be fish enough the water. to deal against the alpha uh which is going to just cleave through all the front lines of bloodhounds i like that fish out of water octopus whatever you want to call it and you know <laughs> here's the thing i'm not saying the bane is completely unviable but it's you're picking someone that has to walk right into an alpha charge you know you're picking someone that has to walk <laughs> right into oh, just no. getting speared in the face um bloodhounds kind of have this composition where you definitely want to group up you have a little bit of dive coming from templus on this lapu but it's definitely very different bloodhounds now forget a little bit of spice 
We're putting the whole pepper in there, baby. We're dumping the whole thing of cracked. We're putting the whole thing of table salt in the stew right now and stirring the pot. Bloodhounds put it on the line on match point. Yeah, and it's gonna be it's gonna be a very interesting match. You know, it's exciting that we get to see a lot of these different heroes come out to play. We don't see glue that often, and glue is one of those heroes that's like kind of anti-engage, right? You use the split split, everyone runs away. And especially with the ability that he has to close distance, he's gonna be on Boca. He's gonna be on sleeps and his stoner with the Ruby enough to uh front line against that. We shall see here. We'll see as we jump back into the land of Dawn, BTK at match point, ready to send Bloodhounds down to the lower bracket. Can Bloodhounds pull this off with a slightly different composition than what, than what we would see every day? And, you know, I kind of want to mention this alpha pick, right, from Moba Zane. You know, there's, I, I believe there's a region either in MY or Singapore where there's a there's a core player, there's a jungle player that plays this alpha. But topside here, Templis already. Really aggressive. Already. Oh, Templis already. gets the shield. Already down. First blood. Mielo able to pick it up. Yeah, and you can see the quick flicker, quick spells. Milo didn't even, you know, go for the level two. He was just level one and just tried to get the early game advantage. And they're able to get the offlane pickoffs once Ooh. again. Even a jungle kill here, Trax. It's, it's falling apart here. It's falling apart. You can hear Juice World <laughs> in the background right now. Sad boy music playing. Bloodhounds <laughs> having trouble. You know, last time we saw Glue, I think, on the international stage was probably, I think, Flap Teasy. Can't remember if mm. he picked it actually up against a Lapu as well. Um, I forget exactly what he picked it up against, but it did very well. Um, and it's it's definitely not a pick you see all the time, but against certain EXP laners, especially some of the uh, older meta EXP laners, things like the Lapu, things that when the glue came out, he did very well against, you figure out that he still does pretty well against these picks. Yeah, I mean, they did nerf a lot of the base damage that glue had, right? Back then, you, you know, people used to try to build like magic penetration because base damage was so high, but bot side here, Oh, but he's going to bully Flam right now. Out comes the deadly catch. Flam able to just get away there. But this is where Glue's going to thrive up against these physical meleeers, people that don't mm -hmm. have dashes. He's just going to walk right in and cause chaos. Yeah, it's like it's, it's almost like it's like an anti-melee hero and you can see Bloodhounds already falling apart here. Moba Zane, even with the 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 Mountain Dew coming out from uh, the Florin, he's almost just unkillable at this point. Level six already denies the blue buff. Looking to see if he could get even more here. Decides, you know, Falam, he could take the red. I'm gonna take both my buffs and I'm just gonna keep farming up. We already are at a 1.3K gold lead, three minutes in here. And you know, the side of Bloodhounds, it's just, it's not looking too great so far. Ooh, nice damage on the cold world. Boko Roscoe decides not to use the flicker there. Unable to get the kill on the cold world. Flam also still just trying to farm. I think at this point he is a full two levels behind Moba Zane right now. BTK mm -hmm. just in complete control. Boko Rosco can't even really clear his wave completely. I mean, he's going to move down now, but still. I'm, I'm looking for answers here, but BTK, even with their slightly different composition, it feels like it just hard counters what Bloodhounds wanted to bring. And a full send dive. Oh, full send dive, full send kill. Sleeps goes down. UA, they're falling apart, man. Match point. Game two, we saw some promise, but game three, it's looking like trouble. You know, even with not like, even with BTK not really killing like all the time here, they're still winning lanes, right? The glue, no problem against the Lapu. And we saw earlier basic even able to trade out quite well against sleeps here. The jungle, of course, Moba Zane already level eight against a level six Falam. Like all the lanes of Bloodhounds is just not working out against the Thirsty Kings here. And I'm offended coming through. Ooh, Alpha Charge does come in, a lot of damage. Stoner goes down. Moba Zane might be the next fall though. They do respond Templates, able to get the shutdown. But Mielo still causing mayhem on this purple buff. Able to do whatever he wants. Falam luckily does get it, but now Templis in the midst of three members looking for the kill on to Cold World, but he gets terrified. Mielo now gonna come help out, but decides to stay around the turtle here. Try to keep Falam away until Mobazane gets back on the map. 
it is a good pickoff against Moba Zane, right? The side of Bloodhounds, yeah. that's what they desperately need. And we did see kind of the 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 hope that the side of Bloodhounds have with this Gord pick. The damage, quite good. Even with building a Enchanted Talisman first item, you know, he doesn't have the penetration. He doesn't have the slow from the Ice Queen wand. Even just an Enchanted Talisman is able to shred down the members of uh, BTK. And, you know, that's the that's the problem with things like Alpha. Does high damage, has a lot of high utility, but, you know, does lack in terms of trying to defend against some of the CC here. But top. I'm close, Milo man. Again. Poor, poor Templus. That... He can't do anything against Glue right now, man. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> Glue, I mean, <laughs> as the, as the Lapo, you want to kind of dash in, you want to do things, and and Glue just bullies him so bad. He is like the natural born enemy right now of Lapu Lapu. Um, one thing I do want to point out with Bloodhounds, you mentioned earlier, we saw some combo potential. They do have a heavy CC, literally. Every member on their team has some form of push around, lockdown, you know? If they can kind of get these grouped up fights, kind of get BTK into some of these jungle area positions, not just like open space, um, it's definitely a dangerous spot for BTK. Uh, Bloodhounds need to try to play around that. Oh, a lot nice of magic gush, though, the does gush. land on him yellow. Nice charge from Obazane there though. Falam still unable to get his purple buff. I think Mobazane stole that one once again, and now we're still looking at a two-level difference between Mobazane and Falam. Yeah, but one of the interesting things is the gold lead has not really moved in a significant way yet. Bloodhounds is able to kind of defend pretty much everything that uh, the side of BTK has been throwing at them. Yes, they're losing kills left and right here and there, but they're still able to get the pickoffs. They did get Mobazane earlier. They're able to defend this, uh, this orange buff now. So, you know, even with just a 2k gold lead, Inside of BDK, they're not really able to, uh, you know, translate some of this gold lead into some objectives. They're, they're they're getting the neutral objectives, but no tower has fallen for the side of Bloodhound. So even with you know a kill early on, the level one kill on the top side, Glue just being dominating anywhere that he goes, the side of Bloodhounds are still holding up quite well in this game three. Yeah, much better than what we've seen before, and even that little, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the cheeky lane swap that they just did. Yes, BTK now swaps swaps lanes as well, but the thing is, is it bides Bloodhounds a little bit of time. Um, Yellow could mm -hmm. not get the better of Sleeps. Um, Basic could not get the better of Templus. Bloodhounds actually take the first tower in this game, so yes, there's definitely some show of opportunity here in game number three for the side of Wait. Bloodhounds. They're gonna try to move on. Nice, I'm offended. Paired up with a deadly catch, basic, and a little bit of trouble. Full barrage comes out, paired up with a magic gush, and that's the combo. We wanna see Bloodhounds putting a kill on the board along with another tower. That's the long range combo. Uh, the barrage paired up with the mystic gush with the I'm offended here, but Zane might be caught oh off. Oh my God, the damage from Moba Zane, the triple kill. Alpha online, baby. Is he going to make it a quad? Looking for the maniac. Moba Zane dives in and finds another one still under the tower. Going for it, the savage. Moba Zane's a monster under the tower and all 1v5. He's like... You know, you guys got the top side tower, you guys got the kill on basic, but you're forgetting I'm a level 12 alpha, fully farmed up, has both my bloodless war axe, possibly into a brute force. This man got a savage here, and it was like a two versus five situation. You had the bloom on the backside to be able to sustain a little bit, but Moba Zane was just cracking out so much damage against the members of Bloodhounds. They were just unable to defend the mid, and now they've literally lost the gold lead it's 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 now 5k instead of 2k the top tower the mid tower everything goes down here it's a bloody mess now for the side of bloodhounds the redemption arc is hard on the alpha <laughs> right now first time he played he it win zero percent win rate yeah he, need, he needs to get that win rate up man he's he's trying to show <laughs> that it's viable it's viable baby <laughs> I don't know if we're ever going to see it again, but definitely exciting to watch. And that's the high risk, high reward. You have some picks like that that definitely are meta. But if you get ahead and now it's 8-1-0 on an alpha, mm -mm. It's, a, it's a problem. Yeah, it's a very tough situation. And that's not even counting the bloom coming out from the Florin, right? This alpha Florin combination, it, it was kind of those like rank game strategies that they had early on in our season. But now with the little few nerfs, it shouldn't be this good. But Moba Zane and Cold World is proving it 
to still be quite solid here in one of the biggest platforms of North America where, you know, teams, the best teams come out and play and MOBA Zane definitely is showing why they are considered one of the best teams in the game. Ooh, nice flicker in. Sonar able to get the kill on the Cold World there. BTK should be able to take this Lord. They lose one member. Sleeps able to get his own, or able to pick up that orange buff. So Bloodhound's still not losing out too much, but it's a 7,000 mm. gold lead for BTK. And look at the damage from MOBA Zane right now. Yeah, he's pretty much unkillable. He's level 15. He, you know, his, his scaling right now. 15, he, bro. He, he's getting close to his peak scaling, right? He's, he's going to be able to grab up like three, four items, all cool down, 40% cool down. And once he gets onto that, he's essentially unkillable, right? I, I, I mean, the Mystic Gush, I'm offended, displacement with the Missile Barrage. There's possibility there to be able to single out Zane, but you also have to deal with the Florin Ultimate. Right? You have to also deal with the IMU with the displacement of taking uh, the I'm Offender. You also have to deal with the glue on the backside just, you know, disrupting a lot of these team fights. So even with BTK, like there's still possibility of shutting down Zane. But with so many, so much kills and so much gold on Zane's hand, it, it just really smells trouble. I, d I don't know if the side of Bloodhounds is going to be able to defend against the siege that BTK has set up here. We haven't even mentioned late game carry, you know? I mean, <laughs> even if they put if they put everything on the MOBA Zane, basically just getting free hits with speedy light wheels. Like, please dive in, waste all your alts on the MOBA Zane. Maybe you get the kill, but then basic reaps the benefits. So it's definitely a hard code to crack here. B hmm. BTK now knocking on the door, Bloodhounds. This is not an enhanced Lord, so will not get the charge. BTK might not be able to break an inhibitor, but they are all focusing on the boss side. Basic, pops the speedy light wheel, just to unload, bring it down to about half health. Stoner misses the I'm offended. Mielo does get targeted down, hits a split split. Nicolette dives in, able to pick up that deadly catch. I'm waiting for the big combo from BTK here, waiting for the full attack. Yeah, and it's quite interesting that they decided to put a lot of members onto the bot side when the Lord is marching down on the top. They were able to get a kill on the bot side. They, you know, picked off Templates. Now they're able to pick off the bottom tower with almost no problem in the siege. All members of PTK are completely full health, looking to siege more onto the mid side. Yeah, Moba Zane now. In the midst of the tower, full barrage does come out. Cold World does go down. Templus oh. takes a lot of damage, but just gets away. Oh. Moba Zane hasn't struck in yet. Deadly Catch does come out. Melo dives into the backside, able to get the stun. Looking for the next target. Melo able to get the grab, grab, slam, slam, oh. bring him on in. And a lot of damage unloads. Templus goes down, so does Melo. Nicolette able to dance around a little bit, get the terrify on a flam. But be Bl Bloodhounds are still up. BTK finally backing off. A little bit of a uncharacteristic dive, especially comparing the first game one and game two. This is one of the first time that BTK did kind of make a small mistake uh, trying to siege onto the mid side, right? They were able to get the tower. That's the objective that they're able to take. But then there was not much discipline. There was a full on dive from Milo and also Cold World getting picked off by the Mystic Gush. Two members ended up falling there, giving Bloodhounds, they're able to close the gold lead just a little bit. So it's not going to be 10k, it's going to be 8.3k now. They're 13 minutes in. I mean, I, I think still, yeah, they lose Mielo. If Bloodhounds maybe didn't take any deaths there, it was it may be a slightly even, but with BTK now cracking on two inhibitors before second Lord, it is pretty huge. Um, top inhibitor also down to half health. This next Lord is going to be a charge in one, um, and it's coming down the mid side. BTK just hard pushing right now. Hmm, and... You know, BTK definitely is ready uh, to try to get this game to end. Zane has already gotten his Savage. They're able to, you know, complete a great early game. Now the Lord is marching down. Full barrage. barrage. Paired up with the Magic Gush. Paired up with all the rest. Nicolette does pop the winner. Trunchy on able to, able to survive the burst from Templus. But in the midside, Mobile Zane's trying to clean up Flom. Goes down basic, picks up the kill. Mobile Zane taking a lot of shots to the face. Immortality does proc. BTK just trying to lock on the base, trying to end it here. The Bloodhounds don't want to see the lower bracket just yet. BTK find another, and it's nothing but Volker Roscoe on the field. Gets pulled in. I'm offended, and BTK sweep the match, sending Bloodhounds to the lower bracket. Yeah, it's a great match coming out from the side of Blood, uh, BTK. Able to get the victory here. A complete clean sweep. 14-minute match for the contenders. 
definitely a strong performance. This is not something that I think anyone is quite surprised. You look at, you know, some of the caster votes, everyone's siding with BTK, their history, their experience, and even with their synergy and their story in this NACT. They went from one of the bottom teams in the standings all the way leading up to the very tip top, able to just prevail, upset, get the victories that they need. And this time they're definitely proving that they are that team that's going to be contending for the championship. 16-7 is their overall KDA. And, you know, a, a wonderful match coming out from BTK again. It really does show that their, their side lanes shine quite well especially paired up with a lot of the lower teams right the xp there's a gap there the the gold basic is just always doing well here and now with mobo zane getting the savage here that's a complete highlight reel for the kings of kings yeah first first savage first savage of playoffs yesterday we did see a maniac happen but i don't think we saw savage mobo zane able to pull one out of his pocket here definitely making the sweep worth the watch there mm -hmm. um taking a look at some of these overall stats, like we said, man, Moba Zane just maxed out in items very Massive. quickly. Eight, one, and four. Um, was even able to do a little bit of uh, dancing with the immortality at the end there. Bloodhound's just unable to keep up. And you mentioned that even if they take down Moba Zane, we started to see basic coming online as we crept into the mid and late game. Yeah, I mean, there was moments where Zane was kind of getting caught here and there extremely low on HP or, you know, taking the first hit for the team. And then you could just see basic on the backside. He's not the one that's actually doing the highest damage. Moba Zane here, 48,000 damage, highest gold per minute, of course. You know, being able to farm up the Savage, getting those situations, getting those push, early game advantage, paired up with the turtle. It's very hard for junglers to be able to get the highest gold per minute, mm. especially since the gold lane has so much opportunities to get the cannons. But here, Moba Zane definitely proving a point and boosting that alpha win rate that has been uh, quite lacking 50%, in the North baby. American scene. <laughs> Taking a look at the head-to-head, -head, Nicolette still just, I mean, going deathless here. Being, I mean, since since she joined BTK, a lot of us wondered how she was going to do, how she was going to fit the mold, and so far, Nicolette has not disappointed. I fe I feel just always kind of a steady player, not the you know not the flashiest, not the craziest, but steady, and just kind of helps fit what BTK needs. I think at this point. And when you take a look at the Team 5 participation, it still definitely paints the story of the trio mid, right? A lot of the uh, impact, a lot of the pressure comes from Moba Zane, from Nicolette, from Cold World. This time around, Nicolette uh, only 31%, but Cold World and Moba Zane both at 70% here. Pretty much just, you know, having majority of the kills or majority of the supports, like it definitely paints the story. The damage taken, Milo here once again, being that big body bag in the big front body. physique. How'd you like that match, huh? I don't know why you guys said big body and then sent it to me. That's kind of messed up. But I'll tell you what, <laughs> very exciting matchups. I really thought I really thought that last game, Bloodhounds was going to be able to take it around and uh, turn it around and take it straight to him. But then Mobazin came out of there and just collapsed mm. all of their dreams. Dreams to nightmare, <laughs> straight into it. No, no tucking them in, nothing. It was, that was bad, man. That was a really good game. It was a really good move, but man, that was, that was tough. That was tough. What do you guys think though? What do you think Bloodhounds could have done to really avoid that? Other than, you know, not sending a whole team one after another to, to Zane. I think uh, we talked about some of the, you know, spice in the drafts, but also there was just, I think there's, they just need some more time, man. I think there, they, you know, I think there's just some skill differences. I think in the off lanes, I think Bloodhounds mm. have consistently made it to top eight, which does say something for them as a team. But uh, when it comes to playoffs, when it comes to, you know, being the best of the best, there are definitely still some micros to fix on. There's just some overall things to work on for Bloodhounds right now. And, you know, I, I, I don't want to take it away from Bloodhounds because I, I still feel like they played a great game, especially with the new lineup coming through. BTK, they did not change their lineup. One of the three teams that did not change. Um, and, you know, it, it definitely shows that they have the synergy and they have the ability to, you know, even uh, off draft a few different picks, right? The support or the picks or the front backs or the, even the assassins. Like they're able to do so much with their drafts here 
but for the side of bloodhounds you know this is a complete new lineup we haven't seen these guys kind of play with each other until the big stage i still think they did good you know going back to trex what he said some of the off lanes i do think you know we we, we saw the pickoffs on the one versus one in the gold and then we also saw the xp i think if they were able to kind of uh work on that and and, and maybe get their trio mid a little bit more synergized they could definitely go quite far in the lower brackets so before i get into my next question i do think we finally got word on who the mvp is trex um i i think mobile zane steals it with the savage at the end there yeah, yeah. i mean <laughs> game game one and two kind of up in the air mobile zane didn't have anything crazy but definitely steals it we're looking at the first game here or maybe this is game mm. number two it was with the uh it was up yeah I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, There's I'm blanking two. out. Either game way, it was game number two up against the Nolan, and then this is the final game. I'm waiting for that Savage moment, UA. Give me it. Where is it at? <laughs> oh, it's coming, right? Oh, I mean, I don't even know if it has... I, I, I feel like... Oh, wait, no, it was after this, right here. Right here. Mm. The damage mm. just immediately deleting two players, moves on a stoner, and at that point, he's literally 1v3. Then Cold World comes in, and he knows, he's like, okay, now I can dive. I got a little bit of heal here. I can go all in. <laughs> yeah, and he's able to pick up that Savage, no problem, gets out alive, Cold World with the sustain. That's why both of them were 70% kill participation, because they just work so well together. Mm. So, I, I gotta know guys, after the fact, we've got to see how some of these teams play out. Stoner, Ooga Booga, who are you guys feeling? <laughs> um, UA. What are you, what are you... <laughs> um, you know... I haven't been able to see Stoner perform in Bloodhounds. And um, unfortunately, they did have to face a very, very strong team. Um, it's a little bit hard for me to decide here because quite honestly, I just haven't been able to see them perform. I think Ooga Booga does provide that out of a box strategy, but I can't tell you that the out of the box strategy is what we need for them to be able to go far. Because Bloodhounds, they haven't been able to go far in playoffs. They've always done quite well in the regular seasons, but they, when it comes down to matches that do mean something, it, they just, we haven't seen a great performance from them. Now, this time around things may be different when it comes down to the lower brackets i can see some fire coming out from the side of bloodhounds but when it comes down to that direct pick trex i am not sure here i i agree i agree with you way <laughs> <laughs> all right well without further ado i think i got somebody on the uh, other line waiting for me so let's not keep them waiting you and hey, me man up? we're back at it here we go again. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Great games, man. Uh, I got some questions for you, though. You know how this goes. So you guys came out of a loss uh, uh, against Night Horde. You know, a little bit, a little bit of uh, mixed emotions coming from that, but really came strong into this matchup against Bloodhounds. Were there any mental adjustments that you guys felt like you had to make coming into the playoffs? Well, to be honest, I think everyone was feeling a little bit lazy that match versus Nighthorde because it didn't really change too much for us whether we won or lost. So mentally, we probably weren't mm. taking it as seriously as we should have. Um, but now that we're into the playoffs, you know, there's no reason to not be giving every single opportunity you have to do your best. And that's exactly what we're doing. Mm. Well said, well said. So... Each game that you guys were going into against the Bloodhounds, they did appear to be coming off a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better. And in that third game, it almost looked like they had the opportunity to actually take control until, man, that alpha came out of nowhere and just... So how, how did that make you feel when you got that, man? That savage. Uh, it felt good. I just kept focusing on the game because, I mean... I, it, it didn't mean too much for, to me, to be honest. Mm. Honestly, man, I, I really expected to see your little camera down there. I expected to see you doing like a little dance and, you know, like I was, you kind of you broke my heart a little bit. I'm not going to lie. But uh, what what do you guys have your eyes set on now that you've made it through the first round of the playoffs? Uh, just keep practicing, keep scrimmaging, and hopefully make it all the way to the finals and we'll see what happens there. Okay, now is there anything that you can, uh, on, on the way out of this, is there any expectations that we can we can set for you guys? Uh, I think everyone's expectations are already pretty high of us, and I'm happy for that. You know, I think everybody should hold, 
PTK to the highest standard and thank you to everybody who's expecting the best for us. That's what we're trying to give you. Mm, well said. Well, I'm not going to hold you up. I know you got a little uh, first first round of the playoff celebration to go do. You didn't get your dance in during the last match, so I'm sure you're going to go get it now. So thank you so much for uh, for coming out and talking to me, brother. All right. Thank you. Have a good day. <laughs> great interview loved brother great interview loved his response honestly i love the uh, i love the humbleness coming from him he performed really well and especially in that third game and um you know I i'm i'm glad to see him holding himself in a manner that he's just so ready and so primed up to uh not only attack the the next week of playoffs i think but he seems like he's really really got his eyes set on something further I think I think he feels com I think they feel comfortable. And I think PTK, no matter who the roster is, no matter who's on it, what happens, they always have the same goal. And I think all the teams have a goal, you know, for grand finals. At least most of them at least have a goal for grand finals. Um, but yeah, he, I think uh, Zane's definitely got a little better at interviews. I could say that. <laughs> it's definitely a bit, bit more humble. Just a bit more. Thank you guys for the support. We're gonna try to ho live up to those expectations. You know, very very well spoken. Yeah, very, very humble interview there. You know, I kind of wish we had a little bit more spice uh, to that, but mm. definitely uh, very, very good nonetheless. I mean, he played a great game and, you know, you, you kind of talked about, you mentioned the savage, like, where's the little dance? I think maybe he just has too many of those in that book. There's no excitement. Mm. He just, you know, he's here for business, right? Is the job finished? Job not so, done. So, somebody Another might clip this. Somebody might clip this, but are you saying that Moba Zane is too good for celebration? Wow. I mean, oh, that's a bold no, stance. I, he's, you know, the job's not finished. I think the job's, the job's not, not finished done. for Moba yeah. Zane. It's literally just first round. One, round. Bro. And they have so many more matches that they need to play in order to get to where they need or want to be. And it's a long process. There's no celebration when it comes down to like first round playoffs. Like these teams have so much goals into that late game that like, hey, it's a good win, guys. Let's move on to the next one. Let's start preparing. Let's start practicing. You know, he's just, he was already talking about, hey, let's go back into scrims. Let's go back into practicing. We were a little bit lazy, but we have now suited up and we have that same goal of wanting to win. So definitely a great interview. And just like what Trek said, like he's gotten so humble and so nice with it. Like it's, it's very, it's a pleasure to uh, watch and be here for it. Mm -hmm. Well, much love to the players and much love to the casters, but without a further ado, I do think it's time to send you guys on break. Don't enjoy it too much. Have you heard the rumors? About what? <gasps> the rumors from the board. The demon. demon. He's coming. What happened? They're all dead! Oh no, no! It's him! He's coming! He's coming! <laughs> Impossible! Get him out of here! He's coming! He's coming for us! <laughs>
tale ended with the poisoned apple, and my tale began. Princess in a tower is just a bird in a cage. Before your queen. It won't take long, I promise. Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back. I hope you guys are ready and primed up for this next match. Wait, hold on one second, one second. Hello? Okay, so, it's Moontown, sorry. Okay, huh, all right. They said I have to interview myself and I really don't know what that means. So, um, let's see what that's about. Yo. <laughs> oh, look at that boy. That man is gorgeous. What's up, uh, Zeke? Hey, what's up, Naisu? If, for those of you guys who don't know, he's Naisu, I'm Zeke, and I did in fact shave before this interview so I wouldn't forget which one of these people I'm supposed to be. So <laughs> I am sad about the beard, man. I am a little disappointed, but it's also got the stash. So my thing is, is right, like if I'm looking at you in person, like how am I not supposed to get confused about which one of us is which one of us? Because if I came into this interview saying like, hey, what's up? I'm nice to you, then I would have been the bad guy, right? Like, Dude, that's a good up? question. <laughs> uh, so, I don't know. You know, maybe, hey, if I ever get to come back to the US, we'll find out. I don't know what that means. That's suspicious. That's suspicious. You guys might have to help me out on that one. So. <laughs> People think for some reason that you and I look alike. So maybe we got to see how how much alike are we. So uh, I got I got a little game for you. I just got a couple basic questions for you, and then I'm, I'm gonna count okay. us down, and then we're gonna see what our answers are, and we're gonna see you know are we as similar as everybody thinks we are. So I got it. First question: What's your number one favorite movie? Okay, ready? Three, two, one. Rush Hour. Rush Hour. That I hope was, we're compensating I mean, for like the were, latency that, here. I feel like I feel like maybe you just copied me, man. That's kind of that. Is he? Is, is this guy pretending? Wow. Okay. Okay. You know, I'll hear you out. I'll hear you out. Okay. Ready? Second favorite movie. Okay. Second favorite movie. Ready? Three. Oh, okay. Two. One. Rush Hour Two. Rush Hour Two. Has to be, man. Uh, Has to be. Oh. 
Oh man! So you gotta take your sunglasses no off way. too, buddy. You gotta take them off. Oh. Oh man! Look at that! Look at that! Oh, the blue man, eyes, look at blue man. shirt. Blue you eyes. look good. Oh, sparkle <laughs> like a like I'm a legend skin, you know? Uh, okay, Love okay, it. okay. So next question, next next question. This one should be no way we guess the right the same thing, right? Um, what's your favorite snack? Me. Favorite snack, okay? Ooh, right. Ready? Wait, from where? Three. Is there a is there a, is there a from um, where? Anywhere in the world, anywhere in the world. I don't know about you, but I've been around the world, you know? Okay. Traveler. Okay, I got so, you. All right. Uh, all right, ready? Favorite snack. Three, two, one. Dried mangoes. Dried mangoes. Oh, Dude, ain't no way. There's some... Ain't no, this has got to be scripted. <laughs> no, ain't no way. Are you... There's there's a certain get... brand, though. There's a certain brand. Certain brand. You're right, you're right. There is a certain brand. Ready? All right. Let me Three. count you in. Let me count you in. Okay. Let me count you okay, in, okay. G. Okay. Three, two, one. Sabu. Sabu. Oh, ain't no way. Ain't no way. He's copying. Somebody come arrest this man because he is too good looking and he's got too good a taste. I don't, I'm <laughs> uncomfortable. I'm uncomfortable. All right. Man, you are killing me. You are killing me. Okay. Last one. Last, last hard question. Okay. Favorite hero. Favorite Mobile Legends hero. Okay, ready? A lot of people are this is this is easy. This is easy. Three, two, one, Gord. Gord. Ah! <laughs> He's a criminal. He's a criminal. Ain't no way. Ain't no way. All right, all right. Saw the so, Gord the last game, by the way. Ah uh, man, yeah. Yeah. Pop down. Mocha did go into it with uh with that Gord looking strong, especially in that early game. So I gotta know, with you picking Gord as well, why? What about Gord is for you? Um there's two reasons. One, in the lore, I don't know how much you know about the lore, but he's actually a teacher, he's a professor. That was my profession before mm -hmm. I was a caster. Um, and number two, he basically Kamehamehas. He gushes mm -hmm. all over the place. Yep, that's that's about nice. it. Hmm. For me, I was going to say my reason that I like Gord so much is because pretty colors. It's, That's right. It's that way. It's that. All right. So it is. I think I think I got one more question for you. You know, uh, at this point, I think it's safe to say maybe, maybe we're related. You know, maybe we've got the same mom and dad. You know, who really knows with all of these similarities? I mean, only only a DNA test could tell for sure. So how and when did you start mobile legends oh when the game first came out man i was still in the philippines so as soon as it released i was on it mm. Mm. so for me uh i i used to also be in the philippines i used to uh train filipino marines out there and it was actually uh nice when i when i actually spent some time at a family reunion he was like hey man start the game and i was like no sir can't afford that and he was like, no, bro, you don't understand. It's free. Uh, it's just the skins that get you, but it's free. So I started playing, but by that time it was already like season six. So yeah, it's but, been uh, a minute, but that's that's real, by the way. He was out here in the Philippines, just for you guys from the Philippines, probably wondering, he was out here. Yeah, co como se cap, foggies. Yeah, I love you guys. Maruquita. Don't think I don't know. I know what that's about. I know what that's about. <laughs> But uh, I'm not going to hold you up. I know it's got to be nice and bright and early there. So I know you've got a whole world to catch up to. So uh, I appreciate yeah. you for coming out, brother. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you, man. Yeah, I appreciate it. And right. uh, enjoy the next matchup. It's going to be awesome. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. See you, buddy. <laughs> oh, man. I love that guy. He is, he is gorgeous. <laughs> Just want to say that. Gorgeous. Anybody who says otherwise, you don't know what beauty looks like. <laughs> I definitely got to agree. You know, I was thinking about it and I was looking at you both and I was trying to decide on, you know, who's the elite skin and who's the collector skin. Mm. Um, personally, you know, I, I'm sorry, Zeke, but I think Naisu is definitely the collector skin. Um, but still, the, the similarities are very uncanny. It's, 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 it was a little strange. <laughs> no, I mean, it was a it was a great interview. You guys, it was almost like 
You know, you guys are telepathically reading each other mm. off Twins. of this. Like, I, you know, I was almost confused until you guys took your glass off. I'm like, aha. Oh, mm. I actually, yeah, I didn't know who was who when we came on. Like, who mm. was interviewing? <laughs> I thought Nice was actually interviewing you for a second. Yeah, I like Amazing. I said, man. If I hadn't shaved before uh, before this casting today, I might have confused myself with him. Mm. I'd have been like, "Hey yeah. guys, I'm Nice Uzi. How you how you doing? You know, like." <laughs> but luckily, I, I was able to mentally prepare for that and you know save us that uh, awkward environment. Yeah, I appreciate that. <laughs> so, was, that. I'm glad you did. We needed that. Without that, it would have been would have been tough. The fans, every all of NACT probably would have broken. Mm, yeah, probably. Definitely would have been confused there. It was a great interview nonetheless. And we got to see Naisu coming through, gracing us with his presence. Of course, another wonderful uh, interview. I, You know, I, Zeke, I really like that little game that you guys played. You know, when when do we get to have a little game like that for a little opening, we don't. huh? We oh. don't. It's not for you. Well. <laughs> <laughs> but what it is for right. you is I do want to start looking at some of this upcoming matchup. Trex? Upcoming matchup. I personally, I think it's going to be the meat and potatoes of today. Ooh. You know, it is going to be the beef and potatoes. This is what we, this is what I'm excited for personally. It's DA up against Night Horde. Now, DA did not finish as high as everyone thought they were going to be. You know, I think it was mm. like a number five finish, yeah. something like that. But there's been a couple roster changes. We got our, our Baji on the track. Um... And I think there's some things to talk about for sure about this matchup. I don't think it's just going to be an easy, an easy sweep or anything like that for Night Horde. Mm. Yeah, no, I mean, we we haven't really seen too many roster changes that have led them to success. And if the story continues, it might just be the same thing here. But Devious Activities, the roster change that they have, it's Joey Baj coming in. The Baj boy coming through on the wrong position. T back into his, you know, dominating environment. The one versus one on the far end side. You know, that might paint a different picture going up against the dark, the dark dragons here. Almost like, you know, the like like these guys have been able to win matches against some of the strongest teams. They took down BTK the last day and now. They're coming in for devious activities like BTK round two, Z. <laughs> mm, yeah, well said. But before UA gets too far into it, Trex, can you take us through the DA roster? Ooh, gladly. Mm. Gladly, I will. It's going to be Melon in the gold lane, permanently off the bench now. And our boy Joy Baj joining the roster with the Yato T combo as well. Yato in the mid, Kush in the jungle, and T moving back to his homeland, the EXP lane. This is definitely a roster that for me, yes, sometimes we're hesitant about roster changes, but this is one that just feels right to me. You know, we <laughs> saw Baj, Yato, and T on BTK back in spring season. Gold gold medalist for NACT with an insane win against Outplay and now these three are back on a team together. It's freaking Christmas for the playoffs right now. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's definitely going to be a good match between both of these teams. I think Zeke might be going into the Night Horde. Yeah, you, you got it. Let's see that, uh, oh. let's see that lineup. <laughs> We're passing it right back. Uh, we have R going to be on the gold lane. Mamoy, of course, this guy, we've seen him pretty much perform on any of those set tanks. Definitely uh, a spotlight on him. Sayori at the mid. Oh my foe in the jungle position. And Zero coming out with a special appearance. I know we had some names for the Night Horde. I think we came together and said Night Horde Zero might be the. Uh, new lineup uh, coming through, but definitely some interesting changes for both teams, right? Zero coming in this time around. T going back into the XP position. It's gonna be T versus Zero in that you know sense. It, it's it's gonna be a tough match for both of these teams to be able to try to get on to the next game. So can without I saying, can I, can you guys I say something real quick? What's up? Go I, ahead. I guess I suppose. Oh, my foe and Stoner look so alike with their big arms that that's where I made the mistake of I thought Stoner played last week, but it was the interview with Oh, my foe. <laughs> They're both big body boy. Anyways, back to you, Zeke. 
Oh, I, I think that that goes right along with saying that maybe we, as like a caster's desk, need to start working out more so that way we can stand out as well. Because if all of the <laughs> players are like looking this strong, I think maybe maybe we got to reallocate some of our time. But I want to know how do you think some of these players match up? Um, I think the big matchup for me is definitely T and Zero. Um, I think that's going to be the kind of make it or break it for Night Horde here. Um, they bring on Zero. Zero's definitely a veteran player. We all know him from Team Gosu, um, but he has kind of fallen short a few times. Whether you want to blame him or blame the team around him, whatever, Zero has fallen a little short. One of the things he's most famous for, I think, is more of like assassin type picks, high mechanic type picks. We've seen him on a few different roles, though, recently recently on past teams. I'm just wondering, is he going to be able to keep up with T? Is T going to be in his prime in the EXP lane like he used to be? Um, because you could debate T as a top EXP laner. Yes, he hasn't played it recently, but still, you know, is if he gets the better of zero in these upcoming matches, it could definitely spell victory for DA. I think that's my major point here. Yeah, I, I definitely would agree with Trex. Uh, another matchup that I do want to bring up is going to be the matchup between Momoi and Joy Bosch. And we haven't been able to see Joy Bosch kind of come through in NACT this time around, but he's always been that strong tank, especially with, you know, the performance that he had in the last NACT. And this time around against Momoi, which also is the first time that we've ever seen before. And he's been having extremely strong performances in the Rome position. Now face against Bosch, that is going to be a hurdle that Night Horde needs to get over in order for them to win. And I definitely think they have the opportunity to. But Baj, man, that guy is a contender. He's won championships before. Also import player. Like, that guy can definitely do it all. So with that being said, who's winning? Let's get into predictions. I think this was a toss-up between between half and half with the casters. Personally, like I said, I gotta go for DA. I think the major win thing, the major win con for them right now is gonna be T versus Zero in the AXP. Um, and I think Baj, I mean, I think he's been playing. I think he's been playing competitively, and I think he's gonna be ready for this matchup, synergy, everything. I think DA's got this game in the bag. Mm, I, you know, I, I would also have to agree. I think DA is quite strong and well-rounded, and a lot of the rosters did come from the championship winning team of the last uh, NACT. I think Night Horde is a great team. I think they're going to put up a great fight here, maybe go into the first best of five in, uh, you know, the playoffs. But I also do think DA has so much experience that they're trying to show off. So for me, I think DA looks good, but that's something that, again, for me personally, I've thought from the very beginning of the regular season, DA was a team that everybody expected to come in based off of their uh, actual lineup. And we expected them to be like a top three, you know, contender. And with that being said, I said it before, my votes have to go towards consistency and Night Horde mm -hmm. has been doing that. So with that being said, let's get into the draft. I like it. A beautiful toss and a beautiful point from Zeke there. You know, I think Night Horde has been super consistent. And I think this game is high chance we go all five, right? One thing I do think with DA is t players like Yato, T, Baj, even Kush. Um, we know their peak. We know how well they can play UA. But we also know that sometimes they have some down days. We've seen Yato make some foul plays back when he was on BTK. You know, the legendary Katito, the Katito whiff that, that, that we all know about, you know? We, we've seen them make the mistakes. T, overextending. Baj, you know, overextending. We know that when they make these mistakes, they can be the downfall of their team. But I think today, DA should be able to show up. Um, if they make any of those mistakes, though, I think the consistency of Night Horde can definitely get them the win here. Um, and that's what Night Horde is going to have to do. They're going to just have to keep it steady, play it clean. And I think that is their win con. It's going to be pretty much who brought their A game today, who is going to make less mistakes. And, you know, both teams have brought in this, like, raw element of, you know, surprise, right? Zero has come through, Baj coming back from the dead. And, you know, Melon now stepping up as the main gold lane for the side of DA. So both teams bringing in quite 
the new roster coming through. It's, it's, it's going to be a you know deciding factor to see which one actually comes out ahead. It could be in terms of their draft. It could be the rotations. But, you know, forgetting for all that said, the drafts have been on the board. The bands coming through. Xborg, Angela, and CC gets taken out by the side of Night Horde. Barat and Masha, Matilda gets denied from the side of DA. And Ruby first pick. Zero is swapped up into that pick, but I don't think it's a guaranteed EXP lane pick. Definitely mm -hmm. can be flexed around. Um, I'm kind of surprised Ruby getting proud so hard after some of the nerfs on her. For a few days, we sometimes didn't even see her get picked up, but there are still a few teams that take her as, you know, a very strong pick. And I think one of the things that she's good with too is because of the flexibility, she's just a good blue side like first pick right you're not revealing mm. too much you leave yourself plenty of counterplay and she's just a solid hero overall that gives you a little damage gives you sustainability and gives you crowd control wow and a very early minotaur being picked up here i think minotaur is a great hero okay mm. but is it first pick viable right there's there, there's still a lot that's on the board the novaria the Faramis, the carry the claude Right. So, you know, with Matilda and Masha being taken off the board along with Angela, yes, I think Minotaur can provide a lot of the support, a lot of the front line. And we've seen Minotaur do quite well already today. But pairing it up with Fredrin on the very first phase might just warrant a carry from the side of Nighthorde to completely counter the front line pressure that DA has. But you could also think that, you know, Gold Lane. I think it's kind of become this game of like rock, paper, scissors, you know, <laughs> where like, like now that Harith is so viable, now that Roger, now that there's so many different heroes, like gold lane is really kind of widened out where it can be dangerous to like first pick your gold lane off rip. And I think, you know, Melon has showed that he feels pretty confident on a lot of different picks. So I think they felt good about it. They're even going to push back that gold lane. I think after seeing the Beatrix pick, it's like, Oh yeah, this isn't anything that's too threatening overall. Um, yes, the Beatrix is good, but it's not like game breaking. Um, so they're not even gonna put a gold lane even on their on their first phase at all. They're gonna put Yato on the Faramis, kind of give themselves their core immediately. And now we're gonna round out later on in the draft tour as we look at Night Horde. They've got a little damage locked in. They have some flexibility with the Ruby. Um, DA showing all their cards, very transparent. Night Horde still has some room to play. Play. Yeah, and the interesting thing here is that there's no marksman being banned out by both of these teams. So DA pretty much for Melon, he can pick anything that he wants when it comes down to like things like Arithal, Brody, uh, Claude, Carry. He has so many options. Even the Roger has come mm. back into play. So, you know, the side of DA, they're not really scared. Now, there is quite a bit of XP's already been taken out. Another one gets taken out, the Arlocks from the side of Night Horde. It is going to, you know, pressure T's hero pool because quite honestly, Night Horde, they don't have to necessarily look for another XP. They have the Ruby available, which is a very strong pick, right? They could just go for a roam and, you know, have the ability to kind of just, you know, have the Ruby on the XP. There's no pressure on picking it. And they do end up banning the Yuzon, the Nolan, and also the Fanny gets taken out by the side of DA. All right, so like you said, Harnessing, I mean, focusing hard on the T here. And I think, you know, this is our first time T now jumping in the XP lane for the first time this whole season. And we're already seeing some of the respect. And these are picks that T's been known for. The Yu Zong, even when it wasn't super meta, T's a monster on it. He's dangerous on it. Um, and I think with Zero also showing face first time on this team, they want to make sure Zero feels comfortable, right? And I think it's going to be very important to kind of, you know, we're introducing Zero into the playoffs, first time on NACT, you know, top eight. And he needs he needs to feel good about going up against T here. So I think it's a well strat. I think they are probably, it's okay. We're not going to focus too hard into gold. Let Melon get what he wants. I feel confident against it. You have a lot of utility from the Beatrix. We don't see it very often, but I definitely don't think it's unviable. I think there's lots of possibilities for it. It has the dash. It has so many different routes to go and build. Um, definitely just kind of like the Swiss army knife of the gold lane. And you know, now that Night Horde is looking for a jungle and a possible XP roam, right? Foe, you know, he, he could go for a utility style, go for the Akai to disrupt 
There's also, you know, the Martis. And now Momoi has picked up this Dyroth. This is what Zero has been known for throughout the days of his time on the XP. It's always been about the Dyroth. And I think it was so smart for Night Horde to wait until the last moment to give Zero his, you know, strongest hero, something that he's comfortable, you know, performing at a high level with. But DA has the last pick. They do see the Dyroth. What is T gonna do in order to counter uh, this pick coming out from Night Horde? I mean, he could he could go for something like the Lapu here if he wants. It's a it's a nice thing to jump on to R, get onto the backside. It can also kind of has a little bit of sustainability. Has dash, has some answers. Um, Definitely something he doesn't want to go for something, you know, too too bulky. Goes for the Terizla. Oh. Also another nice back lane diver can poke a little bit. Um, we don't see the Dyroth like super often in the EXP, so it's kind of, you know, how does the matchup exactly work out? I'm excited that you brought up some of the little background lore, background story, because <laughs> with this being like the comfort pick of Zero, I think it's a great entrance to him into these playoffs, right? Will comfort mm -hmm. be his answer? Is this something that if he does tremendous on it, will we start seeing it get banned against Night Horde? You know, there's a lot of questions for me that I can't wait to be answered. Yeah, and you know, talking about the side of DA, they have so much front line to be able to stop, you know, from the side of Night Horde to be able to collapse, right? Again, the side of Night Horde, it almost feels like they don't have that much CC, especially compared to, you know, a Fredrin, a Minnow, and a Terizla, yeah. right? They have the Vexana, they have the Ruby and Amartis for a little bit of anti-engaged CC, but is that going to be enough? Only time will tell. This is the last series of the night, a best of five between Devious Activities and the Night Horde. We're on match number one right now. Let's jump into it. Yeah, so, I mean, you brought up a great point in our draft here. How is Zero going to be able to face up against T in the XP lane, right? Even if you took a look at that matchup, Teresa is going to have a lot of bully, but the trade already happening at mid side. Not sure if it's going to actually connect here. And yes, Night Horde should be able to get away, no problem. Take a look at that audience prediction right now. This is the most Ooh. down the middle I think we've seen in a very long time. If you guys haven't, make sure you cast your vote in the chat. It will be updated as we go through these games. DA leading 52% to 48, but still, mm -hmm. that is neck and neck for these teams now. We already seen heavy aggression on the mid side. Joy Baj and Yato kind of pushing in, pushing Night Horde to their limits. But Night Horde able to keep up with them. Like, listen, if that's the kind of road you want to take, if that's you want to go for blow for blow, we are definitely ready for that. Ooh, and I do want to talk about something that's quite interesting. Fredrin with a support emblem. I've seen this in some of the Asia servers already. Um, you know, they, they like to use the support emblems. It brings a lot more utility, like the movement speed, the hybrid penetration, along with a little bit of the cooldown. So it's definitely quite interesting because traditionally a lot of the Fredrin liked to use tank, but it's a complete different style. It's almost like it's an assassin coming through from Kush. He has a high, uh, you know, high cooldowns available. So it's definitely something that we have to watch out for. But now Kush, he's not going to have that much survivability. Ooh. A lot of damage on a zero there. Yato able to pick up the kill. First blood on the new XP laner of Night Horde. Yeah, and you know, ganking a Dyroth, that's kind of the story that's going to be painted quite often. He doesn't really have too much uh, to be able to jump away here, but Fo looking to potentially go for the steal. I do think he's going to look to disengage here, though. Yeah, Baj able to hold the front side as well. And with Turtle down, Devious Activity going to move on to this purple wow. buff. Nice penalty zone. Watch out for the Noen's Fury. Oh, my foe able to dodge it, but still falls. T picking up the kill. Sayori wants to steal the purple, but unable to do it. It's going to fall into the hands of Kush there. And DA taking a nice lead in the beginning. Yeah, great opening coming out from the side of DA already. Two kills in their hands along with the neutral objective. And once again, you know, the top side, Zero here is... He, you know, against a Terizla, I do think it's a very hard matchup. You, you talk about those two characters naturally. Terizla has the lane clear, has the damage reduction, and has a frontline CC that Night Horde has to get across. But Dyroth, you know, typically it takes some time to snowball. He wants to be able to dominate his lane early, have the kill pressure, being able to stand against anyone one versus one. And if 
you know, Zero is able to get up to that point where he can, you know, kill the Terizla or anyone that Devious has to send up there in a one versus one situation is going to be trouble for Devious activities. But on the other hand, if Zero gets constantly picked off, if he's not able to win the one versus one, it, Night Horde is going to crumble due to a top side that is not going to be able to make too much impact. Most definitely, and DA just playing clean right now. They're not playing like super aggressive, at least not on the opposite side of the river, but they are ganking lanes quickly, and down goes Zero once again. And even though T isn't soloing it, DA knows we take down a lane, we're, it's going to be a problem. We give T a good game, it's going to be a problem, and now the next attack falls. Oh my foe falls along with it. That's two kills a piece onto Oh My Foe and Zero. DA going to take another purple buff here. It is a 2k lead. A lot of resources have been used in those two skirmishes, right? The Bonk has been coming through, uh, the ultimate coming out from Terizla along with the Minone's Fury. A lot of resources have been used that aren't going to particularly be available in the next objective. But with already a 2k gold lead, it seems like the side of Devious Activities, they're holding it down quite well in the river. Momoi, I mean, not Momoi, but Joy Bosch with this Minotaur, very, very hard to penetrate and even Kush on this Fredrin, it's going to be very, very hard for the side of Night Horde to be able to get any advantages here. Oh man, Baj is just everywhere right now, Ooh. and Yatos always has his back. Kush able to dive onto the tower, pick up the kill with the appraisers. Wrath R comes in with the Nibiru's passion, but still not enough damage quite yet. Nice eternal guardian does fall, but in comes T with the penalty zone into the backside. Momo takes a lot of damage, forced to use the flicker just to get to safety. Snipe shot comes out, connects onto Baj, but still unable to get the kill. Do you see how fast Kush kind of dove underneath that tower, got his hits in, even even landed the ultimate, and then dove right back, right? The cooldown is quite high with the support emblem, but on the other hand, Night Horde able to get their first tower. This is good news for the side of Night Horde. This is kind of the thing where, you know, if a team is losing, can they get that advantage on the opposite side of map? And Zero, even down Zero 2, is able to do so. Ooh, Minoan's Fury plus the Shadow Stampede. And two, ma two kills go down. Melon gets them both right in the hands you want to put it. And yes, you're right. You know, DA does the full grab on to the bot side. T jumps hmm. in as well. They do sacrifice the tower, but I still think there is some value. It's good, though, that Zero didn't, like, follow along. Long. He's like, no, I'm going to hang out up here. I'm already behind. Let me try to get something for my team. And there is about a 1k gold lead for the mage, the jungle, Ooh. and the marksman. But before that... Oh, I'm offended. Yato gets caught off, is taken out. A kill does get put on the board for Night Horde finally at six minutes in. Now back to what you were saying, Yue. Yeah, and I think one of the things that's quite interesting that I still have to point out is the support emblem that's on the Fredrin. The um, the movement speed, now that he has built up his first item, which is going to be a brute force, it changes things up for Kush. It's not really that, like, frontline sustain anymore. It's more about just coming in and out very quickly, spamming his spells with an extremely low cooldown. Right, and he's able to get uh, pretty much his ultimate up almost every single team fight, and they're just really taking advantage of that situation right now. Oh man, look at the gank! Look at the attack! Zero, no way out of mm. that one. Da able to get the kill. Kush takes a turtle. They're everywhere, doing everything all at once. Yeah, and it's gonna smell a little bit of trouble. The retribution does come through. Kush, you know, he's just a really fast boy right now, and he's looking to go for a little bit more at mid. Melon cutting lane, look for the shots onto all my foe. Can he get the kill? Yes, with the BMI out into safety. DA then gonna switch lanes. They take the tier three in the mid side. R Momoi there to try to defend. Melon takes a couple shots to the face. Able to BMI away safely. Yato there to help out just in case. But D -E I mean, DA, devious activity, just doing a wonderful job now. They've hit their power spike. They're transitioning their nine kills into being able to take towers, and they're feeling good about it. Now, although there's about a 2k gap between the XP and the jungler from Night Horde and Devious Activities, the gold lane is still doing quite well. R is not that far behind. He has a, quite a high damage, so there's still opportunity there. Ooh, ooh big I'm offended on a three under the tower, but the Minoan's Fury lands on a three more. 
More damage coming out. The viewers passing able to lock on to zero, but zero goes down. T takes the shots to the face and does not fall. Yato, Melon picking up a kill. Devious activity. Find three members without losing a single one. And the amount of damage and ultimate that the Netherrealm took underneath Yato's control was so insane there, right? They're able to, you know, soak up the damage, the displacement from the uh, the I'm offended. They're also able to just defend and look at that bomb. Oh my here. god, that was set that had, that had to be like 70% healthy <laughs> way. <laughs> and you know, Devious now they're just playing kind of like the bully bots 13 and 1, and they're able to just pick apart Night Horde here. Ooh, Momoi does get the I'm offended on. Woo! Followed up by the Bombard. Minato taking out three members off the field for DA. And Kush is out of town along with Melon. Nighthorde find a moment to come back. Yeah, and this is the mashed potatoes and gravy mash that you're talking about. The spice and the salt coming through the flavor, right? Nighthorde is able to pick off two of the members of the side of Devious Activities. They, a kind of a miss dive. That you know we don't see that often yet. But the side of Night Horde, they're able to find the small opening, able to get the punish that they're looking for, and that's huge, right? They're able to cut the gold lead. It was 6k. Now it's a little bit down, and you can look at the cold ultra right here, just soaking up all the damage into the attack, the reinforcements, the rinse and repeat reward from devious activities, and then the punish here. Oh, such a punish indeed. That was a monstrous, I'm offended. Night Horde still mm -hmm. showing. They have some capabilities, but here's a good thing about Divas Activity. They don't let that slow them down at all. They immediately transition, okay? We're still going for Lord. We still have a 6,000 gold lead. We still got this. They just have to be mm -hmm. careful how they approach it because Night Horde will strike at any moment. Yeah, but with that small mistake, it gives Night Horde a little bit of hope. It does look like we have a small pause on the screen, but giving hopes is a very dangerous situation for teams that have nothing to lose, Trex. And they're able to give the side of Night Horde from a 1 and 13 lead into a few kills going into their favor, able to defend. I'm offended, has so much impact, mm. you know, throughout every single fight. It shines a light at the end of the dark, uh, at the end of the dark tunnel for the side of uh, Night Horde to be able to, you know, find the hope that they need. And now it gives them opportunity. They're like, hey, it seems like we have damage from the Beatrix. The displacements from the Ruby should be able to work quite well. We do have to worry about the Nether Realm, but it's a most definite possible situation that they could get some winning team fights, winning skirmishes here and there. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of combo potential from the side of Night Horde. The type of potential that even when you're down 5,000 gold, one play yep. could still turn around a game. You can still take fights. And Night Horde is not the team to just, you know, back off and turtle up. They know that it's like, okay, even if we're a little behind, we know how to approach a fight and maybe still come out on top. Um, so it's, DA has to be careful for that, you know? They're, they're, they mm -hmm. did just get that lore. They're going to be pushing in soon. But um, if they make a mistake, especially coming into the bottleneck of the base, um, and they get cut off, two or three members, something like that happens again, um, it could be a major problem. Yeah, and, you know, there is still a gold gap, right? We kind of talked about it in the game. The XP, I believe, is about a 2K difference. Same thing with the jungle situation. But... R has been holding up quite well against Mel, yeah. and I still think there's a small gold gap, but the damage is showing already. The the BOD paired up with the Malefic Roar. He has the ability, and another I'm offended here. Ooh, Eternal Guardian does come out. Nether Realm able to save the day for the side of DA. They do bait out a couple though. ultimates for ultimates. Moy doesn't have one. R doesn't have one. Sayori also doesn't have an ultimate on the board. A lot more green dots on the side of Devious Activity. They're waiting for the engage. Mm. Lord just slowly creeping. They weren't able to sync that one up. He's going to be a little bit delayed to the party here. Yeah, and, you know, the Flicker Terizla ultimate is still available if they want to use that penalty zone. The top side is getting pushed in, and they're most definitely looking oh, to siege here. Oh, with the Flicker in. Drops an Owens Fury, catches two. Momoi in a little bit of trouble. T may be way too deep. Force to use the Flicker just to get away here. R brings out the Nubir's oh. Passion. I'm offended, connects, but the alts don't connect themselves. R finally taken out. Sayori brought down to about half health. Oh, my foe, gonna jump in. Looking for the decimation, but unable to connect onto anyone and is taken out by Melon. Moy still holding down the base. Devious Activity looking for another run at this push. More minions coming down the mid side. Melon going to start clearing waves as the rest of his team hold down the top. They all connect now onto the middle inhibitor, and they're going to shred it down quickly. 
Night Horde now still trying to defend, but Devious Activity want to try to end. Momoi looking for a friend, looking for some help, but they locked onto the base, and that will be it at 11 and a half minutes. Devious Activity take game number one. Wow. The, the aggressiveness coming out from Devious Activity, they know they have the impact, they know that they had the lead, and they were able to execute it perfectly in that team fight. No members lost there. The Cold Ultra was held onto the very last moment when they were just on the inhibitor uh, base tower. 18, 4, and 38. Quite a high kill score uh, for a, you know, a playoff game, but the side of Devious Activity able to get that advantage early. And it's honestly due to some of the ganks that they had on Zero early on, got them some of the snowball, paired up with Kush, which has been doing quite well with the support. Fredrin, you know, he was fast in and out and he was able to get a lot of kills early on. You know, this, this, this Devious Activity is quite strong, especially comparing their performance in the standings of our regular season. I mean, like I said, man, teams are going to come into playoffs very differently. And Devious Activity with Baj on the lineup, we're going to see a much more aggressive, I think, lineup from Devious Activity here. We already saw glimpses of it. We already saw moments of it. Baj and Yato just, they already have synergy built over past over the past year. Even though they haven't played together this season or recently, um, we know that there's already something there. And you add T into that equation, you add Kush into that equation, there's definitely something deadly here. Even the way they approached the early game, the laning phase, then transitioned into taking towers and cutting lanes. Um, Melon is just, and then Melon's just this extra effect. We haven't seen a lot of Melon, but he's definitely just something where, like, where did this guy come from? Because he's playing wonderfully on the gold lane. And I do also want to say that with this roster change and the element of, you know, getting a 12 minute match against Night Horde, <laughs> which is one of the strongest teams in our standing, it really does show that maybe this potentially might be Devious' activity's strongest lineup that they've had so far. The synergy, it's there, right? Joy Bosch, it does not look out of place at all whatsoever. Is able to get the Minone's Fury at the right time. They're, and like, they're able to follow up no members are dying left and right. There's not much mistake besides I'm offended a little overextension on, you know, kind of the mid and the bottom side tower. And I, I honestly feel like Devious, they played nearly a perfect game to be able to dominate uh, early and into the late game onto the base tower, able to get executed perfectly. That definitely executed very perfectly. Taking a look at some of the stats, Nighthorde was only able to get two towers, and hold on, is this right? Nighthorde got one purple buff that whole oh, game. No. Devious Activity was just in their face, UA. Yeah, and you know, although Zero was able to get a tower punish early on, the impact, you know, from the side of Nighthorde, they're just unable to kind of connect with a lot of these kills, right? Sarori still did quite well, didn't die too much, but the other members of Nighthorde, you know, the impact just wasn't there, right? Zero seven, that's not something we want to see on a jungler. On the other hand, DA played quite well here. The XP was able to get into team fights quite well. High kill participation across the board. Even Melon playing, you know, quite the perfect game. We saw some very clutch blazing duets onto the backside, just clearing and mowing and shredding down all the members of Night Horde. So Devious Activities with this 12 minute win definitely showing a very strong performance. And I mean, Joy Baj, first day in the season, already showing already up as a forgotten one with 14 assists. Melon with gold, poor minute, the rich guy, and Sayori actually packing a punch that game. And you mentioned her a bit, how she did have a decent game, you know, didn't have too many deaths. But what we saw there, you know, it's it's the ripple effect. It's the butterfly effect. DA starts off getting picks onto the EXP lane. That ripples into mm -hmm. the purple buff where they start getting picks onto, uh, onto Oh My Foe. And then once two members are down bad like that, there's, you know, there's nothing the rest can really do to pick up the pieces. Let's take a look at the head-to-head, -head, though, of Sayori and Yato. Yeah, and I mean, the damage doesn't quite tell the full story, right? Even though Yato, you know, more or less played the support role, the nether realms that he had was insane. They were able to soak up so much burst that came out of that Beatrix. And, you know, the, the invulnerability timing, you know, was, was, was able to negate so much damage. 4, 12, uh, 4, 2, and 12 is Yato's score. 
you know, one of the highest kill participations on the side of DA. So definitely still kind of revolving around this trio mid strategy, right? Joy Bosch, 78% Kush, also high in the kill participation. But one thing that does stand out is the performance of T. He was able to get those kills early on, especially every time that DA sent resources up into that XP position. T was able to come through with the penalty zone, gets the stun, gets the pickoff. And, you know, that's great when you're able to get kills off of, you know, an XP lane where typically it's supposed to be that one versus one matchup. So DA definitely playing quite well into their books, into their advantage, possibly looking to go, you know, continuing the momentum into the second game. But I think Nighthorde this time around is going to bounce back. They, yeah, I, you know, I mean, they, they, they had a great game. You know, it, you know, Sayori played great there. It, it was just that, you know, the jungle and XP kind of fell off a little bit towards that mid. If they're able to secure better picks, maybe pick up the Fredrin early on themselves, right? Get that strong jungle presence, you know, ban out maybe the Barats and, you know, take away some of uh, Kush's hero pool and make sure Zero can hold against T. And I think that was the strategy that they had. It was just unfortunate that T was the last pick and, you know, picked up a boss man himself and just completely dominated that matchup. And the whole team, I think, I, you know, I think both teams came in with a strategy. DA, though, I think catches Night Horde off guard with such laning phase aggression, such quick ganks, you know, just consistently putting pressure onto zero. And I think DA also, they came in with that strategy. They knew, all right, we're just going to, we're going to gank hard early game. We're going to put as much pressure on as possible. Now Night Horde maybe has a gauge. They're like, okay. Now we kind of know what we're up against. We need to find a way to slow them down if they come back in. And I think if DA is really sneaky, if they're really smart about this, it's like, okay, this time we focus hard on gold, right? This time we, we switch it up a little bit and we gank the opposite lane a bunch, right? So we'll see how things go. DA is going to be first pick. They're going to ban out the Fermis up front. Um, so Yato is going to have to play something a little bit different. And we're already going to see a slightly different draft. And, you know, one of the things I do have to point out is I feel like we're seeing a lot of troubles in the laning phase. It could be, you know, other teams playing very perfectly to be able to get the ganks off. The timing is correct and they're able to get uh, those kills early on in some of the side lanes. But a lot of these teams, like, it's, it's becoming kind of like a one-sided matchup where they're able to get the weaknesses of the opponents and able to, you know, use that pressure to connect to the objectives, to connect to the snowball. And they're able to kind of just completely destroy one of the sides, get those pickoffs and, you know, get the snowball that they need to go on in these games. So, you know, definitely one recommendation, especially to some of the losing teams or losing matchup is building some early game damage, early game heroes that can defend one versus two that can get out of sticky situations the roger perfectly in mm. this meta to deal with that sort of situation the glue a little bit of a rise in situation also has the ability to dash and sustain so definitely try to you know skew more towards early great picks that you know can defend against a lot of the dives Maybe we might see a cleaner early game. Maybe we can see that 20 minute match that Bloodhounds and BTK had here. I, I mean, I definitely think there's, I, we're just getting started, right? It's game number one. <laughs> Nighthorn didn't place the way they placed for no reason. I definitely think we see some back and forth here, but DA, this time they're wow. going to take the Ruby up front. This has been such a focused pick tonight, and NACT, I feel like, has just done this over the past several weeks from season to now. We're all, I feel like every week we're seeing a new first pick. Like, this is the new first pick. You know, sometimes it was the Roger, now it's the Ruby, before it was Barats or this or that, and it's just consistently changing around what these teams feel they should be prioring. Yeah, and it's very interesting that our lot has not been banned out in the first phase. And in order to flex that pick, they actually rather to get the I'm offended than the final slash, which is, you know, quite honestly, debatably 50-50. Right? The Arlot pretty much does the same thing, has multiple CCs, can displace the opponents, and have a very strong laning phase. But it seems like we like to prioritize Ruby just a little bit more. Now, 
The Night Horde comp coming through with the Barats and the Exports, I like this, right? Uh, that's a lot of frontline uh, sustain coming through, along with, you know, Exborg just uh, denying the picks away from the side of DA to protect the Barats. So I think it's a great opening, but it is extremely prone to CC, extremely prone to the true damage like carry. And I think DA has quite a good response in that sense. I would say, though, that Export is at least a, a solid laner in the beginning of the game. He's not the easiest to gank. He has the passive and everything. So it's, it's a safe pick for Zero, I feel like. You also never really overextend with him, you know, in the early game. Maybe you throw out a last insanity, but even then, you know, you can. it's very easy to play him very safely and kind of stalemate your lane. So I think it's a solid pick for Zero coming into game number two. He shouldn't be too easy to gank. You know, he's probably going to pick up the flicker to pair along with this and should have a nice, clean several first minutes of the game. Sayori now, though, going to pick up that uh, comfort pick Nana for her. We've seen her do crazy things with this pick. Yeah, and you know, another option that I think Sayori could have considered could have been the Valentina, right? Taking away the I'm Offended gets uh, the ultimate coming out from Vexana. But Nana <laughs> provides something a little bit different, right? With, you know, the Molina, he, she's able to, uh, you know, completely single out a target or multiple targets and morph them into a little little rat, I think. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, Don't it's, talk about it's, Molina it's like quite, that. It's, it, it's quite hard to deal with. And I think it does bring, you know, a, a surprise element. And Sayori has been so good in terms of staying alive, farming away and, you know, finding the right team fights. I think Nana does fit quite well and can do definitely some damage, especially going up against, let's say, a Vexana where, you know, she, she, she does shine a little bit more in the long range. She likes to, you know, just be right outside of the hitbox. But with the Molina Blitz, it does go quite far. So potentially able to catch up Yato, but the second phase bans is on the table. The Rithal and the Nolan gets banned out from the side of Night Horde, and the two frontline tanks gets taken out from the side of DA. I mean, this same Nana is what one Night Horde essentially game one against BTK last week. Mm -hmm. um, able to get some of that early aggression with the Molina, able to get a catch on to Moba Zane in like the first minute. So we were we wanted Night Horde to be able to kind of keep up in early phase and Nana can do that. Nana can supply great defense. It's very hard to invade against a Nana. It's very hard yep. to like try to apply very early, you know, laning phase pressure because every time you run in, you're just turned into a rat, as you said, you know? So <laughs> there's a, it, it definitely supplies that. Also decent lane clear. So I think if Sayori wants to oh. kind of follow around, you have to have a hold on a second. Melon mm. on the Hanabi pick. Talk about it, this UA. Is this is, this is what, NACT PTSD a little bit? I mean, we did see a lot of success out of this hero, Man, right? They we picked have it up against give, BTK, right? Like two weeks ago? Yeah, we, we have to give this pick credit because even BTK in their interview, they were struggling. They were telling, hey, there was no way we could kill this Hanabi. How do we do this? And there was a backdoor Milo play to be able to take the game there. So this pick is respectable. It is just a little bit out of the usual norms. Now, Kush picking up this Guinevere is a little bit interesting at the same time. It does provide a lot of the CC that DA may be lacking there, but it is a nerf Guinevere. She is not as good as who she was before the recent patches. So maybe the side of DA can use that to their advantage and get some setups, but wow, Night Horde's setup is very, very ube. And when I, when I look at that Guinevere, I think two things, either DA playing for some, you know, either they're going to try to play pass. I'm wondering, do they want to play really hard for these turtles early game when they can get the knockups onto Oh My Foe? Or is just a dive comp right here to try to herd onto the, to the side lanes once again? Like maybe even give up first turtle, go for a gold lane gank early on, you know, try to get Melon to scale up quickly. I definitely think it's a big possibility here. Last time we saw them hard focus EXP, this time with a hero like Hanabi, you know, you want to try to give her a very clean early game so you can snowball that into the mid to late and get her some of those, you know, three items or so locked in, you know, very quickly, maybe much sooner than, you know, 13, 12 minutes you know maybe 10 minutes something like that but let's see because da leading in one match in a best of five up against the night horde can they make it two or will night horde 
bring us to the dead even. So, you know, you kind of talked about the Hanabi trying to get into that late game. Definitely feels like DA, they're going to be putting generally quite a bit of resources onto that gold lane quite early on. Like, they want to make sure the Hanabi is going to be safe dealing with the carry one versus one. And when we talk about the laning phase, honestly, the Hanabi should be able to deal quite well against the carry by itself. And it does seem like the side of DA, they're able to get a small zoning even on mid side. So that's two lanes already in their slight advantage. We can take a look at the top side though. It seems like it's quite the even trade, but T able to get the Raga armor off early should, you know, give them a small advantage leads in terms of a quick rotation and maybe contestions of some of the neutrals. Oz already bringing out the, uh, wow. the, the typical engages, the typical in your face. Melon does have the Aegis, right, to kind of, uh, you know, help help him out when he's moving around. The shield, what is that? It pretty much activates as a purify, doesn't it, UA? Mm-hmm. And, ooh, a little numb-numb. A little bit of damage. Oh, my foe will come in, but he is going to get knocked out by the Violent Requiem. Able to pick up the kill. Can they get the response? Yes. Baj able to get one for one there, but it's a jungler for an EXP laner. I think it's a good trade in the hands of Devious Activity. Yeah, but, you know, for the side of Night Horde, it's, they've already started a little bit better than before. They, You know, they're able to get a little bit of zoning onto some of the far lanes. They're able to get a trade early on. The gold lead is not crazy. It's only, you know, about 100 gold leads. So it's not really that significant now for the side of DA, though. Right? They have to see if you know they could get the pickoffs that they're looking for. It seems like they want to pressure in onto the top side, maybe get uh, this neutral objective uncontested. But I, it honestly feels like the side of Night Horde, they, they're playing this early game much better than before. Right, They're able to get a few kills here and there. Now, the Nana's looking to get to that level four. Might be impossible too late for a contestion for the neutral objective. Definitely too late. They, they they tested the waters. They dipped their toe in it, but did not fully commit. And I think it's well played by Nighthorde. Don't go all in on that. Um, they didn't have a good positioning. Oh, my foe also leaked to the party there. So now still back down to a stalemate. 1-1. One, one, gold dead even right now. You know, the Florin pick from Nighthorde. Give me a little something on it. Do we think it's a good pick here? We don't see it all the time. How do we feel about it, UA? Well, definitely if we, you know, take a look at some of the out of the country combinations but before that nom nom wouldn't be anything too major nice i'm offended Ooh. oh my foe actually gonna get pulled back in but still nobody getting a kill yeah i mean the florin pick is quite interesting it has been used quite a lot in the ph regions this weekend um and and you know there's some teams that have a lot of success with it right uh Manana, uh, Manana Evos definitely has a lot of success with the floor and the wrath picks, so it's definitely quite viable. There's a lot of teams out there that, you know, just kind of hang on to this support pick. But for Mamoy now, you know, I, I've, I've known him to be a great Minotaur. He's done super well with Grok. This, for me, is the first time that he's opting to go for this floor and pick. And it's not, you know completely uh great especially when you're, you're going up against something like a set roamer but it definitely has some potential and it just pairs super well with the barats but top side you do get the raga armor at but least zero hasn't gone down right okay. so they like he's been getting he's definitely been getting bullied a bit but last game those bullies would have translated to kills mm -hmm. this time they're feeling a little better about it you know we were talking about the Hanabi pick a little bit earlier, and I think one of the reasons why she's a, maybe a bit more viable than what we would have seen in the past. Um, one, the ability, the new the kiting thing that came out in the last few patches of with the marksmen, so many of them now able Auto to kind of hit and move, attack and and you know double step around a bit. That gives her. She's not as vulnerable when just unloading. And then also mm -hmm. the recent buffs on the towers, as long as you're under that tower, now you're getting even more damage reduction and you're pretty much safe from ganks. Wait a second, oh my foe able to get the Tona's welcome. Onto Kush, gets the big stun. Yato takes a lot of damage, forced to back off. But Momoi gonna get attacked from the back T, able to pick up the kill, looking for another one. Melon able to find one as well. It's one for one right now. Turtle does go to the side of the Night Horde though. Make it two, T finds another kill. Yeah, and you know, T potentially might get picked Ooh. off here. In a Does little he have the bounce? Does he have the bounce? No, zero. Oh. Oh, pops it a little bit too early. T right behind him, and now all oh, my foe gonna go down. T still playing with him. Finally drops. But now Baj in a bad spot. Moy looking for the kill. Kush also just trying to get away here. 
Melon taking towers though while this is happening and devious activity get away safely. Now, I think one of the rise of kind of the more stationary damage dealers, we're talking about like Vexana, uh, Hanabi, Carry. they don't have, you know, a very big dash range. It's due to the fact that it seems like we don't have as much assassin actions as we did back then, right? A lot of these heroes are prone to dive. And yes, we are in a very dive heavy meta, but we also value a lot of uh, kind of sustain, right? We value armor early on defenses to, you know, build up something like a brody with a or, or or a carry with a belt first item right so a lot of prone dive heroes have been coming up to the meta but at the same time you know we don't have the assassins like the ling and the fanny that roam around the map anymore so the hanabi pick honestly it could be quite safe here and you know melon's doing a great job uh on the top side dealing with uh the arp by himself I mean, and another thing to add on what you just said, the amount of crowd control now that is so prevalent in teams, like three, four, sometimes all five members, and that creates space for heroes like the Vex to be okay, but now on my foe, trying to get some more damage mm. on a Kush. Kush taking a little bit too much to the face there, forced to back off Melon as well, able to just get away safely, but Night Horde still unable to pick up a kill in that fight. Devious Activity just want to try to defend here. Melon doesn't want to let this tower go down. Yeah, but I'm a little bit surprised from the side of Night Horde. They did go for a little aggression early on, but they did not connect it with any objectives. But Foe here. Ooh, Foe off. very low. T once again diving in. Able to get the kill there as Kush picks up the turtle. Zero gets the last insanity, but still unable to kill T just yet. Devious activity come out on top again in that fight. Yeah, but a lot more 50-50s this time around. You can see the side of Night Horde. They have a lot of damages that is actually oh. available here and are here. Oh. oh, gets the kill. 1v1 Melon <laughs> finds it. That's insane. And Never would I have thought. That's, that's the strength of a Hanabi uh, by herself, you know, especially early on. We're talking about a single target damage dealer like Carry versus kind of like a, a cleaver. Uh, from the Hanabi, and he was able to kind of just solo out the carry quite early. The side of Devious, they do have the bot and the top tower, so already an advantage in terms of the objectives. And they, you know, they, they've also been able to rack up about a 3k gold lead, and they're looking quite sharp here. And, you know, the side of Devious, it's, it's, it's very good for them to be able to have the Hanabi to get that winning matchup because Hanabi is one of those heroes that do require a lot of scaling. But before that, whew, oh, Melonbra so low, but just in time gets the Aegis. Pair that up with the Eternal Guardian. It was a four man knockup. Every time Nighthorde tries to come in, they're stopped in their tracks. Yeah, but the good thing is Night Horde is not getting picked off as much as they were from the last match, right? The overall kill score is only 6 to 3, so it's not as bloodthirsty as it was beforehand. It does smell good news, though, right? Uh, you know, the, the side of Night Horde, the problem that I saw from last game is that they were just unable to, you know, go past the laning phase safely. But this time around, they've definitely been able to get through that quite safely. It's about a 4K gold lead. It's not that much at a nine minute mark. It's definitely come backable, but they've just set themselves up in a much better situation this time around. And potentially they're going to be able to get a winning team fight here and there. Ooh, watch out for the Violent Requiem. There it is. Oh, my foe, taking away too much damage. Gonna go down. Kush able to pick up the kill. Devious activity now, backing off. They got the purple buff. They still haven't cracked that tier three in the mid side just yet. A lot in the off lanes, but still having a little trouble finding that one. Lord should go down, though, to Devious activity. Yeah, and again, Devious activity, they've played quite well in this series and especially even in this game they're not really giving too much opportunity for night horde even with some of the more 50 50 fights that they had early on the side of devious they're you know almost always coming out quite ahead now they're able to get that mid tower that you were looking for it opens up the map completely you can even see melon just walking through the jungle of the side of night horde not scared at all as he should you know, he's, he's got that built-in Purify. It's not the same as a Purify, but, you know, it does provide a lot of utilities that the side of Night Horde have to deal with. And quite honestly, there's not much CC coming out from Night Horde to be able to pin the Hanabi in a good position for them to get the damage that R desperately needs to output in order for Night Horde to uh, go above and beyond in this uh, team fight.
And I'm wondering exactly what Meln's building here. Are there any defensive items? Is it just full damage? Um, <laughs> what exactly the plan is here? Lord is crashing down on the bot side. So we got Golden mm. Staff, Corrosion, Scythe, Demon Hunter Sword. Honestly, though, man, like with the shield and everything, it's so funny because Melon just feels so bulky right now. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times has taken some shots and just has not been able to get taken out. Are, though, walking on to Kush here. Eternal Guardian did drop down in the tier two on the mid side. Devious activity not overextending, though. The Lord has been taken out. Devious activity and control of the map. And, you know, they don't really have to overextend, right? Even if they don't take losses here, they have Melon, which is so extremely hard to deal with. And he's just scaling more and more and more. And he just has so much damage that there's almost nothing that Night Horde can do, right? Devious, they have the Violent Requiem to be able to stun onto the front side. They have the I'm Offended to displace the big dinosaur there. And for the side of Night Horde, of course, they have... The Florin pick, and once again, a lot of the healers, it's more about being reactive. It's not about making the plays yourself, but the opponents just miscalculating, misjudging the sustain, and, you know, force the opponents to make some mistakes. But right now, Divas Activity is playing perfect. They're getting the pickoffs that they need to, wasting some ultimates, but they're able to single out individual members, getting one or two kills per team fight. And they're setting up for such a big snowball. Look at the damage dealt here oh. before that. Violent Requiem does come down. Are able to unload with Speedy Light. Oh. We're able to pull back. The I'm offended. A lot so of far. damage on the foe, and foe goes down. Zero does pop the last, and Sandy Melon gets the Aegis in. Now able to get some more free shots. Zero in a little bit of trouble, trying to get back to safety. They're going to lock on to the Tier 2 now on the mid side. Melon able to grab it. Devious Activity mm. come out once again on top in that fight. Joy Baj is back in the land of dawn. <laughs> People told me not to get too excited about it, but I'm hype over it. And, you know, T's performing quite well with the CC, right? We saw the impact that he had in the very first objective, where he was able to get onto the backside, get a few kills here and there, especially when it almost felt like it was a 50-50 for both of these teams. And T, able to make the impact already in the XP position. Again, this is something that we've expected before. But this DA squad, the dominance and the performance that they've had, like, it's crazy how much synergy that they have, how much confidence, how well they synergize with each other. <laughs> and now it is up to Night Horde to defend that. They definitely have the ability to, but it is going to be a very rough uphill battle. Uh, Yato has, I mean, I feel like everyone on Devious Activity this game has just played very cleanly from Melon to Kush. Yato's had some great Eternal Guardians. Baj with some mm -hmm. really clean I'm Offended. Now they're going to try to break through onto this base. They will get the crash from the Enhanced Lord, bringing that inhibitor down to about half health. All five members going to pile up. A little bit of a freeze there, but it's okay. They finally break through. T holds down the front side along with Joy Baj. Do pop the conceal play. Kush looking for the engage. Will get stopped. Stunned up from the floor in. Nice eternal guardian comes down. Another inhibitor falls as well. Devious activity able to take it now. Down to the bot side. One more to go like dominoes. Devious activity. Final target locked. The thing is this Night Horde can't even come in because he is just yo-yoing away. <laughs> shredding anyone down that comes close. And Night Horde doesn't have any dive right now. They gave up a heavy hitting tank for Momoya on this floor. And they gave up a heavy backlining dive EXP laner for this X-Borg. Which, which, you know, could work. It was just that, you know, the side of Night Horde, they just don't have that much CC Ooh. here. Another Violent Requiem locks on to zero there, paired up with T. I'm gonna get some nice damage down. Still not a kill just yet. Tona's Welcome does lock on to T, but T's okay. Joy Baj jumps in. Night Horde getting pushed back into the base, trying to get their health backs, health bars back to full. Kush has an immortality. Ready to jump in and die for the team. Baj as well. Last of Sandy connects on to Yato. Yato forces a flicker. Night Horde still just trying to defend, and Devious Activity finally back off. Yeah, and, you know, Night Horde should be able to defend quite well. They do have the carry to be able to, you know, deal as much damage as he can possibly, but the spacing coming out from Devious Activity is just really too good, right? They have CC to, you know, zone away anyone from the backside. They also have Guinevere where the Violent Requiem could smell death for any of the members of the side of Night Horde. And, you know, now they're kind of caught in a very bad situation where they do have to defend the base. Zero caught off by himself though here. 
Ooh, a lot of damage. Zero and a little bit of trouble. Fraggle armor does pop. He is a bulky boy, though, so he should be able to get away here. Mm, chunky. But the threat chunky is constantly there. there for the side of Nighthorde. They just haven't been able to find a way out of their base just yet. Yeah, but the Lord is going to come up in about 10 seconds. This is going to be the second Luminous Lord for the side of Devious. And, you know, we're slowly seeing kind of the same story being put off by many of these teams, right? The early objective, the early game kind of just shows a very strong snowball. And it almost feels like there's no way for anyone to get back here. But Ruby is picked. Ooh, everyone unloads. Joy Bosch. Immortality does pop. Will he be able to get away? No. Finally goes down. Sayori able to get the kill there. This is, I think, Devious Activity has to know. Okay, maybe let's stop the taunt. Stop the recall. Stop the <laughs> toss, toss, toss. Uh, Bosch getting a little ahead of himself. Yeah, and I mean, the Lord is going to be marching down now with Joy Bosch. A 20 second death timer. DA may not be able to push into the inhibitors and this is gonna pretty much push the game past you know that 19 minute mark where the second the, the third luminous lord is going to be coming up but devious still have an opportunity here they have luminous lord marching down everyone is in set position but it Melon. is going to be a four versus five Ellen takes the angle Melon. takes the flank unloading the backside along with cushion t more down about 20%, zero. Pops last and standing in the backside. Aegis is pop from Melon. Oh my foe, we get to the tone as welcome. But the mirror fight comes in, Melon's okay. Able to walk away, but the base goes down to the backside. I completely missed it. DA takes the game. It looks like Night Horde missed it too. Another very strong performance coming out from the squad of DA here. 17 minute match. Definitely, all the members have been shining, but I do want to focus on Melon a little bit with this Hanabi, right? This is the pick that we're like, hey, Hanabi versus Carry. You know, it shouldn't go extremely <laughs> one-sided. It's both late games, right, Trex? And, you know, Hanabi, he was dominating in his lane. He was able to push out, um, you know, the Carry multiple times in different situations, and then paired up with pretty much the synergy that DA has. You know, they looked unstoppable in a lot of these team fights. All the small skirmishes pretty much went into the side of DA's uh, favor and you know Night Horde they were they 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 kind of did well based on the mistakes that they made in game one zero did not get picked off as much they were able to you know lower the kill scores early on I believe when it was mid game it was three to six and they were able to kind of negate some of the weaknesses that they had before in game one but and when it came down to the late game team fights, that was a four versus five with the Luminous Lord. If they're unable to defend that four versus five, think about if Bosch was there. It would have just been a one sided team fight. And that really shows how strong DA is as a team, especially with this new lineup. That's it's kind of scary, man. It, it makes it is. There's some high hopes. After this series right here, there's definitely some high hopes for Devious Activity, but they're not out of the water just yet. Night Horde is a team that has shown they can go the long haul. Um, yes. they, I think as long as they don't let their morale get down, try to get some momentum back, they're definitely not done for just yet. Taking a look at some of the stats, like you said, much closer than last game i think night horde you know maybe they're still downloading maybe they're still getting comfortable with this new devious activity maybe they're still trying to figure things out they they were able to get the win against devious activity earlier on in the season um yes once again it was a slightly different team you know a slightly different roster i think they just need to kind of get their grips on things and figure out how they need to approach this yeah, and I mean, for the side of Devious Activities, they played quite well into some of their strengths, right? They know T can kind of do things on himself, and he can probably get the early rotations in some of the objectives. Kush, of course, being the objective focus player that he is, grabbed up all the neutral objectives, and we saw plenty moments of greatness coming out from Yato, getting, you know, multiple sets on the knockup, and even Joybot with the displacement, DA, their full team is playing pretty much at their peak. You talked about suiting up, and D8 has definitely suited up in the game one, game two. Now it is up to Night Horde to see if they can match the same energy to be able to, you know, take this series into maybe the fourth or the fifth game.
I mean, we haven't so far. Time tells. So far, every every series <laughs> has been a sweep so far. I was really mm -hmm. hoping that this one would be a bit closer, but right now it's a looking good for DA. Melon the carry, Melon the rich guy, Melon used to be the sub, but now this man's on the roster showing up. Take us through some mm -hmm. of this head-to-head, -head, though. Yeah, and, you know, Sayori played another great game here not dying she you know she she's great at just staying alive getting the farm even in the losing situation she's able to kind of manage her way to you know take away some of the mistakes and get the damage dealt on right she was the highest damage dealt from the last game even though on the losing side and this time around doesn't fall that much behind from yato here take a look at some of the team fight participations it is still spread across but what's significant is t on a 75 percent team fight participation he's been there for every team fight and this is the one of the first games that we see the side lanes actually doing better than you know some of the mid trio combinations right melon 63 percent t 75 percent this team is so balanced they're able to win matchups on the side lanes and if they need their trio mid to kind of come up they have it right yato joy bot is so strong here and this was one of the things that I was, you know, coming in, looking at some of the, you know, thinking about predictions, thinking about how some of these matches were going to go, you know, T versus Zero. Um, I think, I don't know, man, we can't forget, T's, T's not just some slump in the EXP lane. <laughs> I think Nighthorde maybe needs to think about it. They can't keep giving T the CC, right? Or they can't give C, they, they need to make sure that Zero has a good matchup match man up. like they need to make sure his matchup is very clean and it, they can't just they can't just slot t for the team like what works exactly for the roster i think maybe they need to i mean they can't just slot zero for the team what works with the roster they need to slot zero on how he's going to be able to compete against t because if if he doesn't like I said, it's gonna it's gonna ripple effect into the rest of the team, man. And we saw it again. Yes, Zero didn't die in laning phase, but he was consistently sent back to base. Frog arm, armor was consistently popped, and that rippled into the rest of the team. It gave Night Horde, it gave T, I mean, it gave DA, it gave T the ability to rotate around and cause pressure elsewhere. Now this time it's match point. Night Horde on the blue side, first pick. It's it's a very tough matchup, Trex, especially when you talk about how much success T has in the XP lane. You could put anyone in NACT and T with the experience, with the championship ability that he has. This is a team full of, you know, all-star players once again. Yes, they did place quite low, but this new lineup has been devastating. They took an 11, 12 minute match against I think the top three, top four of Night Horde. And now they're pushing their lead a 2-0 so far, going for the third. It's gonna be a very hard situation for Night Horde to deal with. But the strategy that you put up, right? Building, you know, a, a team around zero, maybe giving him a more comfort hero. If he doesn't have CC, right? Foe can pick up the CC. He's a great Akai player. Right? He can pick up the CC himself. Mamoy, we've seen him on beautiful set tanks. And, you know, of course, Sayori, she's been performing so well. There's definitely an opportunity to be able to manage, you know, some of the strategies and get Zero on a winning matchup. If they could find Zero on a winning matchup here, that might be the win condition for the side of Night Horde to be able to get a game, possibly the series here. Keyword might be the win condition. Might be, right? yes. because might be. Because <laughs> Melon also <laughs> such a great job in gold. I mean, Baj and Yato are a problem. Night are, you know, they they just got to find an answer all over the place. And whether it's, you know, willing to just... In the very beginning of match one, we saw Sayori and Momoi get a little bit aggressive with Baj and Yato. And I think, you know, it might be time. Let's, let's go for the 50-50. Let's see who dies first, you know? Let's just <laughs> trade off here. You know, it's match point. You're not out this game. You have some opportunity to kind of push your limits, limit Tessa but here. You go down. You're not. It's not a lower bracket game, you know? So I think Nighthorde need to come in strong this game hmm. and be ready for the aggression that DA is going to bring to them. And that first pick, Fredrin, is definitely a very strong performance hero, especially today. Most of the Fredrin matches have won 
right? So, you know, definitely picking this up. I do think it is the right strategy, uh, the, the right way into success. Some other heroes that can pair well could be kind of the Faramis, the Brody, kind of the standard paired up with something like a CC, like the Ruby or the Arlot is definitely possible for the side of Nighthorde to take. But DA smartly denies the Faramis pick away from Sayori. There is still a Navaria available. So potentially I do want to see them go in that direction, but no. It is going to be the IMU here. Perfect yeah. to deal with, uh, you know, the netherroom coming out from the fairness. And it's there was a quick response, you know, and I'm wondering they if Night Horde waits for that EXP pick because DA is very com like T himself is very comfortable being a last pick EXP laner. Um, mm. He almost wants to be wants to because whatever you pick, he wants to, you know, do the rock, paper, scissors with you. Look for the what's my best matchup. Night Horde being on blue side, it's definitely different. So they could just like slot in the CC is not there. So they could slot in something for him very comfortably up front. But I think they wait. They bring in their own heavy, heavy frontliner, heavy frontline roamer to deal with the Minotaur and kind of match them. So Nighthorde kind of matching DA's pace right now. And, 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 and it gives them opportunity for Zero to pick up the damage dealers that he's really well known for. Right? The CC that Nighthorde has this time around, they had the floor in the first time with the Barats, right? That's not that much CC, but this time around with the Grok, the, I'm, the, the IMU paired up with the Fredrin, it gives mm. Zero an opportunity to experience, uh, you know, different types of damage mm. dealers. And this time around, DA is even willing to have the confidence to pick a Yuzong early for Zero to decide what kind of matchup. I think all the stars are falling in line for the side of Nighthorde to be able to find a strategy to push this into a game four. Yuzong is definitely not the most meta EXP laner right now, but the, if there is Agreed. a player that I would trust picking it up first phase of draft, it would <laughs> definitely be T. But this, like you said, gives Zero some opportunity. Now you have full realm. You have full opportunity. Yep. T put put his card down. Let's see what you got to respond. <laughs> and if there's a time for Zero to really pop off, this is definitely it. And, you know, they're not really focusing on Zero's hero pool. Maybe the Arlot could be a potential pick in the XP position. Mm. Maybe Zero's going to take the and Grok <laughs> for himself and flex, right? Ooh. But, this, you know, it does give a lot of open cards for the side of Night Horde to deal with. But at the same time, right, Kush has been protected into the last phase. He has the opportunity. He can pick up the Akai if his team feels like they need a little bit more CC. The Joy has also been available here, but Kush going for a utility focused jungler. And the response is so quick here. There goes. Now, what did we see last week? What was the big winning play from uh, Nighthorn up against VTK? It was this Ixia, Ixia on R. Some of the positioning was incredible. Just some of the plays overall were monstrous from Nighthorn. So back to basics, back to comfort, back to what works. But does Melon have something up his sleeve here? Because this time they're slotting Melon as the last pick. And I think this is exactly why. What does he go for here? Arithal, Brodies are still available. The Claude gets banned out to protect it, and Melon goes for the same <laughs> strategy here. If it ain't broke, don't, don't fix it. Fix but Zero it. here. But, 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 but Zero here with the Ruby. Now, this is interesting because both Ruby and Grok can be flexed uh, with each other. We don't see Grok XP that often, but maybe Ruby is going to be a better matchup against Yuzong. We saw, you know, Zero hovering this Ruby in the very first game. It did end up getting switched, mm -hmm. but I do think this time around it could be interesting, but going up against Melon, especially with the purifies that has been built in, may be a little bit hard to deal with. Going up against Melon with the Purifieds built in. Now with yeah. the Nether Realm as well, <laughs> just to keep you alive even longer. Um, and the Flash yeah, it's, from it's, Minnow. It's, it's scary, man. Yeah. It's scary. <laughs> but our, the, the full barrage, if they can, you know, use this to their advantage, if they can get these wild charges, maybe get a stolen IMU Minoan's Fury, um, there was definitely some big set potential for Nighthorde. The same thing that we saw win them game three against BTK last week could be what bring them brings them to a game four here. But let's see because it's match point.
for devious activity. If you haven't already, put those votes in and let us know who you think is going to come out on top. Will Night Horde take us the long haul or will DA sweep them down to the lower bracket? I, you know, I just want to appreciate that this devious lineup has been such an, a formidable force, such a contending force in this series so far. They've pretty much played nearly perfect small mistakes here and there but they're winning majority of the trades they're winning majority of the small skirmishes and you know quite honestly recently it feels like all the objectives especially early on it's it's been a one-sided match right whoever gets the first turtle leads up to the second second leads up to the third leads up to the lords and then it just kind of becomes one-sided we haven't been able to see a match where it goes back and forth there's more 50 50s but i do think this time around especially with both utility jungles we might potentially see that now let's take a look at some of the emblems here it seems like Ooh. relatively all standard but top side quick pick off already you're already i feel bad for zero man i think D devious <laughs> activity is like listen welcome welcome back to nact zero it's been a while since we've seen you in playoffs but welcome back devious activity knows i think they they know that he's the new player we're gonna try to jump mm. onto that we're gonna try to take advantage of it and they've been doing it all three games it's it's classic right you want to welcome the newbies coming in not necessarily a newbie in this case but somebody that's coming out of retirement, hey, you know, surprise, surprise, the meta has been different from the days that you were here, and this is our time to shine. And, you know, Night Horde here doing something quite smart. They are getting a trade on the opposite side of map. Fredrin's able to get the blue buff, while DA is looking to go with three versus three in the objectives. They don't end up getting Ooh. it, but on the boss side, a little bit of a trade. A little bit of action in the mid side as well. Another round from both sides. Sayori able to get the team back to safety. But yeah, gold laner for gold laner. One for one. One one on both sides. Nighthorde do take the purple buff. Gold definitely not escaping them at all. It's anyone's game. Mm, and you know, for the side of DA, they definitely have the opportunity to take most of the objectives quite freely, right? T with the Black Dragon form, it's very, very hard to deal with T, especially since he already has an advantage on the XP lane. He's going to have faster rotations. He's going to be able to clear first. And he's able to get the rotations that, you know, Devious Activity needs and pair it up with Aboxia, right? He's not scared to start objectives. He's not scared to do anything. And he should be able to just roll around, get some quick engagement, maybe even get a pick off so the night horde they definitely have to you know be a little bit worried but at, at least hey their gold lane is winning and that's going to be quite huge in a lot of these team fights and you know the big difference between the uh ixia and the carry that uh melon went up against last time is the range right r has the mm. poke has the ability to kind of push melon back to whereas normally the hanabi Ooh. has that you know has a lot of oh but wait a second speaking of r the full barrage comes out but it's still not enough down goes Ixia. Melon now in a slightly bad spot, but Joy Bosch here to help out. Oh, my foe gets the bonk down. Look for the kill. Melon able to just get away. And that's a game changer. Yeah, I mean, it did look good for quite a second for oh my foe but it, the the shield the ages coming out from the hanabi was just a little bit too much to deal with some of the damage that foe has. And now he's going to be punished here. Punished badly. Just when Night Horde was kind of keeping up in terms of gold and everything, members are starting to fall. T confident. Ooh, the wild charge oh. comes in. Sayori look for something, but the Nether Realm saves the day once again. Petrify, knock up. Sayori goes down, but finds T in the nick of time. It's a one for one. Night Horde still hanging on here. The devious activity not done yet. Momoi and Zero down low. Joy Bosch able to get the knock up. Momoi just trying to get away, but Yato doesn't want to let it happen. Oh. Kush under the tower looking for the last hit, but unable to connect. And Momoi gets home with one health. And I mean, the, the little trades that are happening here, it's it's honestly just one for one. Even though, you know, DA has a kill lead, the gold lead is still quite close here. And, you know, Foe even has the opportunity here. Ooh, Minoan's Fury does connect. Zero gets another knockup. Joy Bosch looking for more. Zero able to get the I'm offended, though. And Joy Bosch is instantly deleted. Mamoy now gets the wild charge on the two members. Yato brought down to about 20%, just trying to get away safely. Night Horde now collapsing. Next target, Kush locked on, taking out R, picking up the kill. Well, this is happening. T is getting that top tower, but overall feels like a win for Night Horde. 
Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a win. It's still 1k gold lead for the side of DA. They're able to get, even get some damage onto the far lane here. So definitely is going to be advantage uh, for the side of Nighthorde. They're able to get two kills in that team fight and this is what night horde really needs to be able to get back into this match right the small skirmishes are so important and if they're able to get a win in any of these small skirmishes it pushes you know the game timer even far back da is not going to be able to have kind of a significant gold lead where they could play the bully ball they have to you know pick the team fights a little bit uh more worrying it seems like foe here is huge no like you know he, he's so tanky he's a big chunky boy nothing can hurt him and even now night hordes looking to push onto the mid side yeah they're doing well kush taking a lot of damage there a lot of knockups a lot of stuns i'm offended connects but the no one's fury does connect as well another round for both sides Biatos comes in second uh -oh. waiting for the full barrage to from R, and there it is yato kush Taken out, Kush able to just get away, but Yato's still gone off the map. T a little bit late to the party, brings out the Black Dragon. R gets a couple more free shots on to Melon before flickering away. Back to safety. Night Horde finding some moments of brilliance there, but still mm. not in control of the game just yet. You know, the side of Devious Activities, I, you know, the Black Dragon coming in, I felt like he should have targeted R right there, but a little bit of you know a targeting issue right there it seems like t you know didn't get what he was looking for but top side here maybe going for a pickoff Airfy, i'm offended but t still oh fight back knows he has the advantage petrify zero goes down man t is Whoa. a problem man this man is a Welcome. menace right now to night horde the big bomb comes down oh my foe able to take out the turtle wild charge connects onto one Yato, able to get the Nether Realm just in time. Here comes the rest of DA, ready to collapse on Oh My Foe. Joy Bosch uses him in Owen's Fury, but connects onto nobody. Kush, though, looking for the target. Connects onto our oh, no. Black Dragon as well with the Petrify, and they collapse. R is gone. Sent back to the Nether Realm. Another one down. <laughs> Momoi uses the Flicker to try to get safely into the tower, but T still gets the kill. Zero now gets the I'm offended onto T, brings him under the tower. T gets a couple shots in the face, but still up, healthy, eating good right now. Oh, my foe brings down to the Apprentice's Wrath onto three members. Baj looks for the knockup, taken out for it. It's two for one right now, but DA still coming out in the lead. Yeah, great focus onto R in that team fight. They're able to pick him off quite early there. The Nether Realm from Sayori just barely out of range and they're able to get the pick off that they were looking for now the gold lead is about 3k it's still a very close game and I think this is you know Night Horde's best game so far in this series they're able to you know kind of push around the side of DA making sure that they don't have a clean engagement it's trades one for one here and there or a two for one and that's much better than you know just completely losing out now the dive coming in from DA is still quite huge here but boss side seems like r did use the missile barrage to push melon out but no kills oh. connected so far bro melon's just able to walk away it's so disgusting man <laughs> hanami shouldn't be able to do this but melon is and now momoi taking a lot of damage from kush here kush Gonna be able to get that kill. Actually, Melon finds it. Oh. The Apprentice's Wrath comes down, but Yato gets another realm just in time once again. Sayori comes in with the IMU, able to steal one for herself. But now T and the Black Dragon into the backside. Boy, Joy Bosch flickers in. Melon <laughs> takes down the tower. Still the back and forth. Kush able to find R. And now Night Horde is collapsing. Zero. Gonna be next. T gets the kill. That's four members down on the Night Horde. Devious activity, five strong. I think that kind of cements a lot of the late game team fight potential that Night Horde can provide there. Because quite honestly, it was still a good dive from the side of DA, but it wasn't like perfect, right? There, there, there was plenty of times where, you know, like right here, they were able to get the cold altar out quite early. And typically when it comes down to that, right, the nether realm, whoever pops it later should have the advantage. But unfortunately, you know, the side of Night Horde, they lost four members in that team fight. Now the Lord goes into the hands of DA. It's going to be a very big struggle, especially now since the gold lead has just widened a little bit more. Yeah, and here's the thing, right? Like you would say, like, normally in Ixia, all right, we, we have late game potential. 
but there's a Hanabi <laughs> on the other team, you know? And it's like, Melon, this shouldn't be legal. This shouldn't be possible. This shouldn't <laughs> be meta. But Devious Activities making it work and making it work well. Here comes the full barrage, but the Nether Realm helps out once again. Night Horde unable to do anything against the onslaught of Devious Activity. But that is two big utilities used before the Lord has marched down. No Minone's Fury, no Nether Realm, but the trade for the side of Night Horde, they are down the, the missile barrage along with the uh the charge coming out from the grok so traded some utilities but night horde should be able to defend this lord no problem here but the members of da are looking to siege i don't think there's gonna be a full commit Ooh, here i'm offended i'm offended comes from zero t taken out joy Bosch taken out very reminiscent of the last game the i'm offended mm -hmm. to help push devious activity away now kush Gonna get taunted up, taking a lot of damage. Mel now unable to get able to get some good free Ooh. shots. Sayori pops the Nether Realm. Amoy into the backside. Does not have that wild charge in a very bad spot. Full barrage comes out, but Yato instantly moves on to R there. Gets the Shadow Stampede, Kush, Melon still looking for free shots. Melon pops the Aegis, will catch the Amal Fend into the face, but does oh. not fall. Appraisal's Wrath are finally able to find it. It's four members down on Devious Activity. Still a 4K gold lead, but Night Horde feels like they're back in the game. Yeah, the light at the end of the tunnel is shining ever so brightly for the Black Dragons here, able to get their very first winning team fight in this series. And that was a very tough fight, right? Like, you know, the members of Devious Activities have tried to disengage. It was a full kind of like three versus four. And the side of Night Horde was able to get the pickoffs before the side of Devious is able to, you know, get back into their base. It's a very nice, good fight, but can they use that to get objectives? That's the real question. Can they, you know, commit through? But before that, Minone's Fury, only connects on him, Amoy. Should be okay, but watch for T here, man. Watch for T. He's there. So now <laughs> he's got the flank. He's got the angle. R needs to be careful. Baj as Most. well. Devious Activity looking for the sandwich here. Looking for the ambush. But this is great news for the side of Night Horde, right? They're able to actually take control over the aggressive side. So it seems like Devious Activities, they don't... They're not necessarily looking to, you know, be the advantage team here, right? They're giving away the, the the jungle pressure, especially onto the Lord side, which is quite valuable. And you now you could even see a small flip, split push coming out from side Nightheart. They're so confident that they can kind of delay this team fight five versus four. This this is very good news for the side of Nighthorde. You know, they they're in a great position, especially for this Luminous Lord. Yeah, they finally feel comfortable to add a little macro to it. It's like they don't have to constantly be all five. Wait a second, Momoi! <laughs> Look at the damage! On to T! Joy Bosch able to get the No One's Fury. Nether Realm does come out from Sayori, but T's gone. Oh. Nice wall coming from Momoi. Full barrage connects! The damage, Yato able to help him out, but Bosch might not be able to get away. No R gets the killing spree. And now Devious Activity looking for the response. A little bit of damage on a Sayori Kush able to find the kill, but R is just unloading. Bomb, bomb, bomb. Members of DA are falling. Oh my foe takes the Lord and Melons on the run. R on the chase. Night Horde wins out in a huge team fight. And, you know, hope is a very dangerous thing. And it seems like Night Horde definitely has a lot of hope so far. We talked about it, right? The the confidence that you know Night Horde has to send a member onto the opposite lane before the Lord fights, and they're down in gold, down in kills. They get the pick off that they were looking for early on. The Yuzong Black Dragon not there, and a beautiful wall coming out from Memoi paired with the missile barrage coming through, shredding every one of those members. Night Horde with a brilliant fight there in the second Lord. Yeah, I mean, honestly, Devious Activity was lucky to even get the one kill there. <laughs> Zero also feeling a lot more confident, able to kind of hold down the front line and be a threat. We saw just when he dashed into that tower range, Devious uh -oh. Activity kind of backed off. Melon in a bad spot, going to get knocked off from the wild charge. No one's here able to connect onto two. Sayori trying to help out with the Nether Realm. Look at the damage onto TT, looking for anything he can. But the whole barrage connects once again. But R taking out Yato with the shutdown. And now Devious Activity is looking for more. Sayori able to find T. Baj holding down the front side as well. Yato there with Melon. Kush flanking from the backside connects on to Sayori and Sayori falls as 
as well with the rest of her fallen teammates. Night Horde, just when they had something, devious activity takes it from them. Yeah, but, you know, if, if you take a look at this for example, it's not necessarily that Night Horde had right of course you know they want to be able to win it but can the side of devious activity punish the mistakes that night horde made here you can see the cold altar like melon is literally just free attacking from the backside. he's you know he's able to recover some health and r here made a huge mistake yeah no flicker available missile barrage coming through is just not in a good position but there's no lord coming up there's no objectives being taken so you know, the side of Night Horde, even though they lost that team fight, it wasn't a, the, the timing wasn't right, where when they did lose that team fight, they would get their real estate taken. They just traded some gold back and now it's even, even a small lead for the side of Night Horde. That's even Steven's 200 goal lead for Night Horde right now. It is a we game. Could definitely go either way. Both teams down a lot of towers. Devious Activity a little bit ahead in that department, but since they haven't broken down an inhibitor, the macro isn't heavily in their favor, right? Especially mm -hmm. Lord going to be on top side. Both teams down to inhibitors on the long lane, on the opposite lane. So both teams feeling good about it. I think one advantage is T could kind of play the macro game, does have the Black Dragon to get involved into this uh, Lord fight whenever he, he wants, should be able to out-rotate Zero a bit. And, you know, what's interesting is Devious Activities, even though they were up pretty much the whole entire game, they're willing to give the jungle pressure on the aggressive side for Night Horde to use. And a very oh. early missile barrage, I think that's a mistake here. That was a huge mistake, and Baj knows it. Brings him to Nolan's Fury, doesn't connect. Melon able to find R oh, there. No. Night Horde, one misclick, one big whiff, one ah. big mistake. Devious Activity trying to capitalize on a Night Horde push back to the base. Cult Alters from both teams. Yato able to get away <laughs> safely, but this should mean a Lord for Devious Activity. Yeah, we can't be making mistakes like that, right? Not only was the <laughs> Missile Barrage a mistake, but, you know, the position of R there, they were able to kind of just, you know, collapse onto R. And it was just quite unfortunate because Night Horde definitely had a lot of hopes in even getting this objective. But now you can see the Hanabi just dealing so much damage onto the front yeah. side. Zero, forced to use the flicker. A lot of damage does come from Oh My Foe and the rest of the team. Nice wild charge. Paired up with the I'm Offended. Members of De Devious Activity down to about 20%. Yato does not have the Nether Realm. They do back off. Lord has not entered the field just yet. Devious Activity going to go back, get some help, and get ready for the push. Yeah, but this is going to be an interesting push here, right? You could look at some of the spells that both teams have. All of them are on a 50-second cooldown, so the Lord does collapse before these cooldowns are available. Both teams are actually quite down in a lot of the utilities, right? R definitely needs his flicker to be able to get into a good position. Zero does not have his flicker available for another minute, but the timers are coming up. 30 seconds for Joy Bosch. You know, you got 15 seconds from Yato. There's definitely opportunity here for both teams to try to find a good team fight. Okay, nice damage. Does land on him up. Oh, he's going to get stunned up. Push back to the top side. Full barrage does come out. Lands a couple shots on a T, but no kills just yet. T with the Black Dragon. Able to zone away. Crack through the inhibitor. Lord still at 70%. Still feeling healthy. Night Horde need to put some direction onto that. Melt it down. Mamoy pops the, uh, the conceal. conceal. Doesn't find anything with it. Night Horde still just playing the defensive, and they defend well. Zero does have the I'm offended. Devious Activity need to watch out for it. At any moment, they could pull him into that tower like we've seen happen before. <laughs> but Devious Activity won't fall for it again. I just want to say Moy's walls have been quite impactful. Even there, just kind of slowing and stopping the lanes. It forces the Hanabi to get into a better position. And we've seen Hanabi kind of getting stuck behind that wall. So definitely a very interesting way to, you know, counter out the Hanabi, right? If you can't stun her, put a 
put a wall there. And you know, now <laughs> she can't either move across it, she can't dash. And I think that's a perfect response for you know the stationary damage dealer that Hanabi is. But we are getting into that late game position. Hanabi already full item has the win, has the immortality. She's going to be a very, very strong damage dealer here. And if the side of Night Horde is unable to get onto the backside, right? There's no assassins there. They have, you know, Mamoy to use the wild charge, but you know, that's just about it. They have to rely on damages coming in from R um, in order or Sayori, the burst, to be able to get onto the Hanabi because quite honestly, the uh, CC coming out from foe is not going to hit. Ruby also not going to be able to do too much. The wild charge point blank with the shield that Hanabi has is also not going to be able to affect her. Right, so they have to team fight quite smartly here. Now the Lord is coming up. It's interesting that Devious Activity now has the aggressive bushes there and Night Horde is kind of stuck clearing waves and showing themselves uh, before this Lord can even be contested. I feel like at this point, the only way they're going to kill Melon is if Melon makes a huge mistake, mistake. because you said, I mean, it's immortality, built-in purify, wind of nature. Melon can yep. take a full barrage and probably still get the kill on to R. Um, yep. So Devious Activity just have to play this cleanly. Night Horde need, I think Night Horde's big goal is, you know, make this fight go the long haul. Um, you do have the, uh, you, you have the I'm in IMU, you have the ability to use that Nether Realm. I think both teams, it's like who can last longer in a minute fight, right? Like who can make it to mm -hmm. two minutes and still have five man, five guys standing. Um, Momoi taking a lot of damage, wondering how Night Horde are gonna approach this Lord. And technically, if the team fight kind of goes long, right? They also have Joy Bodge on this Minotaur to be able to heal up some of the members from DA. I think the most important thing is how can they get the damage onto Melon where he's just not free hitting from the back? How can you separate the Nether Realm away from the Aegis Hanabi with the Immortality? I think that's going to be quite crucial here. The Lord is down to 50%. Ooh, there good should reset. be a reset coming through. Mamoy also, you know, have been doing quite well with the Skrok, especially when the matchup is not quite in favor. It's good against the Minotaur, but it's very, very hard to deal with, especially when you go up against a Hanabi. And the later game, uh, the, the later on the game goes, the Grok doesn't scale well. Has lane clear early on, but the first skill almost becomes useless. It's just, you know, just, uh, you know, immuning a lot of the CC. But top side here. Oh, full barrage, and it's gone. Is this the time for yes. Devious Activity to make a play happen? Cush in the backside. Watch him go. Gonna Whoa. almost get the collapse onto R there. <laughs> Taunt does come in. Yato here to help out. Devious Activity take control of the Lord pit is. once again. Moy's done a great job of resetting the Lord using the wall, though. Oh, my foe able to get the Taunt onto Yato on the backside. Gets the knock up. Sayori also dancing around. Devious Activity not fully committing just yet. Moy doesn't have an ult. R doesn't have an ult. Should be back up in just a minute, but the walls are a pain. You said it before, Mamoy is just, <laughs> he is doing a wonderful job that Kush with decent positioning, but Devious Activity have to go back and clear some of these waves. And, you know, we did see Sayori being able to output significant damage onto Melon. I think that's one of the strongest win conditions that Night Horde has. If they can get Sayori to flicker onto Melon, get 100 to 0 real quick and pop it, it's possible, but now with the bot lane slow yeah, look pushing, at the they sent zero. They sent zero on the bot side. This is engagement inside Ooh. of DA. Joy Baj gets no one's fury onto two. The collapse onto R into the back side. Oh my foe's there though. Nyato brings out the Nether Realm. Nyato able to get the kill onto R though. Oh my foe also down to about half health. Moy on the run. Nyato, everyone collapses. The immortality pops, but I don't think all oh, my foes get away from this one. Melon gets the kill. It's two members down for the Night Horde with 60 second death counters. Devious activity. Say we don't need no lord. We're marching down. Five man down the mid side. Night horde. They're either gonna make this a mistake or they're gonna make this the loss. Can Devious Activity finish this here with the wall? The minions, they buy enough time, and now Devious Activity unable to finish. Yeah, they do get the clear onto the mid side. Melon is actually a little bit stuck there. I don't think. Yeah, I don't think they're going to be able to get too much there. Melon still has the shield available. It should be quite safe here, but this is a risk that DA is deciding to take, 
right? You know, they're able to get the siege onto the bot side, onto the mid side here. But with the Lord is still available, it might be hard and they might potentially look to push here. Yeah, using the Nether Realm just so they can really focus in. Everyone locking onto the base, and that is going to be it. Devious activity. Take game number three for another sweep, sending Night Horde to the lower bracket. Most definitely a very strong and convincing performance coming out from the side of DA. This new lineup definitely reminds us of like kind of like the back in the day BTK winning against Outplay. This is the team that a lot of people have to watch out for. And, you know, they're able to get the sweep. It's quite convincing. They've had a 13 minute match. This one, you know, isn't as clean as before, but again, it's quite convincing when it comes down to that mid and late game. The decision makings were there. It was calculated. They sent the Ruby onto the bot side, got the collapse that they're looking for. Everyone dove the Exia. It was an extremely hard game for R. And, you know, the KDA definitely shows. 21, 13, and 50 assists <laughs> for the side of DA. I don't even know how that maths up right there. But hey, <laughs> I, I mean, but I think the real thing is DA were very grouped up and everyone was getting a piece of those assists. Everyone mm -hmm. had a piece of those 21 kills. And I think that's one of the things where DA really just kind of won out in all three of these games. They worked as a unit so well. The synergy, knowing who their win condition was, knowing when to protect Melon, knowing when to get T those early game advantages in the EXP lane and Night Horde was just unable to keep up. Yeah, and you know, the side of DA, they just played quite well in that game. You know, we saw Melon pretty much dominating in most of the matchups. Kush was always on to the backside. We didn't get to see T shine as much, but definitely the last Black Dragon, you know, and waiting for that Nether Realm to come down with the Petrify secured that kill onto R. So again, it's a very dive heavy meta and DA definitely stands out in terms of mastering that type of meta. They're able to take these picks onto another level and you know quite convincingly a three to zero it is a 24 minute match so night horde still played extremely well and honestly they've been playing well and better and better every single game it's just unfortunate that they're not able to push this series into game four and let's take a look at some of these stats tracks rich guy melon the carry melon 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 man i can't get enough of this kid has just come in and completely, I mean, like, we haven't even seen Melon in, like, previous NACTs a bunch. Never has mm -hmm. been, like, a top two, top three finisher. And this guy has come in and just taken NACTs by storm. For me, essentially, the rookie of the year right now. Started off on the bench and now just dominating in the playoffs. Yeah, and it's quite convincing. Like, he, he, he it doesn't show that he is, you know, been benched for you know throughout the whole entire season now he's on the main lineup he looks like the main deal for the side of da right they're able to protect him he, he's able to get a few picks here and there but now let's take a look at the head-to-head -head. yato against sayori once again sorry played a great game 92 percent kill participation the damage is not too much of a difference but yato definitely stood out ahead on the winning side two one and 14 probably the best match that he's played uh in today's series also high damage dealt trex high damage dealt Melon with 165,000. Yato as well. You know, we always talk about how the Faramis takes doesn't do too much damage in the early game, but when you get into the late, those uh, those Shadow Stampedes, those Ghostbusters, it starts to hurt a bit. And mm -hmm. Faramis really, I mean, especially when you're grouped up, it can really be trouble when you get into the late game. And the scaling from Devious Activity, it just shows. T had great presence in the early game. Towards the end, you know, not as much damage, but still the petrifies everything just coming together. And taking a look at all the team fight participation, like Huge. I said, everybody had a piece on the side of DA. There was no one that just incredibly jumps ahead of the other. Yeah, and you know, the trio mid 76% all across the board. Melon also <laughs> getting a piece of the pie there, 71%. You know, the side of DA, this this new lineup definitely looks quite strong in terms of their performance. They're able to give uh, Melon into the action. T also had a great game, I believe, in game two or game one, leading in the team fight participation. So everyone gets a piece of the pie in the, the new DA lineup. Definitely one of the strong performance 
everyone has to watch out for this team it's going to be a tough series uh when uh devious is going to be facing btk Ooh, uh, uh, yeah, next yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is that, that was literally just going you read my mind man i'm thinking bro da versus btk is gonna be disgusting almost That's as disgusting as our favorite host zeke <laughs> man I, i'm i'm flabbergasted <laughs> He's Consider losing his votes left and right. Uh, he's, he's Zeke stonk. Uh, Zeke vote stonks are. Uh, Zeke, I'm starting to see you down here, buddy. First of all, you, hey, you leave that. You don't put you you put that evil on me. That is ridiculous, man. I tell you what, it's. I don't know if I'm in like a love triangle, but I just feel like all of these teams and yeah, it just. It doesn't make sense. The math okay, is I mean, mathing, and granted, me. I never took calculus. I feel like I should be all right. <laughs> but it's the geometry that you're missing. <laughs> nonetheless, I didn't take geometry either. But no What's geometry. <laughs> nonetheless, Geography? man, I feel like I feel like that third game, uh, Night Horde was playing the way that I really expected them to play, but R just had a couple. I don't know if they were misclicks, but it just hurt them so much. Like they caught the pace and they had the ability to challenge things. And then it's like just one bad skill cast and it's just stomped out from there. That hurts, man. Yeah, that was a, I mean, there was definitely, uh, there was two, I think, two major moments where R used that uh, full barrage. That was just a little, ooh, even you, it was like, Coach Ua came out. He's like, that's not how you do that, man. <laughs> <laughs> I can't you know, remember what you said exactly, but it was like, we can't be doing that. That's what you always said. He's like, you can't be doing that. You know, at, at 20 but, plus but, minutes, you can't be doing that. But leading up to that point, though, Nighthorde played an insane amount yeah. of game to be able to get to that point. You know, th these are hard fought matches and it was 50 50 for a lot of the moments for me and Trex. Like the gold lead was just tied close and it just felt like Nighthorde had the opportunity. They even had the bushes, the aggressive bushes near the Lord. So I'm not taking that away. A few mistakes did cost them the game, but Nighthorde still played insanely great. So I feel like we can summarize that entire end game of that third match with with just one simple phrase who put that there put just that chair there. <laughs> who put that who put that button there i didn't click that <laughs> but uh <laughs> leave the jokes for me and let's get into the mvp who do you guys think you got it tough one melon? Is it the, the return of baji boy no melon of course melon um Melon, man. I mean, all three games was just a star overall. Even even his game one, where like he w it wasn't anything super crazy, but on the clod was just clean, he's with clean. deathless for so much of the game. Um, he's a slippery guy, man. It's a slippery guy. Yeah, and I mean, they definitely had to ban out the clod in the game two and game three. Like, it definitely feels like Melon played this gold lane quite well, and especially, you know, not playing majority of the matches in NACT. He's able to perform at such a high caliber. It really does prove that, hey, Melon is a star of the show. He's able to pick, pull this Hanabi, not once, not twice, but three times. Unfortunately, he did only get victories in two of them, but the impact that he has on this off pick here definitely sets him apart from a lot of the gold laners that we have in NACT. So for me personally, I feel like we came into this uh, we came into this tournament asking what team is going to be the dark horse. You know, what team is going to be the dark horse? And the thing is, is I don't think any of us were mentally ready for the dark horse to not be a team at all. It's literally just Melon. Melon, somebody <laughs> who found himself in a position where he was a sub, he got a play in, and then just that first time he got his game in, MVP, and then ever since then, they've been like, nah, 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 nah. I like this, I like this, this could work. <laughs> and he's just diffed every single gold lane he's came into, and he's just, I feel like every time we see him, he's playing better and better, and Dark Horse, man, just forget a team, the Dark Horse, that's, that's his new username, change it. No, it's the dark fruit. <laughs> melon, oh. the dark, the dark Fruitful. fruit. The, the, the dark, dark melon. Fruit. <laughs> the dark melon. Melon, aka the dark fruit. I'm using it next time I cast. Thank you, Zeke. <laughs> the double fruit melon. <laughs>
but it's, it's a great game when you though. Say I mean, it. I'm just kidding. Melon definitely, <laughs> you know, stands out in terms of the marksman and especially being, being able to pull out the Hanabi and having such a, you know, a, a nice game on the claw, just like Trek said, he played clean. Right, he's able to get you know the dashes in and out, getting the last kills here and there, being able to come in at the right opportunity and still maintaining his movement speed. Like this is a man with so much skill and so much talent that has been hiding. And now that he's come in to show, people are going to be watching out for Melon. It is definitely a very, very strong, you know, kind of person to lean on for the side of Devious to be able to do the damage, to be able to get the victories that they're looking for. And Melon is definitely that guy right now to be able to get the victories that DBS needs. So when I first came into everything, the big thing that I used to tell people is I don't care if I get a game guest right or wrong because all that matters to me is a good matchup. And I'm so happy to see some of these teams, you know, uh, like Area 77 and now like DA performing at the levels that we wanted them to in the very beginning. And now that we know that that temple was here, I want to see how it pans out for the rest of the tournament. Now, with that being said, we do have one of the dynamic duo players coming up waiting for me in an interview. So let's do this. Hello. <laughs> Yato. Hello, hello. How are you feeling? I know you got to feel good. Uh, I'm feeling good. Feeling good? I'm feeling good. I, I got to know, mm -hmm. Night Horde was looking strong coming up into this playoffs. Were there any fears of yours going into this game? Uh, Of course, there was fear since this is a tournament, especially this is playoffs. But I think we've been preparing pretty well since we added Budge in. Do you think there was anything specific to Night Horde, though, that, that was like a red flag for you or something to look out for? Uh, Not really. I think, I think, as, like, by the way we were preparing, I think um, when we went into this game, uh, we were pretty confident that we were going to win. Hmm. So do you guys feel like your current lineup is stronger now that you're in the playoffs than it was during the regular season? For sure, for sure. Since uh, Baj had some problems, so uh, in the beginning it was supposed to be him anyways. So um, it's like... We had him back, we switched back T to XB. It was like, this was our comfort. Okay, like our comfort so line. I gotta, I gotta know, I gotta know. Do you see yourself beating BTK? Uh, yeah. How do you think I you'll think do it? Will. Um, uh, Zane has three heroes. Mm. Mm. Ah, ah. You're wearing a BTK jersey right now. <laughs> yeah, it, it was um, Baj's idea. So I stick um, with it. it was, mm, mm. Okay, so if you're so confident that you guys are going to beat BTK, are there any teams that you guys are eyeing up in the upcoming playoff matches? Uh, I think... Um, get Gaming Gladiators and, uh, of course, the, our next opponent coming up in the playoffs. Okay. So, I'm not going to hold you up too much longer. Last question for you. Do you have any words for this upcoming match? W what do you got to say to people? Um, I hope Zane can learn some Assassin because, like, can't play anything else. With the Panda. <laughs> you... Okay, you caught me off guard with that. That is, I love it. I love it so much. All right, thank you so much for your time, Yato. Don't go having thank too you. much fun, and I look forward to seeing you guys next week. Thank you, thank you, thank you. See you. <laughs> oh man, he said he said he's got three heroes. It's Ooh. hot. It's hot in here, man. You know, I, I think what makes all of that like so much better is we know like Yato and Zane will sit in VCs sometimes. It's not like these guys actually like hate each other, but there is a nice amount of like, uh, you know, competitive competitiveness. competitiveness there, man. And that's, that's what we love to see. There's no like, I don't think there's any genuine like hate between them, but there's some mind games, you know? And I remember when they were all on a team, we used to interview them and they, and they would all kind of talk smack about each other. So it's fun seeing these guys on opposite teams. And next week...
next week, boys. Ooh. Be lit. It's gonna be it's gonna be interesting. But yeah, no, I mean, you could definitely see the competitiveness from both of the players. Like they they you know it's just out here. You know, trying to make the, these things quite exciting. And definitely with those interviews, you know, we were able to get a little bit of the excitement, a little bit of the spice and the sauce. And, you know, Zeke, again, great questions there and even better response from Yato. Well, I'll tell you what, just like my guest scores, next week, it's about to go down. And, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm, here for, <laughs> I'm here for it so much. Trex, you got any thoughts about... Um, something that you expected to see but might not have seen in that lineup um no honestly i think uh i mean other than like the hanabi pick but you know a couple days ago i made my prediction videos i talked about da talked about the rosters and everyone was telling me that baj wasn't gonna be him everyone was telling me that da was gonna <laughs> disappoint and i had you know i had, listen man yato baj and t we've known these guys for a long time and i think uh their team to watch out for this season. And after watching that last game, I'm I'm very I think BTK versus DA is gonna be like one of the highlights of next week. It's gonna be mm. one hell of a game. Mm. That's the, I mean clip it. He he yeah, he pretty much just said it. Like that's that's gonna be one of the best games that we have so far, especially for our next week. Right? Of course we have GG versus A77. That's yeah. still gonna be a very also spicy clean. match. And A77 has been performing at that championship level. They've taken a lot of the games seriously. All the mistakes have been out and they're able to kind of just prevail in a lot of the, the lower teams. And now they're going to be facing up against GG. It's going to be a tough match. But just like what you're saying, BTK versus DA, like these are players that we've known quite a bit before. And it's going to be really exciting to see how they pair well against each other now that they're going to be on opposite teams this time around. Mm. With that being said, I think we got a giveaway. You wait, you wanna you wanna head this up? I mean, yes, sir. We do have a giveaway code for all you fans out there. Make sure Ooh. to use the QR code to push in these digits. I know that of course private and uh you know Wheezy are out there with their multiple phones trying to get this death blow Paquito. Once again, limited quantity at 31. So it's gonna be first come, first serve. You know, it's 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 great that we get these code giveaways. It allows everyone to get a chance to be involved, to get a little bit of a prize for watching these. So again, don't be shy. Make sure to submit the giveaway code as soon as possible because the prizes are limited, Zeke. I do feel like um, it, they were doing the uh, the Death Blow Paquito skin giveaway. And honestly, I do feel like it was one of those skins that I'm kind of jealous of. You know, I don't play enough Paquito for me to want to pick it up. But I feel like as a skin, Moonton definitely worked way too hard and made it way too cool for what it's supposed to be. Um, so for those of you guys who did manage to get it, for those of you guys who didn't, next time. Next time. <laughs> yeah. Be fast. And Zeke will buy you one if you didn't get it. He said that too. <laughs> yeah, so make sure to uh, go to time, Zeke guys. and try to redeem <laughs> it from him. <laughs> What's that? What's that? Uh, you, nope. No. <laughs> yeah, see, he's breaking my heart. He gets two guesses right this weekend over me, and now all of a sudden he doesn't know me. That's over. crazy. That's, wow, broken. So, I think next week, next week is going to have some spicy matchups anything anything you guys are hoping that these teams are going to do to prepare to uh to meet each other it's tough to say who's going to be winning what or even make our guesses yet but are there any adjustments do you think that these guys teams got to make before meeting each other um i think they just need to keep doing what they're doing practicing the way they're practicing um and you know just be ready i think all these you know we finally have a strong you know batch of teams here where like i said man nothing's gonna be free this playoffs except for the skins that Zeke will buy you after the show and <laughs> and you know i definitely think there's time for upsets to happen in the next week i you know personally i will be predicting a lot of the upset matches and I do want a lot of these series to kind of go far and you know we're going to kind of like the day three of the playoffs where a lot of the top matches or top teams are going to be mashed up against each other so if there's a time for some upsets I do think you know the time is going to be right on to next week so do not hesitate you know definitely come through and watch some of these matches. 
Speaking of upsets, I think I'm going to stay in that mindset. Trex, can you take us into today's results? All right. Today's results. Two more sweeps, sadly. No long-range rubber band matches. BTK comes out on top 3-0 against Bloodhounds. And though the Night Horde put up a great effort you gotta give it to him devious activity came in looking stronger than ever and took them out in a 3-0 now taking a look at the bracket after today you weigh what are we looking at yeah so gaming gladiator is able to take legacy again it's going to be a sweep and they're going to be facing up against area 77 that's going to be our first match for saturday of next week followed by btk versus devious activities both extremely spicy extremely saucy matches you guys out there definitely put in your votes this is going to be a great series uh for our next week the best of the best teams top four teams and these are all the players that we've essentially seen before in our last NACT. It's kind of like a sneak peek almost uh, for one of the top matches, even the grand finals of things. So definitely uh, be out on the lookout for those matches. So I'm definitely excited to see what uh, what next week is going to bring. Definitely not the teams going into it that I initially thought was going to be going into it. But with that being said, I don't want to dig myself a hole and make any more wrong predictions uh, that I can't salvage myself from. So. Thank you guys so much for uh, for coming out and watching tonight. We appreciate you guys, and as always, let's soar.